Yeah. Hey now, it's your boy PSA Sitch here with another Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday show. With everyone's favorite, completely destroyed by daylight savings time. <laughs> Look, I thought we were supposed to get rid of daylight savings. What's up with that? <laughs> What's up with that? Do you do well, you know that I mm-hmm. god, it's probably like three or four years ago now. Daylight savings was this California voted to end daylight savings permanently. Mm-hmm. And it passed it passed by a majority. I don't look, I don't know if it's a simple majority or what. It was a super majority. Look, I'm shading the truth here just to make mm-hmm. my point. And they're still arguing in Sacramento over whether or not we're going to go to permanent daylight savings time or regular time. So they so they agreed to get rid of it, but then they couldn't agree on what like yes. to do, like to do spring or fall. Spring is the fake time, correct? Well, fake time. What does that even mean? Spring is daylight savings time. Fall is like quote normal time, right? We are, I believe, on normal time now. We're only yes. on normal time for four months out of the year. Yes. We're on daylight savings time for eight months out of the year, which confuses things even more, right? Yes. I'm for permanent daylight savings time. I like the other one better. Do you have a preference? I mean, so when we've talked about this, we talked about this last year. <laughs> Did we? Oh, time. my God. <laughs> I remember your big argument was you were like, sitch. How do you remember from last year? I listen. I don't remember things that happened like yesterday, but I'll remember things that happened like ten months ago for some reason. You're like Sitch. You know how many people die from daylight savings time? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know how many car crashes there are for people being tired of daylight. And I was like, no, I don't know. And then you like brought up some. Graph I did. Some I brought up the statistics. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh, okay. I'm assuming though that. The, the deaths are not from fallback. I'm assuming they're from spring forward because that's when you lose time. The fallback, you don't you, you gain an hour. Well, look, um, I I think you could it could be just as bad because I'm exhausted right now because I got up too early. Maybe well, you got up like way earlier than anything to do with daylight savings time. Like I don't know what's going on with you. Yeah, but um, so yeah, we talked about this. My because I remember like. I mean, you basically, you convinced me. I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess we should just be permanently on, on, quote, daylight savings time. It makes more sense for where I live because it's like, you know, it's brighter earlier. I mean, no, it's it's brighter. No, it's brighter later, but it stays brighter later. Right? Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah, because like now, like the sun's coming up at like 630 where I live or like six. I don't know. the, The sun starts to come up pretty early. Right. As opposed to like seven. And the, but and then it also sets early. And so I was like, yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, but then I remember there are a lot of people in the comments who live in different because obviously where the sun rises and sets, to, you know, differs depending on where you live. Um, and a lot of people who are like, well, you know, for where I live, it actually kind of sucks because it's so dark, you know, until like very late in the morning. Or if you have to get up early or be out and working early in the morning, it sucks if it's like in total darkness. Um, and so those people that are in those situations, they, they would be very upset about a permanent daylight savings time. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And so personally, I mean, it, to be, to be frank, daylight savings time has literally almost no effect on me whatsoever. Um, except that I get annoyed the day that I lose an hour of sleep. That's the only time I like care about it. So I'm going to say like a true non-centrist <laughs> moderate that I like a true neutral that I have really no opinion or care about daily savings one way or the other. Really? I mean, it. well, at this point, I'm ready to just flip a coin and be done with it, to be honest with you. So, you just don't want the change. You just, you just pick one, essentially. The, yeah, the change is what's killing me. Oh, so gosh. the compromise is like the problem. For The compromise for me would be flip a coin. Just do it. I don't mm-hmm. look. I don't understand. It seems like back in ancient times they would have done that. They would have been like, "Okay, we're drawing lots. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Let's do it." Listen, this is why you need the monarchy because the king would have been like, "Well, I like it better when it's brighter earlier." Okay, daylight savings forever. He would have had a pref- preference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, like logically, if you were to take a vote or you were just to figure out logically, I would guess 
more people would want daylight savings time to be permanent mm -hmm. because we probably live in a culture and society now, at least in America, where people would prefer to be brighter later at night as opposed to being brighter earlier in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's not, you know, there's not as many people going out to farm, right? Like, yeah, it's completely, they don't need that crap. It, what the heck? Yeah. So, so I would wager that, that if people had to vote, they would vote for a permanent daily savings time. I'm actually kind of surprised in California, it's some big hang up because if they put that to the vote, I, I guess that I would just guess that's what everyone would vote for. But it's kind of weird because you have a problem where it's because I think there's certain states or certain, not even states, there's certain parts of states that don't have daily savings time. And it's weird. I don't know how it's kind of bizarre if you have like, only the state doesn't have it, but the rest of the country has it. Like, I feel like you have to have the country does it or doesn't. And that's there it. are a few states that don't do it. I know because I've ha had friends that have lived there. So they're like, oh, yeah, across right across the state line, it's like an hour difference, <laughs> which is kind of weird, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if you're on a state line that has the the hour shift anyway, I mean, it's an hour difference, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, but I mean, it's just what's weird. The diff? There's like a lot of things that's that there's a lot of like weird scheduling things that become strange. So it says Arizona opts out of daylight savings time. Yeah, it's Arizona. That's it. Look, okay. I thought it was only parts of Arizona, but this is saying it's the whole state. Yeah. Uh, and Hawaii. But Hawaii doesn't matter because it's like Hawaii is so far away from everything that no one cares or like in terms of like the time being off by an hour, it have literally no effect on anything. Because they're in their own like fucking realm of time away from Hawaii? everyone else. Isn't it like three hour difference or something? Hawaii? I can't remember. Yeah, it's probably like three or four hours. I mean, it's, that's what I'm saying. For Hawaii, it literally doesn't matter because it's it's just so oh, detached from everything else. It doesn't make a difference. I went to Hawaii for the first time and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to call my friend Jeff. He's like, Adam, it's three in the morning. What the fuck are you calling me for? <laughs> It's like, oh shit. That's yeah, someone says idea. I live in Maryland. I hate that it gets dark at four thirty. Yeah, I mean, but that's why I'm assuming most people would prefer daylight savings time. Because most people would prefer it to be darker when they get up and brighter when they um probably I'm guessing most people prefer it to be that way. Those um, upper latitudes. Yeah, because it gets well, the upper latitudes they lose it on both ends. You know, me, me here in the, the southern latitudes, you know, I get I get most of the sun most of the time, you know? But Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm in Southern California. I think we're right across from one another. Um, Actually, wait, that's a good question. Let me look. I'm curious if it's a little probably more. On the, we're probably on the same latitude. What our latitudes are, yeah. Um, Let's see. But are we on the same longitude? That would not make any sense <laughs> if we were. You passed the test, Sitch. The way I always with remember flying it, colors. The way I always would remember it, though this is actually probably the worst way to remember it, is latitude sounds like ladder. And you think, well, wait, that shouldn't that be the up down one? But it's like, no, it's the rungs of the ladder. <laughs> so it goes left, right. Oh, okay. And I'm like, and I, and I remember someone told to me, I'm like, that that's stupid. That's gonna be very confusing, but it's not. And I remember it. I think I remember it because it's stupid and confusing. Um let's see. What is LA? Oh, so I'm actually. So we are like ten degrees almost lower latitude than you, but so but we're close. Okay, ten degrees isn't bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we're closer to the uh, equator. Equator. So okay. Is it there the Tropic know. of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn that's in the northern know. hemisphere? You don't know? I don't know. Man, that's stuff. Google. <laughs> Do you know what the Tropic of Cancer or Capricorn is? I don't know which one's in the Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere, though. But it's like the closest point on the Earth to the sun during the summer time. That's what it is. Did you know that? Of course not. Sitch left here. I'll read a super chat. He must have gotten. Oh, I'm sorry. I accidentally muted myself. I don't know how because I didn't click the button. But um, 
Tropic of I didn't know that. The Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn are lines that are the most northern and southern circles where the sun can be directly overhead at the solstice. Yes, yeah. Okay. It's uh, the midsummer when the it's a point in the earth that is closest to the sun. Yes. That's why the Sahara Desert is in the cuz it just burns it off. Oh, okay. Well, according to this Florida like where I live in Florida is not quite on the Tropic of Cancer, but it's like it's it's in Florida. The Tropic of Cancer is in Florida. Actually, I don't know. I'm looking at a different map and it's saying it's not. So I don't know. I don't trust. <laughs> I'm not trusting Google Maps here. Where the fuck is the Tropic of Cancer? Actually, this this other map is saying it's below Florida. So, hmm. Anyway, oh really? Yeah, it's below Florida. It's not even in the U.S. It cuts through Mexico, which makes sense. I guess. Anyway, what were you saying? Do you wanted to talk about an article? We have a bunch of. Well, I look. I didn't watch Enlightened Centrist video. I didn't know if I was supposed to or not. You want us to watch it fresh live? On stream. Yeah. Yeah. So we can do that. It makes me think there's going to be some sort of insults in it. So that should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? I mean. I don't know. I didn't I don't watch look. it. I didn't watch it. As I said, I would not. I, look, I saw you said that you wouldn't, so I didn't either. Yeah. But in light, let's just face it. Enlightened Centrist is out to get me, man. <laughs> Enlightened Centrist. I mean, listen, he's pure S-Class, baby. What do you want, you know? Uh, yeah, exactly. But look, S-Class plays dirty. I don't... I mean, it's... sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> look, he doesn't even deny it. Sometimes. He doesn't um... even deny it. I Listen. also have a. Yeah. Where is did it? you watch the the intro of the best show ever? The corny intro. I did. Yeah, there was. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, are you talking about? There were like two videos and Lance Hatcher's made, and then there was a video Zero Fox made. Are you talking about yes. the Zero Fox video? Why well, did look? I the Zero Fox video might get copyright claimed. No, but he I made a non copyright claimed one. Yeah, but it, the movie clips. I mean, yeah, but not, if he uploaded it and didn't get copyright claim, then it didn't get copyright claim. Yeah, but he's got a non-monetized channel. How does he even test it? I think it'll be fine. Who cares about this? This is a chill. Everyone, I want everyone to know this. We're, Look, we're I'm very tired from. I'm Sundays. fine with it too. The yeah. chill stream. Okay, so. Gonna be Look, a very I'm fine with it. Stream. It's a, obviously it's a masterpiece. Right. Zero Zero Fox has undone has outdone himself. Yes. So should we watch Inline Centrist's surprise first or the Zero Fox first? Let's watch the surprise. Okay. I got to watch think? together. I don't know if Fuck everybody it and what's the fuck? Look at that. How does Enlightened Centrist do his face reveal before you do yours? What's going <laughs> on there? Look at that. Enlightened Centrist is a good looking guy. Sure, sure. Yeah. I like his uh, Photoshop job on the <laughs> I know, I, I'm trying to bring up the... I don't even have the watch together. I appreciate right? that Enlightened Centrist made me black, so... Oh, he did? Yes, I do appreciate that. Two so watch together. There we go. So I was looking for, like, new YouTube music, and I have so many YouTube tabs open in Chrome that my, like, my YouTube tabs, like, they, they graphically glitch for some reason. <laughs> I spent way too much time looking for music for the intro on the Anna Shoe video. And in the end, mm -hmm. just didn't put any music in it. I was like, oh, fuck. Yes, yeah, I was I spent all the time looking for music. And I'm just like, I'm like, oh, this is good. But just I can't find one that like that would make sense. Yes. Like, good, but not good for what we would want. Yes. So yeah. I just I said, fuck it. No music is best. Yeah. And music is music is weird. I'm like. Yes. I mean, this is going to come off like elevator music, or this is just like, you know, the annoying guy that comes to your table at the restaurant. It's like, and plays a Spanish guitar. You're like, oh, no, this is just lame. <laughs> yeah, you need, it's very difficult because you need something that's like kind of, there's different mood musics, right? So it's easy to find like the creepy music, I guess, when you're mm -hmm. like, this is creepy. But like, you're just trying to find standard music. You want something that associates with your with your channel that's short and it's just like kind of like a catchy little rift, but it's like non 
it's like specific to you, but also like non-threatening. If that makes right. sense. <laughs> like he, not yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is why we were talking in DMs and I told Sitch I wanted it to be classical. And by classical, I mean non-offensive. <laughs> Right, he can say that's classical really what music. I I'm mean. Like, I'm like classical music because I'm thinking like what you know classical music means, <laughs> and he's like, no, no, no. Well, I mean, cl this is why they use classical in so many s movie scores is because uh, yeah, it is really it. not offensive. But yes, yes. we should do. We should get enlightened centrists to do some music or take some of the music out of the Hassan's a dumb fuck because I actually put that in, and I was like, oh well, this is good. But it, it's got Hassan cursing in it and Vosh saying Hassan's a dumb fuck. Over oh, you mean you just want to use, like, maybe use his background track? That he yeah. Did, what do you, maybe, I mean, I'm that sure. song I'm pretty sure much. Can, he's in the chat right now. I'm that sure. song, that song rips. So there we should go, just get. Just give us a, a version of that. I'm sure you have one of just the music. Just the no musical. Lyrics. Yeah. Just the music. And we'll use it in the video. We'll look, we'll credit you in the. In the descriptions. There you go. He says, I can give you an instrument. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Send that to Adam. Or me. Or I would have uh, I would have checked with him. But I wanted to get that video up because she was like, hey, I want to share that video. Yes. Yeah. Uh, an actual American flag. Thank you so much for the $100. Thank you. Yeah, look at that. Holy, Thank you so much. Holy smokes. I'm crying and saluting. It's an actual American flag. Says here's to the bladed happy 300s. I was able to listen, but I was busy playing my, with my four month old to donate. Well, good for you. It's been awesome seeing how the show has grown over the years. Here's to another hundred, and of course, as class, you know the rest. So thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're kicking butt. I love the comments that are. They're mystified by the fact that we have all these big guests and we don't even have a hundred K subscribers. <laughs> Everyone is like, what the, like why they're looking at the shoe meets Anna video and they're like, why doesn't this have a hundred thousand views? Yeah. It's I'm weird. Like, it's I don't weird. know. Maybe, maybe listen, maybe once I come on camera, I'll fix everything. Okay. Who knows? You think so? Maybe. I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't it's, think that's what's holding that video. You back. described us perfectly. I think you described it privately to me. Oh, I did. Um, yeah, you said that we're the indie band that a lot of like people really like, and they're they really want to see <laughs> like become big. I do remember making that analogy. Yeah, it was a great analogy. I'm like, you're right. That's true. It is. Yes, yeah. but as soon as we become big, they're gonna be, be like, like oh, I, I hate like those people. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I fucking hate happens. that band of now. Of course. Fucking sellouts. I liked you guys better when when you know I knew everyone at chat. Now it's a bunch of weirdo strangers. <laughs> I mean, look. <laughs> you know that's yeah. Thing. Of yeah. course, of course. I don't know. I feel like our our chat our mods can just throw down the band hammer if things get too crazy. There you go. Okay, should we watch this? I guess. Yeah, it looks... It. What's going on here? Welcome, everybody. And first of all, congratulations to Sitch and Adam for doing the 300 show today. Thank I'm you. very excited to see what Adam has come up with for this very special occasion. What guests will we see today? Friends or foes of the show? <laughs> Who will join us in this grand celebration of the best political show in the world? Wow. And what I want to know. Will we see a face review today? No. I assume we will. Maybe by the time you're seeing this, it already has happened. <laughs> I'm sure we won't be disappointed, but we will see. <laughs> oh, are you no, sure? Sorry. Are you sure okay. he's S-Class? I mean, that sounded pretty. <laughs> wow. wow. That sounded pretty bad. Ooh, wow. Sounded Hurtful. very ifty. <laughs> now, I said I was going to do something for the 300 show, and I did. But before we get to it, I want to say something. I want to say thank you guys. Thank you guys for five years of the best political content one can find on the internet. See Adam. Look at this. Line centrist. He loves us with all of his heart, okay? Why are you being I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop. No, listen. He's a good guy. Okay. Thank you. It's very kind words. Yeah, of I've course. been watching you guys even before the first show. And it was always a great experience. 
be it Sitch's masterfully edited and well-researched videos, or Adam's insightful and concise commentary. Wow! Hey, Nobody's... That. <laughs> that's the best compliment. Look, I'm crying. That's <laughs> the best compliment anyone on the internet has ever given me, Sitch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Somebody finally recognized my genius. You love me. You really love me. I know. Uh. I would always look forward to watching you guys. And this hasn't changed now that you guys predominantly stream. I still find myself excited to watch you guys stream. Especially when there's a guest, a special guest, or a topic that I'm really interested in. I always know that I will get the best information. Autism fueled research. <laughs> the most honest and best faith mind reading with a bucket load of humor. Yes. And also, at this point, I want to address something that I think many people overlook. And that is the giant work that I assume Adam is doing behind the curtains in the background of every show. Mm -hmm. We all know that Sitch probably does research every day for the show, seeking the truth. Every day. But well, one day a week. Let's not get out of hand <laughs> here. I think Adam's work often gets overlooked. True. The amazing thumbnails, the light graphic design on stream, reading the <laughs> comment section and reacting to comments, networking, getting all the amazing guests on the show. With his open attitude, his humor and charisma, and his business sense, he has built up the show in the shadows, for our shadow man Sitch to shine in. <laughs> look at this, look at this, this is just a shining tribute to your greatness. I man. know, this is awesome. I Look, I keep waiting, where's the rug? Where's the rug pull? There's no rug pull, okay, it's just love. Just love! You haven't seen this. There's I have four minutes this, left. Yes, he, he said he wants us to watch it on stream without watching it beforehand. So. Look, I'm gonna cry. Okay. I am. Look, this is this is uh, endearing. Sitch's assets are apparent for everyone to see. <laughs> sure, this show would be nothing without Sitch, but it also would be nothing without Adam. Oh True. man! So just this one time, Sitch. Let us hear an enthusiastic A Team Reign Supreme for Adam <laughs> and those who fell in love with him and his passion, his sometimes wild takes, his strong will, and his pure heart. Wow. All of which has made him, himself, into the heart of the show. And now, for us, the viewers. Okay. Listen, just for today. I'll give you one, okay? You ready? Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Let's hear it. Lots of gusto. Big energy. Big energy, okay. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me try it again. Hey, team! <laughs> Look, your mic is cutting out or something. <laughs> there seems to be a problem on your end. Oh, sorry. What? What's, what's going on here? Ugh. I don't know That's why I okay. can't do it. Look, I know it's physically painful for you. I'm trying. Okay. Look, let's just change the channel name to Adam and Sitch for the for this year. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on, people will love it. No. Look, it's a it's the best. It would be the best Christmas present ever. <laughs> I thought it didn't matter. What do you mean? Now it matters. Look, I'm only kidding. You know yeah. me. Look. Look, here you go. 18 reigns supreme. There you I, go. There you I'm go. happy. Look, I'm Your happy. 300th being. gift. Okay. I love it. I'm happy being the underdog. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. Let us unite in the celebration of the brain sitch and the heart, Adam, by watching this video that I made by using a bunch of clips from the show. This took a while and I had to go through a lot of old streams to find funny clips and sound bites that were useful. Now I know some of you sent me clips, but sadly, none of them were useful in the end, <laughs> at least for this project. Not even and one! And disclaimer before the start, I actually don't know what this is that I made. You know, I'm not a pro and most of the time I don't really know what I'm doing. I just let creativity flow and, you know, let the dices fall where they may. So, this isn't really a song. It started as one, but, you know, then at some point it got alive on its own, so... Well, you will see. Enough of this. Let's get this fucking party started. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. There we go. Let's, let's jump into it. Let's do it. We've only taken 40 minutes to get to this point. Let's jump into it. 
Content warning, racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, <laughs> transphobia, fascism, <laughs> violence, mass shootings, abuse, harassment, torture, uh, including guzzling buckets of things are about to get really uncomfortable. Call me in any time. Oh, you missed the misogyny arc. We hate women here now. Oh, nice. Epilepsy warning. Hey, yeah, I'll let you boy from the USA here with a bunch of racists. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, live show with up. everyone's favorite white psychopath. That's right, exactly. I don't care about your feelings anymore, Sitch. I'm a psychopath. He's like a super killer. I could die saying this. I'm embracing my whiteness. Well, are you white? Yes. <laughs> I'm a psychopath. Get out of the way, motherfucker. The CEO is racist. Racist piece of shit. Get out of the way. The CEO is racist. Racist piece of shit. Get out of the way, motherfucker. Never apologize, guys. <laughs> Make you look weak. <laughs> uh oh. I don't care about your feelings. I'm a psychopath. Mike makes it right. If I killed Sitch, the show would be over. <laughs> and um, they don't respect you. They call you a psychic. Kill Sitch. <laughs> they come. They the host of the show. They come. Holy oh, shit. <laughs> Bunch of racists. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. 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 Favorite thumbnail creator and lover of the movie Django, Adam Friended. How are you doing, Adam? What's up? How are you doing? So we're doing. Uh, I guess we're doing a debate here, Sitch. What's uh? I don't know what we're, we're having. Well, okay. okay. So we're <laughs> going to go out with, with a bang, bang, Adam. Go out with a bang. You get what you deserve, Sitch. A lot of Jewish God, people of retire in Florida. There you go. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, what's going on here? What's happening here? It's I guess it's not just me. <laughs> so, as you can see, this took kind of weird turn. Uh, it wasn't planned like this. It just happened to be this way. Um, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I know who uh, Enlines Andres is shipping with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> a little shipping going on here, right? Yeah, definitely. Look at this. But the way it can never, it can never be normal people having discussions about. Stuff. No, it has to be like <laughs> comedy show. <right? laughs> yeah. And I hope nobody is getting offended. Like, yeah, so you're, it's not just a comedy show, okay? We're, we're the immune system of society. The canaries in Walmart, the vanguard against the darkness that's about to subsume and destroy Western civilization. Here's some pictures of John of Night as patron saint to make up for it. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm trying to go in full dad mode here, okay? I'm trying. <laughs> oh, no. The great picture. Was, the dad mode was bad. That wasn't, that didn't work out well. No. My dad as nice as possible here. You know, when I <laughs> fart in your face and I kind of woof it up to your nose. Wait, wait, wait. We can oh my God, just way. have to let it go. We have to send this to Jonathan. No. <laughs> this this picture's is amazing. Look, look, if you want, I'll give you his email if you want to send this. It. You need to know. We got to send this to Jonathan. Right, but listen, we found this is your new avatar. This is your Twitter avatar. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, no. This is so good. This is such a good picture. It doesn't even look like him. It, it does. It looks like him enough. Okay. I mean, this wouldn't even pass for like a body double. Yes, it would. What do you mean? It's no. like it's got the AI. Listen, all the AI pictures have that kind of look to them. Yeah, the body double look. Yeah. It's like, it's, like it looks oh, like that's that. not Saddam Hussein. <laughs> that's somebody else. I mean, look, he's got a weird finger that's disconnected, you know? His thumb oh, yeah. doesn't seem to exist. But listen, at one hand, like the fingers are so long, they melt into the elephant. But listen, mm -hmm. It's AI art. It's brilliant. I love it. Dolphin I do has love three it. heads. Okay, it means deep, spiritual. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm... You have to be like Elsa. Oh, look at that one. That's oh my god. These are brilliant. <laughs> at the leg. Listen, <laughs> everyone, stop. Whoa. Okay. Yes, I mean, look, I want I'm that. I'm shipping you a sitch. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh -oh. oh, there you go. Well, thank you, Line Centrist. That was great. That was fantastic. It was awesome. Um, yeah. I love the intrusive thoughts. Good job. That was wonderful. Behind. Ah, wait. There's Adam's favorite part. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what and I was yes, trying to, that's what I was trying oh, to you get can, to. Okay, you do it. Wait, you do it. We well, can no. Oh.
I'll let you do it. I know you really want to see yourself grabbing AOC's bond. Her behind. It was before this. Are you sure? Yeah. It was right before that. Oh. That's okay. Look. Now go back stuff one. stuff you can do about it. Go back one. It's not right. Look. It's before this. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, there it is. That was... There it is. Done. Beautiful. <laughs> they even picked the crazy face. I think I made that crazy face for you for some video. Maybe. <laughs> you were like, send me some pictures of you looking in the camera. Uh-huh. Was it a stills? I can't even remember. Uh, it was for some video on your main channel. but. Remember. Yes. Oh, oh, because I was like probably promoting the stream on uh, my main channel, so I was like, I want, I need some pictures of Adam's face to like put up. Right. There. Back when I yes. made this. It's from yeah. the Destiny thumbnail, says so Light Centers. Yeah, because they took it from the pictures. That, well, look, I think I used it in a thumbnail a couple times. So right, it's fair game, obviously, if I'm using it in a thumbnail, but they're using it to unironically make me look crazy i'm doing mm -hmm. it ironically obviously right right i did Beautiful. one thumbnail like that with ben burgess mm -hmm. where i did the like the youtube meme face but it just it feels too stupid to me what is the youtube meme face you know when you make an expression for the thumbnail like oh my god ah. the, the soy jack face uh, yes, yeah, so you can do a soy jack face or you can do a like a angry face, right. terrified face, just any right. kind of reaction shot. Yeah. Any 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 face that's like a very expressive with your mouth open face is that mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Well, it doesn't have to have your mouth open. No, okay, okay. But a lot of them do have their mouths open. That's for the viewers to climb in. Yeah. Well, thank you, Inline Center. That was great. We got to watch um, the content more that people make for us just repeatedly. That was a really great video, great music. Everything about that was beautiful. It was amazing. Made me laugh, made me cry, <laughs> made me kiss six minutes goodbye. Now I got, now I got to be careful. I'm always going to be behind me. With that little samurai sword waiting. I know. What was up with that? Oh, waiting, waiting for it to be the Adam and Sitch show. <laughs> Look, I love Sitch. I don't what are you I don't know what you guys are doing. <laughs> Sitch provides me hours and hours and hours of entertainment. Look, you mm -hmm. guys aren't the only ones being entertained by Sitch. Oh, I'm being entertained this. too. Well, it's funny cuz I think we both said that neither of us would want to do this or would have done this if we were just doing it alone. Oh god. Oh, it's torture, I'm telling you, Sitch. Yeah. It's so much more fun. Yeah. Okay, so Zero Fox did this. This was the safe version. That is uh, hopefully not going to get us copyright struck. I mean, I I watched this. I've watched the safe version, and I just I don't look. I don't know that it's safe, but whatever. Look, we're rebels. Mm -hmm. We're taking life by the horns here. That's right. That's right. I should check my DMs. Maybe about what? Oh uh, no. Well, I I feel like I have a pretty strong maybe from <laughs> from Ethan. But I mean, but it is what it is. You know? <clears throat> Obviously, look, the chill show. It's a chill day. We're all. I didn't ask him until the last minute, anyway. So yeah, bad Adam. Well, We're no, just praising this, look, your producer skills. And... This is one hundred percent producer skills because if you ask Ethan a few days in advance, he'll forget. So. <laughs> Okay. You gotta you gotta meet the talent where they are, Sitch. Uh -huh. okay. Ethan Ethan doesn't like to Ethan I've Ethan's been on the show I think like two or three times and every time it's it's basically, hey, you wanna come on the show later? Oh yeah, I'll come mm -hmm. on. So not even a day before. A, a day before and I look, I, I agree with him. I'm just a creature of a schedule. Right. Don't you feel impending doom when you know that you have to do something at a certain especially like go on someone else's show 
I feel like it uh, wrecks me days in advance. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's for me, it's both because it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, you know, you, you think about it. But then, it, like, if someone asks me to do something and I have, and I like off the bat, it's very unlikely that I'll do it if they don't even give me any time to think about yeah, it. Yeah, but you're looking for an excuse. Ethan's yeah, you're right. He, Ethan's completely opposite. He's like, okay. oh, yeah. I'm not doing anything right now. Hell yeah, I'll jump Well, there in. you go. See, yeah. that's this. He's very pro-social and very anti-social. I'm always looking for excuses to not interact with people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm either, look, I, I have to keep a schedule. It does, I'm kind of more in the Ethan camp. I just like to do things spontaneously, but I'm really forced to schedule. Mm-hmm. But I do believe as a producer, you got to meet the talent where they are. You really do. Some people are like, I need to schedule six months in advance. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. okay, you're lucky. My schedule goes, look, I got a calendar that goes 25 years. When do you want to put this on the calendar? <laughs> right? I might be dead, but look, I'll touch base with you beforehand. There you go. If I'm still alive, we'll do this. Even if 20, I'm not alive, they'll bring my corpse to the restaurant they'll prop it up we have a a great i'm sure the conversation will be just as good we got a couple people on the schedule a couple months out yeah Yeah, we have a couple people that are like impossible to to get on a schedule too do we just said who i I don't i'm not gonna name and shame them okay i don't people i want to talk to people who like us but they're still very difficult to get to to nail down yes okay (laughs) FD maybe FD signifier is one of them, but look, I that's not what I was referring to. I don't know if he likes us. He he might hate us. Okay. I did ask Height, him uh, Heights to come in, on. Heights just well, working so. on his book. He's got to get his book done. It's like he's like a year late on his book. Yeah, I understand. I, understand. I don't get it. Like, who would be a fucking year late on their book? That's insulting. Oh, indeed, <laughs> Adam. Who oh, no. indeed. oh shit. Yeah. I mean, never mind. Ooh. What is this video we're watching? This is uh, Zero Fucks. Sitch and Adam show episode three hundred. Do a glory safe version. Right. I love watch. this movie three hundred. You don't like it, but I love it. I gotta watch it again because I said I only I've seen it literally only once in theaters and never again. There's a scene in here in 300 that I always point out because mm-hmm. it's, it's just as a writer, you need to know about a scene in this movie. If you want to be a good it. writer. The scene where Leonidas explains to the hunchback why oh, he can't why be. why he can't be an yeah. army. Yeah. Why is yep. that such a good scene? Well, because it's, it, it's a conflict scene because he's basically crushing the guy's heart. And he's also explaining all the information that you need to know in the rest of the movie when they actually fight. Right. So, which would be, you know, the I think I've said this before, the bad way to write that scene is he gets it, he stands up in front of the chalkboard with all the Spartans <laughs> sitting around. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's explains point. it to him, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. assuming that scene was probably in the original comic. So you can give Frank Miller props for that. Yeah, Frank Miller knows his shit. Frank Miller's a great writer. What's a quote from Frank Miller? Um, I don't know. A, a a great screenplay in Hollywood is like a fire hydrant with every producer in town waiting to piss on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty that's good. That's great. That's pretty good, huh? It's a good line, yeah. Yeah. A good line. It's so true, man. I've read so many scripts. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then you see the movie and you're like, what the fuck happened? Mm-hmm. What the fuck happened to this movie? Who pissed all over this movie? <laughs> they took out everything good about it. Those bastards. Well, I don't know, because Frank Miller's kind of, I never read 300 mm-hmm. or Sin City, so I don't know. Um, but I did read, I think the only, I'm trying to remember, I read uh, The Dark Knight Returns, which is like, usually whenever you look up like best comics ever created, right? That's always Dark there. Dark Knight Returns, really? Yeah. Frank Dark Knight Returns is always on that list. Okay. I think Sin that's one City. of the most overrated comics really? of all time. I don't know why people like it so much. I don't know if it has something to do with the time that it came out 
I think maybe it was like the grittiest Batman when it came out. I don't like it. I really don't like it. Like someone looking back and, and reading it in retrospect. I think hmm. I don't like I've never liked Frank Miller's and other Batman stuff. That's very like edgy. I've never liked his edgy Batman stuff. I think it's like ridiculously too edgy. Um, what what's so what's wrong with it? Does Batman get a tattoo or something? No, he's like there's like one where he's like he's like cursing out Robin and calling him gay or something. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, really? Like it's like so weird. It he just drops so, the F slur on Robin. <laughs> something like that, yeah. And I'm like, this is so. No, he doesn't do that in, in Dark Knight Returns. It's in like he he did a very short lived, I believe, normal Batman run. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like, I was like, this is just not my my idea. And this could just be me. My idea for what Batman is is so like etched in my mind of how I want the character to be that that was just so detest for that. I don't like now. It's the same thing with Dark Knight Returns. It's just a very different version of Batman, which is fine. It's just not what I like. And I'm not sure I understand why people like it so much or why it makes all the list of people liking it so much, except that it's just like a thing that people say. What is your version of Batman that you like? My version of Batman is a character who is so... He, I think Batman only works in relation to having Robin, Batgirl, and other characters around him. And I think this is part of why the live action movies have never worked properly. I think Batman is a character who essentially lives in a world of superheroes and supervillains who all have insane powers. And he's just a rich guy who's pretty smart. And the only way he can compete with all of these insane superpowers is to become basically psychotic to be so obsessed, to be so completely obsessed with like having all the contingencies, being the best, being so OCD about everything, that that's all his life can function as. And it, it creates this kind of interesting character who, when you look at like Robin and Batgirl and all the people around him and Alfred and all the people around him, like they like really respect, they really respect him and they really love him and they like how strong his personality is. And how kind of like in his own weird way, he's like hyper charismatic. Like, I'm sure you've known there's always people in, in life that you'll meet that are like hyper charismatic and they're very like dominating, like like they'll be in a friend group and everyone just does what they do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, yeah we've leader. all kind of like met people like that. And Batman is kind of like that, but he's in it like in kind of like a more serious way because it's, you know, about fighting crime and everyone kind of. They want, like, they, like, desperately want his love and his affection, but they can never, ever get it because he doesn't want to let anyone into his life because, obviously, of the trauma of losing his parents, he's just so terrified of, like, becoming, like, really strongly emotionally attached to people, and also he's lost various Robins, and so he's, like, this, like, weird, like, charismatic, distant, like, psycho who's just obsessed with, like, his, his idea of justice and fighting crime and he's kind of this tragic figure that all these people are always trying to make connections with, and he can never really um, accept or let into his life. And it's kind of why, um, you know, the original comic for Nightfall was very interesting, which is the the comic where Batman gets his back broken by Bane, which is what they, you know, they did in the, the Nolan movie. And it's kind of like this idea of how you know, Bane unleashes Bane unleashes all these villains in, onto Gotham, and Batman has to kind of run this gauntlet of taking them all out. And the only reason he really gets his back broken by Bane and defeated by Bane is because he's pushing everyone away from himself because he just wants to do it alone because he's just so afraid of like someone else dying or getting hurt or having to rely on someone else. And it's sort of like that <laughs> weakness in him, uh, to well, me, that makes him interesting. Wouldn't and there's even being friends with like Superman though put all that to bed? Well, no, because even then he he doesn't he never ever ever would want to pick up the phone and call Superman and say, "Can you come help me like beat up Bane or something?" Right? Even though Superman would do it. Yeah, but he could get close to Superman because he doesn't have to worry about him dying. Yeah, but no, but that's not true. What do you mean Superman could die? Superman gets his ass kicked all the time. I mean, Superman literally did die. What are you talking about? He got killed by Doomsday. Oh. And actually, see, that would be an interesting, that'd be a supremely interesting character story to do, is that like, 
at first, maybe Batman does become close with Superman because he, he feels like dying. he's invincible. He's, yeah. And then he does die. And then that completely drives Batman like further into like, yeah, he's the yeah. only one. Like there could be a scene where they're out having beers together and he confides in Superman and says, look, you're the only one I can become friends with. Well, that's, that's probably nothing, a little too on the nose if he says it's nothing is <laughs> going to happen to you. Right. No, they they should ha they should he should die that night, right <laughs> after he obvious. says it. Okay. That's like you know in every TV Sitch. show when it's like there's some Sitch. B character and they develop some specific trait or they like be, like the, the show focuses on them heavily. You're like, oh, something's about to go down with this character. What's happening? Of course. Yeah. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna school you here. I'm gonna tell you. Mm -hmm. You got to give yourself permission to write that first shitty draft, okay? Oh no, I the I first understand. the first draft is always going to be crap. Yeah, you get that scene on the page, and then you figure out how to make it work. That scene well, might not work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. How do you make that scene work? Because well, you do it, need you do need that in there. You do need some way of. This is why I was saying that the hunchback scene is so good because right. they're like well we got to explain how they fight well the way you do that scene because it'd be scenes first of all batman would never say that he would never be that open even with superman right so it breaks anyone. the character to, right but superman to would realize what's happening and he how about wouldn't this? say it they get directly. drunk one night and they have no, sex no. batman and would he never tells okay. them while they're fucking <laughs> there you go while uh batman is topping superman um <laughs> He's like, you're okay. the only one I could really be inside of. You know what I mean? Yeah, there okay. Look, but, uh, that's, no, a bad, so, that's a bad way to write there you go. So, that. You don't like that draft? Yeah, terrible. Like but, uh, well, no, actually, like, so you, you know, I'm. Mm -hmm. it's probably already a Marvel storyline. So. I'm sure there's a fan fiction of that and an artwork of that somewhere out there. Okay. <laughs> Look, I'm, it's probably Marvel approved. What are you talking about? I did. They're I'm dying sure it's, for that kind of stuff. You mean DC? Oh yeah. So I'm sure DC it's 2023 approved. DC approved. You're right. Yeah. They're gonna make Batman and Superman gay for each other. I'm actually kind of shocked that hasn't happened already. I thought they made Superman's son gay. Uh, they might have, even though he's very famously been not gay for most of his existence. Well, so, they... not Superman. Superman have a son, or do you mean Superboy? Who is his? No, clone? I think it's Superman's son is gay. I didn't even know he had a son. But anyway, no, you'd have the scene would be structured so that, you know, they are talking. I'm sure the scene, because there was a whole Batman Superman uh, comic series, which I've read some of, which is decent. I haven't read the whole thing, so maybe this already happened, uh, where Superman, like Superman would understand what's going on, the, the, the dynamic between them. And he wouldn't say it directly, but he would hint to Batman about like, you need to open up to other people besides just me or something. Like he'd say something along those lines and Batman would be like, Fuck you. <laughs> he would leave. <laughs> because that's Batman. That's not good either. That's that's not a No, that that's how it would go. That's literally <laughs> how it would go. Obviously, like, you know, better. He wouldn't say fuck you, but it'd just be like like Batman would just look at him and then just like walk away. Like like a lot of Batman's character, and I think it's where the movies get it wrong, is him just looking very like like fucking sinister and then just being silent to people <laughs> and just walking away or something. And people like like trying to figure out how to deal with this guy so and like one of the one of the best how about uh, this one he yeah. writes it out in a letter that he intends to give to superman but he can't bring himself to do it mm, okay sounds awful huh? that's really good but <laughs> uh no one terrible. yeah like one of the best um one of my favorite one of my favorite batman storylines is a storyline where he he essentially creates all these contingency plans to be able to take out all the justice league members Superman, mm -hmm. Wonder Woman, Flash. He creates all these like plans to take them out in case they all become like evil or something. And it's and there's a cartoon movie version where Vandal Savage gets the plans and he tries to use it in the comic. It's uh, Ra's al Ghul, and they basically they steal Batman's plans and they use them against all the heroes. And the heroes, you know, find out or Batman admits that they're his plans. And of course, they all like just they freak out on him like like incredibly. And it's funny because he just gives like this completely perfectly like logical, rational explanation. Like, how many times have people been mind controlled, cloned, or like, or like turned evil temporarily? Like, you guys are all stupid if you don't have like a, like a bunch of contingency plans to take out the other heroes when like inevitably someone gets like their mind taken over or something. 
and they kind of vote on whether they want him to leave the Justice League or not. It's a very interesting scene where the, the vote is split and it's down to Superman. And okay. su- you don't actually see what Superman's vote is, but the strong implication is that Superman actually votes to kick Batman out. Wow. And it's like, holy shit. And then, so when Superman goes into the room to tell Batman the, the final vote, Batman's already gone. He just left. Oh, yeah. So it's like he, he knew what the vote was going to be, or at least that anticipated makes sense. it. So, yeah. So, like, there's a lot of really interesting, and there's like a really good Batman book. I don't know what it's called, where like it's kind of like Batman gets sucked through time and he has to go through all these different time periods as Batman. And the whole point of it is at the end of it, he realizes how much he relies on other people and how it's okay to rely on other people. And it's kind of like this mad, like massive character growth. I think that's one of the biggest problems with why people like, Japanese comics so much more so than American comics is that American comics are kind of just forever fixed um, because of sort of the way that they're structured. So like when, like after Batman has his character growth, you know, I mean, it's not like the character of Batman is is forever changed because of that. Right. At some point it's going to be a different run. There's like a million different runs. No one knows which Batman is who, you know, is, does that character trait continue forward? Does he revert back to an older character? Or yeah. like an anime, it's just like, oh, book one of One Piece. You just pick it up, you know? One book, book one of Dragon Ball Z. Like, it's very simple. Like, American comics are just so complicated. It's like impossible. Because they do reader. all the restarts? That's the problem? There's like a million <laughs> restarts. There's a million, like, there's probably like a different runs of Batman, Spider-Man, Superman that exist simultaneously. And you're like, well, which one am I supposed to read? Like, it's, it's just way too confusing to people. But... Superman's yeah. son comes out as bisexual in new comic. Wow. It's go. a big deal, sort of. Actually, the best representation of Batman as a character, funnily enough, was in the Lego Batman movie. <laughs> like, even though it's done to, like, a hyperbolic example for comedy, like, that is who Batman is, but, like, done up to a funny character. They, they nailed the character so perfectly. It's so weird I don't know why the Batman Lego movie is like the most accurate representation of Batman as a character. Because <laughs> I mean, you've seen it. Right? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because that's the whole thing. The whole thing is it is like, I'm oh, Batman. I'm Batman. I, I'll never be close with anyone else. You know, like, that's, I mean, that's the character of Batman. Yeah. No, I dig it. I dig I, it. I, I like how we got everyone on loves Batman tangent. Though. Everyone loves complicated characters. Yes. Yes, people like interesting characters more than there's a there's a confusion, and this is definitely true with like woke stuff. Is that people feel like they have to empathize or be able to envision themselves as the character to like them, and it's not true. Um, you just have to find them interesting to like them. This was something that um, the guy who did Avatar: The Last Airbender, uh, Aaron, it has really wanted to point out. He said, too many people want sympathetic characters. You don't need sympathetic characters. You need interesting characters. And that's what makes people like them. That's why, like, in Avatar, one of the most popular, well, like, beloved characters is Azula, uh, a psychopath, <laughs> like, a totally evil psychopath. <laughs> and just because she's this very interesting character. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Nightcrawler is a great movie that has a really interesting character. But I think the thing that makes it work in Nightcrawler is that the character is super good at, at something, negotiating. That's That always the helps. That always yeah. helps. People, especially in America, are very biased. Like, they want a character to be really good at one competent. thing. Competent, yes. Yeah, very comp. You're right, competent. And that's so true because for me personally... That's the thing that triggers me almost more than anything else is incompetent characters. Of course. Yeah. It drives me crazy too. Like that's part of why I really don't like Neon Genesis, despite it being so popular, is that Shinji's so incompetent. I can't stand it, even if it's realistic. It's why I was very annoyed at Invincible, even though I kind of like it, besides the fact that the girlfriend is horribly annoying, is that I'm just so annoyed at how incompetent Mark is and how he doesn't even seem to really try to be competent at all about being a superhero right and it's just frustrating to me (laughs) 
especially like I, I think I was watching Invincible like right after I was watching My Hero Academia, which is the exact opposite, which is all about the main character like literally trying so hard to be to live up to the hype of being like the world's greatest superhero, and then to like to, to watch that and to watch Invincible, Mark's like, oh, I want superpower so badly. Then he gets superpowers, and he's like, oh. Being a superhero is hard. Of course, his <laughs> oh girlfriend God. is ultra competent, right? Well, the not his girlfriend, the uh, I forget the her feminist, name. The, the one with the pink, the one in pink. Yeah, yeah, she's hyper. I like that character. She's she's very competent, but she like I mean, she seems like she works for it. She works very hard for it, at least in my perception of her character. And I have cool. no. There's a lot of problems with Invincible, but anyway, should we watch this video? Sure, let's do it. This is a comedy show. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Zero Fox. It's a comedy show. That's so good. I'm going to go to this part again. This is a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> that is really good. Oh, look, he's got me in the wife role. <laughs> it's like the worst Adam picture ever. I love it. It's so stupid. Somebody show. <laughs> it's so good. Look at that. Lance. Mm -hmm. Lance. Lance. Why can't Lance, Lance just be good? Why can't I mean, Lance a turn over people. a new leaf? You said about a lot of people, right? Why can't they just be good? Yeah. Yeah. Why has he got to be a creature of ideology? Well, and then the person right after it, you got a... Uh, oh, yeah. What's She's her name? bad. She's bad. Olay. Nice. Olay. And it's so sad because like, she has all this cool anime shit in the background. Right. And I'm like, why can't you just be cool with all your anime shit? I mean, you got all this Dragon Ball Z stuff in the background. Yeah. Can you just be like chill about it? Can you be cool about it? Can't you talk about Dragon Ball Z without bringing up racism? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 weird to me too cuz there's a lot of elements of Dragon Ball Z that I'm like they're very anti-woke. And this is like there's a lot like their their Goku's original teacher is like hyper perverted. He only trains Goku and Krillin if they find him like a hot lady to like live in his house and be his I maid. love it. And he's like constantly trying to like spy on her changing and stuff. And this, oh, is, always, yeah. and this is all played for laughs. None of this is played as like, like, creepy. oh my God, this is horror. Yeah, it's creepy. I mean, it's sort of creepy, but it's all played for like comedy purposes. And I'm like, God, this is just, none of this would fly in today's standards. At Can all. you imagine? Yes. Can you imagine your heroes like a peeping Tom? Well, Goku isn't, but he's he's like trying to be trained by like the perverted old like the perverted old man stereotype is a I guess a common Japanese stereotype. It is definitely yeah, yeah. So. which is always weird. You're like you're fucking eighty. It's like a fourteen year old. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You weirdo. I mean, literally. I mean, literally, yeah. Like, and you know, there's like weird sex jokes in Dragon Ball, especially with. You know, when one of the main characters, Bulma, who in Dragon Ball, like Goku, is like four. She's like literally like 14. She's underage. And Master Roshi will only give her um, the Dragon Ball if he, if she shows him her panties. She's like 14 at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like 
you know, and then she, and then there's like this like weird happenstance because go, so Goku, here's the setup. Goku is found by like an old man in the woods. Cause he's in a, really an alien, uh, but he doesn't know this. And so he's just lived his entire life with, with his grandpa who he accidentally kills, but doesn't realize that he accidentally killed him. Um, and so when he meets Bulma, he's never met a woman before. And so mm. when they're like going off on their journey, he's like laying on her crotch to try to go to sleep when she's sleeping. And he realizes she doesn't have a penis. And he's like, what? <laughs> and he, so he pulls off her panties. You don't see it, but like you just see like from his like, you don't see what's going on, but you just see like, you know, like his face. And he's like, where the fuck is her penis? <laughs> and this isn't like this like famous cartoon show for children. And so because he did that, like later in the episode, when she goes to Flash Master Roshi, her panties to get the Dragon Ball, she's not actually wearing any panties. What? Yeah. <laughs> this is a Dragon Ball. This is this like the most famous anime of all time. So. <laughs> why were they? Why, so they're sleeping together. No, no, no. Okay. So like, no, no. He's like seven or something. Oh, he's and she's seven like 14. years old. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it's not sexual like at all. Okay. Um, he doesn't understand sex or anything like that. Right. Um so so basically they they have to share like a room. And so he's just going to like lay on like cuz he's so innocent. He's just going to lay his like on her crotch. I guess cuz this is how he slept with his grandpa or something. Mm -hmm. He lay like the back of his head on on his crotch like in his lap. And then he notices that she doesn't have a penis. Cause he doesn't feel it on the back of his head. So he starts freaking out. He's like, what's going on down there? <laughs> Where's your penis? So he, just, he thinks everyone has a penis. Cause yeah. Cause he's, he's, never he's seven met, years old and he doesn't know. He's seven. He's never different. met another human except for his grandfather until right. he meets Bulma. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's, I mean, I could see it being kind of funny, right? No. It, yeah. It's, it's definitely like uh, supposed to be funny and it is funny. But, you discover girls for the first time yeah he's like what is going on down here uh, but yeah obviously that wouldn't play with today's audience like, right even remotely like there's a lot right. of like sexual assault going on here isn't it i mean it really is that kind of sexual prudishness of of the christian religious evangelical types but it's still being maintained now through like this feminist consent culture well it's weird because it kind of is but it kind of isn't because it's it's only they pick and choose so it's like if if there's something that sexualizes a woman that a straight male would maybe find attractive then they have that level of christian prudishness but if it was like a gay guy and they're sexualizing like a man Mm -hmm. or something then they would be so hyper in favor of it it's like the exact opposite of christian prudishness right yeah like and it's this is true. how you get yeah and this is how you get that weird stuff where it's like oh my god objectifying women is awful you know blah 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 blah. but then there's like the hyper objectification of men we kind of talked about this on sunday uh briefly uh with the efat people where like someone was talking about how like in mortal combat all the female characters who used to be scantily clad all now wear like 10 tons of clothing and have mm -hmm. been kind of like less sexified and all the male characters are all wearing like no clothing <laughs> and they all have like their big pecs out and everything. And it's, it's like this insane hypocrisy of it's totally okay to sexualize men. It's totally bad to sexualize women. And it's because they're operating under this idea, the construct, the whole power construct, the socialist power construct where like, instead of, instead of liberalism where you have to have universal rules that apply to everyone, you have this stupid communist idea that, well, because different groups have power, you can, you have to interact with them differently. So if the group is quote, believed to be in power, like men, it's okay to like hyper sexualize them and objectify them, blah, 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 because they're in power. But women, women don't have power, you know, so it's, and, and men who want to objectify them have power as a group, right? And this is all group thinking, obviously, because there's no individuality here. And so therefore it's bad to sexualize and objectify women because that actually harms them in society. Ideology is designed to simplify the world so that anyone knows the proper behavior. Right. It, it basically rule. creates a stylized world. And the, the ideology here is obviously the power dynamics. Yes. 
that's what the principle is that tells you why you should be able to hyperly sexualize a gay man but not hyperly sexualize a woman right <clears throat> that's the lens yeah actually you put that pretty perfectly so like the core of liberalism is uh universal rules and principles for everyone mm -hmm. uh you know let me write this down universal rules and principles for everyone and leftism which is really like socialism or Marxism is power dynamics. Right. There are different rules depending on uh, your, your groups. There are different rules for different groups depending on their power and society. Well, for different individuals too, obviously they'll be, they're yeah. a part of a group, but because they're part of a group. <coughs> right. We'll see, but there the you go. Elites. Then. The power elites. Yeah. But the but what is the my what is the, of, mm -hmm. what's the ideology in in the Christian religious evangelical that creates the prudishness? Well it's just, the Bible. You know, so, you know, you have to do yeah, what God says. Well, is the rule just like don't don't do anything sexual? I mean well, that just seems so simple. There, I mean, it's it's do what the Bible says. If we're gonna like maybe be more specific, there is kind of an element of, um, you know, life life is mired in sin, and so therefore giving into your quote baser impulses like sex, you know, and avarice and laziness and all these things. Th these are all the sinful behaviors. Like giving into your more quote animalistic behaviors, is the the bad behaviors. Yeah, it's completely divorced from power dynamics, isn't it? It's a, it's about self control. Yeah, a lot of it's about self control. A lot of it is about self control. Probably that's that's why I say like the main like a big chunk of the narrative, or maybe the Protestant narrative. I know when you get the different sects have different narratives that maybe I'm less familiar with. But if it feels good, it's probably it's bad. probably bad. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. If it feels good, it's probably you're right. If it feels good, it's probably bad. That's a great point. Right. Yeah, there's I don't know if you've seen the chart that I've made where there's basically four quadrants of the chart. It's a behavior is good for me and good for society, or it's bad for me and bad for society. Those are obviously the easy decisions to make, right? Don't do the right. things that are bad for me and bad for society. Yes. Do the things that are good for me, good for society. Where it gets complicated is in the other quadrants where it's good for me and bad for society or good for society and bad for me, right? Yes. So this is the whole point of ideology is to make those difficult quadrants easier to fill in. Right. Like, I am, uh, you know, Henry, is it uh, Weinstein? Is it Henry Weinstein? No. Who's I don't the, know. What are you talking about? The Weinstein guy. Rhett and Eric? No. The bad one. The one who was like the creeper. Oh, Harvey. All the, Harvey, yeah. Like Harvey Weinstein, there's like a power dynamic thing going on there, right? He's got all these women on the casting couch. Yeah, of course. Which right. is good for him and bad for, well, I guess, is it bad? I guess it is bad for society, Of course right? it is. But see, I wouldn't even say, so that's power dynamics, but in a different way. So like the leftist power dynamic is, depending on your power station, there are different rules that apply to you. Mm -hmm. Basically, what translates to it's always okay to punch up is kind right. of the way they, you know, there's no bad tactics, only bad tar targets. Um, right. Is, is another way of saying it. Um, but with the Harvey Weinstein thing, the power dynamics is completely different. It's just that because it's not it's not that there are different rules. No one should be forcing someone uh, into a position where they want to, you know, they have to have some kind of sexual interaction with someone they don't want to have. Like the power dynamics are just a way in which he accomplishes that. It doesn't change the rule. Right. Well, the punching up thing, I think, is... A good example because but i don't necessarily know what ideology that fits into but if you have this ideology that creates a stylized world that simplifies the world into the rule you can never punch down mm -hmm. 
that's where you get into the trouble where you have a homeless man trying to rape somebody in the street and you can't punch down on them because yes yeah that creates the problem <laughs> well but see th this is to go back to our, our previous conversation about this, this is why i say that leftism is completely a collectivist ideology even if the people that push it themselves are individuals because it's like that's the perfect example you have a homeless man who's trying to rape someone right obviously in that situation on an individual level the person has the power as the homeless person right it's only when we look at them through this collectivist lens of their orientation as a group yeah they say well point. you know the homeless man is part of this group that doesn't have societal power right he's obviously stronger than the woman he's yes subdued her right yeah. right and that's, you know, why this, I mean, it's part of why this lens is so t toxically awful. Check there was, your, um, check your DMs. Oh, okay. There was ahead. a very interesting conversation. Um, I sent you a secret message. <laughs> there's a very, there's a very interesting <laughs> conversation, uh, between, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Maher on his Bill Maher podcast. Have you have you heard it? Who is it? Bill Maher and Neil deGrasse Tyson. No, but I'm dying to. Okay. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, I have like zero faith in. There were there. I figured maybe we'll watch this on Sunday along with some other things because I won't like the whole thing's not worth watching. Um. Um. The whole thing isn't really worth watching, but there are um, and it, there are chunks of it that I wanted to, to to pull out. And there's a very interesting thing where at first, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of, it, it really shows me like the problem with a lot of the woke stuff. I'm sorry. Laughing? Vanessa says. Oh, okay. I don't it really like shows me a problem with, Adam. With, with the woke stuff uh, because... Like when, like Neil deGrasse Tyson seems to have very liberal, like classically liberal views of progress and how society should be run. And his father was like a civil rights activist and seemed to be like a civil rights activist in the vein of MLK. Neil and, deGrasse Tyson? Yes. Yeah. And not I remember Bill Maher. <laughs> both of them. Well, not Bill Maher's father, but I mean, they both seem like they have this kind of like more liberal view of things, or at least it did with Neil deGrasse Tyson's case. And I remember years before all the woke stuff happened or right when the woke stuff started happening i remember neil seemed to be pretty anti-woke and he would tell the story about how you know his favorite comic strip that he loved so much he cut it out and he put it up like on his desk was it was during the oj simpson trial and there are two white scientists and they're oh, like i remember this yeah and they're like should we ask, there's a black scientist and they're like should we ask the black scientist what his opinion is on the oj simpson trial i wonder what he's thinking about and then it shows the thought bubble of black scientists and it's just like math equations like he doesn't even give a shit about the oj simpson trial and neil's point was just that like he didn't want to be the ambassador of like black people yeah <laughs> like he didn't want to be thought of as like the black scientist he was just a scientist and so he didn't really care about all these like some of these issues um but then recently a lot of that seems to have changed especially with the gender stuff and we've watched some of those clips and uh bill is very interesting in the in that conversation bill like lays into him pretty hard at one mm -hmm. point about how neil is like basically shirking his duty by allowing these insane people to take over the conversation by not pushing back against them and it's interesting and i think there's two things going on with neil i think number one he's afraid because remember and we talked about it he had that blowback from the 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 very mild me too situation okay yeah i remember that yeah mild I don't know. well he didn't actually do anything he was accused from an assistant of like she she accused him of like maybe trying to start an affair with her but not actually doing anything the ice was there i believe there were pictures of him there was a video of him of him doing what he was checking out her tattoo in weird, creepy ways. Yeah, but I'm saying usually when you when you say "me too," it's like someone raped someone, someone sexually assaulted someone, right? It's not like, oh, my boss maybe tried to like hit on me and it didn't happen, right? 
Like, which is, by the way, if that happened, that's bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, in the realm of the spectrum of Me Too's, you agree that's on, like, the lesser severe end. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, look. Yeah. He, he didn't, he didn't, Neil deGrasse Tyson didn't say listen. He wasn't jacking off in a planner. I was about to say, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't say to his assistant, you got to stand there and watch me masturbate to this plant. Okay. He didn't pull a Charlie Rose. He didn't get out of the shower buck naked and start walking around the house reading the newspaper. Yeah, right, right, right. No, no, no weird shit like that. But, um, no, so I think that's, I think number one, I think that's part of it. But number two is interesting. I didn't know anything about this till the Belmar conversation. I think his kids are basically poisoning his mind because he was kind of talking about how like his kids are super woke and how he's never woke enough for his kids. And I think that's part of what made Bill Maher blow up on him, blow up on him. Cause he's like, listen, you're like the adult. Okay. We're the adults. We need to like fucking spank he said this children. To Tyson. He didn't say this exactly, but this is like the spirit of what he was saying. Oh. Like we're the adults in the room. We need to like spank these kids and tell them like, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. That's what he needs. He needs a good talking to like that. Yeah, no, and and, and but Bill kind of like blows up on him, and it's like a very, it's very interesting to watch. And I mean, I completely agree. Neil just kind of laughs the whole thing off because he's trying to be like super um, non-combative with Bill. We should watch that. That other Tyson clip got, I think, like twenty k views. Yeah, no, we'll watch. We can watch on Sunday because um, there's a bunch of different chunks of it I want to watch. Oh, is that? Oh, is it? You're thinking for the Sunday show? This yeah, we can watch watching. maybe that. We can also maybe watch some other things, but okay. Um, but you no, know, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating to, and the, the problem is the reason I bring this up is it's very clear to me that with Neil and with most of these people, they just they really just lack. They have a fundamental lack of understanding between what wokeness is, how it's this collectivist leftist thing, as you put. It's this. It's all about this power dynamics. You know, no bad tactics, only bad targets, and how that's so wildly different from the idea that they grew up with, which was the liberal idea of like, there's got to be universal rules and principles for everyone. And they just don't fucking understand that that's a com there's a completely different playbook that the kids are operating under and how dangerous it is. It's the old playbook, though, because yes. society has always been structured in a caste system yeah, where there literally is different rules for different people. That's yeah. the that's the old system. <laughs> that's the system that's old as time. Yes. Yeah. Well, liberalism is yeah. Liberalism is a new invention. Um, and that's kind of funny because Marxism, while being newer, still is playing off of it's playing off of all the old tribal uh, feelings. It's just reversing the power. <laughs> it is. That's exactly what's going on. And so the old because the old systems were like, oh, you know, you have to do whatever the king says. You know, whoever has the power makes the rules. And then the the Marxist system is like, well, let's take that, but we'll just flip on its head. You know, the the masses, the poor people, they're the ones that should have all the power because they make up, you know, the big chunk of people. Blah, 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 blah. That's why so, I like that Stephen Hicks book so much. Oh, uh, which one? Nietzsche and the Nazis. Oh, yeah, it's very good. Because he talks about the slave morality. Mm -hmm. How the, the slave morality has this kind of jaded side to it and i feel like yeah that's what that's what's happened right this we're oppressed so we're the elites now isn't that kind of the what we're living in right now yeah that's exactly what it is. you wave the banner of oppression and suddenly you're an elite who can do anything mm -hmm. you're invincible It's great. All right. Let me read some super chats. Do we have another something? video? Look, I have I'll read some super chats. You can't read super chats. You don't know how. Uh Eric Weinstein of the IDW. Look at that. It's it's the real Eric Weinstein. Did you know that? I didn't know he's a fan. Thank you, Eric. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look at this. The Amazing. real one. It says, uh, if I may, the problem with the show is that you two failed to delineate the parallel parameters of magnetic synthesis with an unquantifiable neuroconvergence, a rather derivative mistake with multidimensional consequences. I never did like Eric. <laughs> did you have you? Do you like Eric? I do like Eric. Really? I feel like I, I listen. I like Eric. I feel like he's very smart. I feel like sometimes 
he says things or frame things in ways that I'm just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Like, and, and, and then like, sometimes he's able to simplify them and I go, Oh, that's what he's talking about. But then sometimes he, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like he's trying to simplify them. Yeah. I think sometimes he's just delusional. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I'm sure. I don't know. Like, you know, he has his whole theory of reality and I have no clue anything about the subject matter to have an opinion on any of that stuff. Yeah. Parameters. You guys don't like per it's gotta be param parameters. Listen. Listen. Oh, you said parameters? I did, yeah. <laughs> oh my everyone knows. Listen, the way that I parameters. pronounce things is so special and unique. That's why you love me. Okay. That's why we can't get to a hundred K subs. Because I You're, say it's parameters all your, instead of parameters. It's all your pronunciations. Because I say nuclear instead of nuclear. Of course. Yeah, okay. We lose like 20 subs every time you say nuclear. When I say crayon instead of crayons. I mean, I say crayon. Crayon is incorrect. Crayon is incorrect. Well, Crayola. It's not, it's, it's, it, is, it is correct, but it uh, triggers some people. It is weird that you say crayon because I don't think that's a... I thought that was literally only like a Florida thing. <laughs> Crayola. Gamma meats. There you go. Okay, here's a question. Let me let's go to I want to go to Israel for a second. Do I need to look? I don't know if we're clipping anything out. So remember, we're trying think, to think. Well, we could clip this out, maybe. We're trying to be considerate of CT here. This is possibly clippable. So you, can... you look, <laughs> depends what your answer is. I don't know how to break, I don't know how to break this to you. But the way that I usually structure my life is I. I basically set up a goal and then I achieve it. Okay, you <laughs> this, read a super chat. I'll be right back. Then we'll clip this out. Okay. This whole maybe we'll clip it. <laughs> this could be clippable. That doesn't really work for me. Where are the super chats? Oh, there's. I'll read a super. Ch I was trying to find super chats from the olden super chats. I feel like that's what you were reading. Oh, thank God they're there. Okay. Andrew Clark for $2 says, quiz time? Question mark. Well, I guess. I mean, sure. <laughs> Andrew, did you do the thing? I tried to do that on Twitter. Somebody was being super snarky on Twitter. And I did the, can I ask you a question? Hoping that they would respond sure and that could be the question but they never actually responded so it didn't play out exactly how i had hoped but oh okay so that's actually not what andrew was talking about oh, okay andrew wanted you or us to take this thing that i knew that you would fucking despise with all of your heart and soul mm -hmm. and i almost wanted to to, to do it because i knew you would hate it but i knew mm -hmm. you just wouldn't do it right uh he has this degenerate quiz that's about like your kinks <laughs> Okay. And I knew that you would not want to take that quiz. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Andrew I, wants to hear about my kinks, huh? Yes. I always love when I get terse at him because I know. <laughs> well, I do. Look, Sitch. I haven't wanted to tell you this. Yeah. But I do have one, one kink. Oh, what's that? It's kind of, look, it's this, it's this wrench taking kink. <laughs> I like to humiliate people. You're, you have a humiliation fetish? Yeah. Are you saying you're going to take Andrew's wrench away? Oh, look, it's already been satisfied. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Is that, oh, that, say, that was good. Did Andrew oh, even yeah. have a wrench? He did. He doesn't anymore. Wow. That's my Look kink. That, Andrew. How do you like that? How do you easy like that come, kink? Easy go. Oh my God. There you there go. There it is. I hope you like humiliation fetishes. Oh, look, <laughs> Vanessa. Vanessa. Oh, we need a new moderator. And I, have a, I have a wrench here for you, Vanessa. Here you go. I just have one... I have one request, Vanessa. 
Yeah. You might need to wash this wrench. <laughs> you might need to you wash this. You might need this. to sterilize it first. <laughs> you might need to sterilize it. I would <laughs> I would rub it down with rubbing alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, Andrew <laughs> Clark gives a yawn. The yawn emoji. Look, he likes it. Yeah, Don't feel sorry for Andrew. He loves it. There you go. He's into it. <laughs> there it is. Oh, there we go. So use it's funny. It, use You're, it wisely, Vanessa. We talk about, you know, who's <laughs> more with bleach, right. she says. <laughs> you know, we talk about like who's more right wing. Uh huh. And, uh, and so there are definitely times that I'm more right wing. There's definitely times you're more right wing. Oh yes, this is it, right? You guys don't know this. People get confused because Adam is such a coomer brain, um, <laughs> and has been like his whole life. People don't understand that he's actually super prude. <laughs> okay. I, Adam is a very little prude. Bit. Doesn't want to talk about these things. Like I'll, I literally will talk about almost anything. Adam is very prude. Doesn't want to talk about this stuff. Well, look, I just look you. It's different. I'm married. You know, you get to a different place in your life. You don't want to talk about this stuff. Like it's your private life, right? No, I listen, I get it. Like, you know, when I'm uh talking to this happens all the time. I'll talk to friends who are in relationships and I will always try to embarrass them by getting them to talk about things they don't want to talk about. Look, i I'm familiar with this. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> I don't want to say. And that was mild. That was mild as hell compared to mm -hmm. normal. So <laughs> I try to draw out all sorts of, listen, you don't know this. P guys don't know this. Okay. There's, there's like this stereotype that guys are like really obsessed with sex and women are like really, um, you know, like they don't want to talk about stuff. What in my you, experience, what? You, all women want to talk about is sex. What I was going to say like about? my experience when, when I know couples that are in relationships, um, I can almost always get women to like tell me all sorts of crazy shit that goes on in the relationship, and all the men are like, "Stop! What are you telling? Why are you telling Stitch this stuff?" <laughs> look, we what's uh, look? I felt a little bad about the three hundredth show. Uh huh. I listened back. To what? Look, I I wish you were on camera because I did. I hear I heard a lot of oh my god. Oh, you talking? <laughs> yeah, on the uh -huh. when Anna was teasing you. Right, right. That wasn't planned. I want you to know that just was completely spontaneous. But it was. You knew it was going to happen. What do you mean it wasn't planned? No, it, well, look, I didn't. I didn't say to do that or anything. I just it kind of just happened. Yeah. I mean, you know, she did. I, she did tell me in DMs that she thought you guys had a lot of chemistry and stuff. No, but. okay. You you knew there was going to be some sort of attack in the beginning. No, I no, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. What are you talking about? You were DMing me about it. You're like, oh, I, there's some, you know, some things going to happen. I'm like, what? The what are you guys talking? I about? did. That's not. No, that's not how it went down at all. That Look. is how it went down. I just, you might not know the specifics, but you knew something. Something was up. I knew what, look, I knew what she felt. I didn't know she was going to do it on the 300 show. I didn't okay. know. Look, we open <laughs> the, what do you want to talk? Look, none of this was planned ahead of time. I didn't mm -hmm. say, look, I'm going to ask you what you want to talk about. And you're going to say it. You're going to embarrass Sitch. Right, right. That didn't happen. I just want you to know that didn't well, happen. I, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'll talk about it afterwards because there's a reason I don't want to talk about it. That has literally nothing to do with me being embarrassed. Okay. So, I mean, listen, well, no, if you guys want to like, embarrass bad. me, I'm totally fine with it. I think it's funny. It's good content. That's not the issue. Okay. I felt bad until I went back and I listened to like the 200th, <laughs> the beginning of the 200th show. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, they, everyone was attacking me on the 200th show. I was like, oh wow. Look, I just got even. I've, there you like, go. This is there perfect. you go. Yeah. There it is. Why is the 300 show attacking Sitch? <laughs> it's revenge. Oh, it's so good. It's revenge. Oh, God. And I love that. I love that Anna didn't answer the question, too. That was so fucking big. Trump's DeSantis question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You didn't. I, I love it. Well, I don't it. know. She kind of, she kind of did because she seemed like she agreed with Shu. And Shu, and I didn't expect that answer from Anna. To decide with Trump over DeSantis. 
<laughs> I mean, Wait, I, no, she, I could understand. She, she was shoemaking. anti-Trump. What are you talking about? No, but she cho- she said if she had to choose, she would choose Trump because she thought DeSantis would be Trump, but more competent, essentially, which I've heard that argument before. But I yeah. disagree for the reasons I said on the stream. Hmm. Okay, here's your clip. Are you talking about something serious? We've been talking about goofy shit. Let's talk about something like horrible and tragic now. Why? We're having so much fun. What are <laughs> okay. you talking about? I'm getting ready to do a shot of sake. You want to okay. talk about Israel? Of sake? Yeah, I like sake. Sake. Sakai. <laughs> sakai. <laughs> yeah, that's how you say it. It's okay. <laughs> What's um, it? McGore for three for nine months. Thanks so much. Says congrats to 300 Sunday shows. Despite all your success, you're still the most underrated YouTube show. Thank you, McGore. Look, let's that, keep it that way. <laughs> there you go. Actually, so and it says actually my fault because there was some time where I wanted to start beating EFAP in show numbers. So I told Adam to start counting the Tuesdays towards the the, the count total. Right. And that's why we got up to 300 so quickly. <laughs> right. Well, I guess that's the, the million dollar question. Do we want to do one of these shows every year or do we want to do one every other year? I never want to do one again. What are you talking okay, about? Well, I'm going to start, I'm okay. going to start number and half shows. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, no, look, we can just, uh, so no, I guess Tuesday shows will no longer be numbered anymore. We, we already agreed. We're not numbering Tuesday shows. You, we did. That's yeah. the way it should be. Okay. There are very few numbered Tuesday shows as it mm-hmm. is because I never numbered them and then you stepped in. Well, I, I numbered them like 0.5 for a while and then I just didn't number them at all. Well, obviously, and you must you have been numbering them for a them. while because didn't we do, did we do 200 last year or was it the year before last year? I don't know. Okay, it's it doesn't matter. 50 You're the one a year. that just listened to it. It's 50 a year, right? Yeah, but if we number, yeah, if we number Tuesdays, then it's 100 a year. So then we get, we'll do one a year. We'll do 100. A year, you understand? Yeah. So that was a lot of work, though. I understand. Think? I'm exhausted. I yeah, I'm and it was all Adam exhausted. doing the work. I didn't do shit. You know how tough it is to to deal with talent. I do. That's yeah. why I say, Adam, do you do this? It's hard. <laughs> I get it. They're like, I'll come on your show, but first you got to take my kink quiz. <laughs> What's the fucking king quiz? What? Uh huh. I gotta answer these questions. You gotta answer these these degenerate questions first. Shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to think of someone that I could I could pretend gave me the kink quiz, but I don't. It's like not really fair for anyone. Someone that actually came on. No one gave me the kink quiz. Yeah. Rags gave you the kink quiz. Oh yeah, we can throw rags under the bus. That's fine. <laughs> rags. No, no, what? wait. I got a better one. I got a better one. Fringy gave you the king quiz. Fringy. I barely he know never, you. Never suspected it, right? Never suspected it. I barely know you. Yet you gave me the kink quiz. Gave you the kink the kink quiz, yeah. hmm There you go. Okay, Enlightened Centrist member for seven months says. If you're going to be fashionably late, at least be fashionably gay and late and well. What? There you go. Be fashionably gay and well as well. As oh, well. As well. Yes. Yeah. Durr, I can't read. I noticed. <laughs> See, look, this is what you do. You either get Adam who can't read and me that can't pronounce. Like, it's so, know, it's, look. These are the two options you get. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Everyone around me can read well. It's so, it's so demoralized. I know. It's got to be so shitty that you can't read good yeah you need to go to uh, Derek Zoolander's school for kids that can't read good <laughs> that's such a funny movie uh larry shoemaker for three months says we need some coverage of the surfs he absolutely loves hamas i'll have to check that really? out i actually haven't been watching i see him tweeting about stuff um i haven't been watching any of his stuff if you have any clips of lance being real sussy baka on uh, Israel Palestine stuff, uh, send it to me. I should definitely look into it. Cause are they pulling out of the West Bank yet, or what's going on? It's who pulling out of the West Bank? The settlers. No, why would that be happening? So they can have peace. Yeah, it's not happening yet. 
They've actually been, they've had a lot of violence on the West Bank. Um, a lot I of bet. Israelis attacking Palestinians, a lot of Palestinians attacking Israelis. I a bet. Lot of fucked up shit going on there. Yeah. Ouch. Um, Christian Baller, thanks so much for $10, says, I missed the last Tuesday stream. What is the Mensa meme? I literally joined Mensa because I figured if there was an apocalypse and the government had the two people to survive, they might use it. Well, listen. Did you that's really? How you, that's how you know Christian Baller is smart. Smarter than I am. Because that's actually a very smart reason to join Mensa. And maybe the only good reason to join Mensa. And I never would have thought of that. Watch that's out. Funny. Yeah. Watch out, Christian, because there's a, there's a Mensa that actually measures your IQ. And then there's another Mensa that just makes you pay a lot of money and they don't care what your IQ is. They let anyone in. Really? Of course. There's, it's the, there's the Mensa and there's the scam Mensa. Mm. You got to make sure you join the right one. Mm. Look, I'm making this up. I don't, I have no idea. Oh yeah, that's right. Why center just sent us another video, but, um, but it's on a Google Drive thing. So I guess I can send it to you and we can just three, two, one it. It's short. The small compilation of Mahler and Rags first appearance on the show. Oh yeah. Just upload it. No, why don't you just three, two, one it? Jeez. Okay. Where are you sending it? I just danced it to you. Okay. But now I can't open it. It's just loading forever for some reason. Well maybe he look, it looks like he sent me something. Bosch versus Hassan Enlightened Centrist Wave. Here is Oh, that oh, was the, you said you wanted the music without the lyrics. Holy cow. He's on it. Thank He's you. He's on it. Yeah, hey, look at that. You're the best. Enlightened Centrist is the best. I mean, he's an Enlightened Centrist. Um Autism, a creature for eight months, says, Sitch, I'll never accuse you of TDS after watching Sam Harris on trigonometry. There you go. True. That's the thing. Everyone's like, oh, Sitch, you have TDS. I'm like, you don't know. No, they TDS. don't. They, you don't look, know the reality of TDS, okay? Half the things Trump, half the things Sitch says about Trump, people with TDS just can't say at all because they can't. They can't articulate any positives about Trump or things Trump does well or intelligently. Like Sam Harris doesn't, isn't, he can't even comprehend that Trump is funny or good at marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even it's interesting in the trigonometry clip, he, he has made some progress. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. He's still very tedious, but he made some progress. But to be to defend Sam Harris for a second, um, part of the problem is that, and I've always said this, TDS swings both ways. And the pro-Trump people, some of the pro-Trump people have TDS just as bad as the anti-Trump people. And it creates this like weird dynamic where like he can do no wrong. You know, he is the God Emperor, and everything he does is like completely justified. Yeah, who has that? A lot of people do. No, I know. And actually, it's really weird because um Scott Adams' relationship with Trump is like an he's like an abused housewife. Because I remember when Trump was president, there were like three or four times where Scott Adams would be like, "That's it, Trump has done something. He's gone too far. <laughs> Trump has gone too far. I'm out. I'm no longer defending Donald Trump ever again." And then like a week would go by, and then he oh he's right back to where he's stuck. Because he's his audience, his whole audience is Trump supporters. How's he going to entertain them if he doesn't? Sing Trump's accolades. I I don't think he's that audience captured. I mean, he's like a rich, super rich guy who can just talk into a camera with like you know a few hundred people, and he'd be totally fine with doing that. Nah, he wants more attention. So. He wants more attention. The bigger the audience, the funner it is. You know, it's true. No, I mean that is true. Obviously, and obviously that motivates him. But I'm just saying he he definitely pushes back as he argues his audience a lot. I mean, especially like the COVID stuff. He would argue them a lot about the COVID stuff in ways that would trigger the hell out of his audience. So I don't agree. I don't think he is audience captured. I just think he's Trump captured. So I said he's like a battered housewife. <laughs> he always comes back. And also, I think he listens to, he, he trusts people that have like really awful opinions. 
that are not trustworthy. I have two favorite battered housewife moments from Scott Adams. Oh, I thought you were gonna say. Okay, yeah. The first is after the debate with Biden. When mm -hmm. Scott Adams was so mad. Oh my God, he's so mad. He's like, oh, I had the perfect opportunity to dispel the bleach. The, it was the bleach, wasn't it? Yeah, it was well, the bleach. No, <laughs> no I, it was the fine people hoax. Because he got oh, it super. Was both. It was, got, there was two. It was a double whammy, right? right. Yeah. It was the fine people hoax. Yeah. Yes. He had done so. He's like, I had done so much work on the fine people hoax. And he had the perfect opportunity to dispel it. Yep. And he fucked up. <laughs> yep. I remember that. He was. Yeah. It was that. And it was a double whammy. I don't know if it was the same debate or not, but it was. A double no, whammy it was the bleach. Yeah. And he then said was I was being sarcastic. Right. I feel like he kind of brushed that one away, though. He was like, he look, he just said. He was being sarcastic because it was easier than explaining that he was right all along. He 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 came to that eventually, but at the time he was like really mad. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was he was really mad about the bleach. He was really mad about the fine people hoax stuff. Do you have an? Do you have one? Because I have a second one. No, what's the second one? Ooh, I just had the second one, and now I forgot it. It's gone. Let's see here. Oh, January six. Oh, I don't remember after his after January six. He was like, "Well, Trump has kind of given me an off ramp here. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to be on the Trump train today, guys." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember his right after January six show yeah. at all. So this was I mean, like the January seventh. <laughs> <laughs> you can look it up. That would be fascinating to go back to January seventh and see. A bunch we'll of people. We can bring on. it up. That would be interesting. Yeah. We can bring it up if you want. I no. def. I remember him using the term specifically yeah, off, ramp. off ramp. Yeah, that sounds. I mean, it sounds like what he would say. Here I am. Look, it's time to time to get off the Trump the Trump <laughs> highway. <laughs> right. But now he's like completely promoting him. Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Ostracy for ten dollars says I took the moral foundations test. JMac linked on Twitter. It called me lefty. There can only be one explanation. Sitting Adam are a psyop. How much did Biden pay you to convert right wingers? <laughs> That's hilarious, Ostracy. That's super funny. Did, really? I his, I, yeah. I'm, what is your? Did you post what? your results? I'm kind of curious. What? That. That's awesome. That is pretty funny. So I don't know if you our saw, most um, vocal right wing detractor. Oopsie. Turns out. <laughs> He's a lefty. Uh, how terrible. So J-Mac's results were, says that he's, his strongest moral uh, foundation is care, uh, but he's closest to conservative. Because he had very high care. He had less fairness than liberals, um, more loyalty than liberals, but less than conservatives. His authority was pretty close to conservative. His purity was higher than conservatives, and his liberty was higher than conservatives. Too and closer to libertarians. Cool. Um, but I don't know if you saw. So, oh, here's ostracies. <laughs> Let me look at ostracies. Wow, this is interesting. Ostracy. So, ostracies highest is care, but only slightly. Yeah, he, he his only his second highest was purity. So, I think this is where a lot of Ostracy's moral foundation comes from. He's super high in purity, which is interesting. So that's probably where your right wing probably, comes from. Yeah, probably not many kinks there. I think. I think when I look at the the moral foundations test thing, I think the individual like graph things are right, but I think the the generalization it makes about w w whether you're left or right is not great, in my opinion. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. I don't did know you if you saw. So, um, so Shu on head yesterday. I did Sunday, see. It. Yeah, I retweeted. Yeah, she, she um, she wanted to know who what the moral foundation test was, so I sent it to her during the stream, and then she took it, and it's it said that she was conservative. How do you like that? <laughs> so there you go. She didn't have to share it. 
Well, it's funny. I'm glad you shared it. Yeah. I don't remember what Anna's came back as. It was it was progressive, left progressive. Did she show us? I don't remember seeing it. Yeah. She said what it was, but I don't remember seeing it. She did. I looked at it. Mm -hmm. And it checked out. It all seemed normal and above board to me. Okay. I uh, mean, it's, zero, yeah. it's in the group DMs. I mean, you could go back and look I'll at go it back. anytime. Zero Fox uh, has uh, did some deep faking to Trump's lawyer to uh, change her attire to make it less uh, socially acceptable for lawyering and more socially acceptable for only fanzying. <laughs> only fanzying? Yes. Of course. Yeah. I'm not sure that's appropriate. Uh, courtroom attire zero fox to have a, a business jacket with no shirt or bra underneath <laughs> and your cleavage on display i don't think that's the i don't think that's the move did you read that stephanie kelton thing i see you just liked it i liked it because i didn't read it okay i was gonna go back and read it off the stream you should read it i mean read it right this second yeah because it answers your deep dark questions about okay. the gold standard adam sent me this it says fascinating it's from stephanie kelton these two paragraphs from carney john carney and uh, warren mosler if understood and applied by those paid to write columns for the fd new york times Wash wall street journal washington post would force a perpetual world-changing conversation wow okay big deal so this is what it says when the treasury spends the Fed just adds dollars to some bank's checking account at the Fed. And when the Treasury securities are sold, the Fed shifts those dollars to a savings account at the Fed. Both are just dollar deposits at the same Fed, but the dollars in the checking account are not counted in the national debt, and the dollar in the savings account are the national debt. Yeah, do you get that? I don't get that. Explain that to me. Okay. So <clears throat> when the government spends, they spend dollars. Yeah. Those dollars they give to some military contractor, some healthcare provider, so, you know, some social security recipient, right? Mm -hmm. And it becomes dollars in their account, in their bank account, which ultimately is. Wait, how like, is when the government spends money, how does that become dollars in the federal bank account? It becomes dollars in their bank account, and the, uh, the Fed is the banker for banks. So no, no, bank... wait, wait, wait. It becomes dollars in their bank account and then and then they spend it. Them spending the money doesn't make it become dollars in their bank account, right? Them spending the money makes it become dollars in someone else's bank account. Yes. You're saying in yeah, you're saying in order to spend the money, it first becomes dollars in their savings account or their checking account. Well, it in the Whoever receives the money in the government spending receives it in dollars. That's the important part of the equation here. Okay. So when if you get dollars, I'm assuming you're going to take those dollars and put it in a bank? Yes. Or are you going to keep it in cash and put it under your pillowcase? I'm going to put it in a bank or a Okay, a bank. bank. <laughs> so that bank has an account with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the bank for banks, right? Okay. So it's going to become part of their their bank reserves so that's the oh, money in your okay. in your account right it's part of their bank reserves and that money before well look you, i guess you haven't finished reading the quote but this is the okay i'm gonna tell you see right off the bat so mmt hits a lot of things that on a moral level makes people, are repugnant yeah like really hits the disgust <laughs> level okay what you just said if people understood it, is going to make them lose their fucking minds. So I don't know if this is the angle you want to punch. Everyone, everyone listening right now has already lost their minds over this stuff. So it's. I, I don't know. Should I spell out what you just said, or is that poison too many people against him? Look, everyone's poison at this point. I'm not going to say poison it. against MMT it. anyway. I'm not going to say it. No, okay, you say keep... it. I want to know what you're talking about. Okay. Well, essentially, it sounds like what you're saying is that. Like because the Fed is the bank of of private banks, right? Right. 
they're saying that any money that exists in a private bank is like on some level, technically the federal reserves reserve money, right? Yeah. The Fed, the whole, the fed controls the money supply. They're supposed to keep track of how much money banks loan and how much money they have in reserves. Right. But just be, well, but just because, so if I go, if I have like a bank account, a bank of America or something, right. Right. And I have like 20 grand in a bank account, of bank of America. That doesn't, the Fed can't just like reach in and take that 20 grand. That doesn't have, what impact does it have on the Fed? No, it can't, it can't do that. But the, that money will show up on the bank's balance sheet as reserves. What does that mean? Deposits. What does that mean? It means that they're keeping track of how much money you have in your bank account. No, but what does it mean to the Fed? When you say like, this shows up on the the Fed's fin reserve. Finish reading. Finish that? reading the thing. Okay. Because you didn't even get to the gold standard part. Why are reserve accounts not the debt, while security accounts are the debt? It's all just a holdover from way back before most of you were born, when only when only dollars and checking accounts were legally convertible into gold at a fixed price. That's all entirely inapplicable today. Right. Okay. So they're conceptually saying that the debt, which you understand is treasury securities, right? They earn a coupon, which is an interest rate. Yeah. So you can, you can have that 20 grand that you have in your account, you can exchange that 20 grand for a treasury security, right? Yes. Well, as soon as you exchange that 20 grand for a treasury security, then all of a sudden it's part of the national debt, right? I get that, yes. Okay, so you have the 20 grand in your account that wasn't part of the national debt. Now it's become part of the national debt because you've bought a treasury security. And the thing is just pointing out, why why is that the situation? Isn't that odd? Um, and it's a holdover, which I believe you I were asking I about. I, I don't understand. So, okay, I have 20 grand. You have 20 I go grand. To the, well, here's the issue, because there's two issues. You buy treasuries off an open market, right? So you don't tech you don't ever buy them directly from the government, right? Don't you only buy you them? You can. From, okay. So let's say there's either or. So you can either buy them directly from the government or you buy them off an open well, they're all from the open market, but you can buy them on the open market away from the government or from another bank. Okay. Right. So if you buy it from the government, it's like a weird situation because you're giving the government twenty grand. So they just made twenty grand. But then they're also 20 grand in debt because they're going to pay you back with interest. That's what they call an asset swap. Right. Because the 20 grand only changed into something else. You didn't add anything to the economy. Sure. Like when the so, government spends, you're, it's not an asset swap because the government is creating new money. No, but right. So, but what I'm saying is like, so if you were to buy a 20 grand security from the government directly. Mm-hmm. The government doesn't go 20 grand in debt because it got your 20 grand. It's only going in debt whatever the amount of interest it pays back to you is. Yes. And that's right. the odd thing about it. Okay. Well, it's not like, odd. Why that isn't, makes sense. Why isn't, the, why isn't the money supply, that's, why aren't the reserves counted as a national debt? What why does it only become part of the national debt when you, buy, uh, when you turn, turn it into treasury bonds? I mean, okay, it's money that the government's already spent, right? No, this is where you're losing me. Okay. A bank reserve is how much money it has on reserve, right? It's liquid dollars. Right. So you go, so if you go to Bank of America, however much money they have in like physically on site or even maybe yes. digitally is yeah, like their not... the reserve, right? Yes. Yeah. Bank okay, reserves. Okay. So what I'm asking is, right. So I get that. But what I don't get is, is you saying, just because I put 20 grand in an account at Bank of America, that doesn't give the government 20 grand because they don't have access to that money. So I guess technically the bank doesn't do, either. They, like if you do, put 20 grand in a bank, they can't just do whatever they want with it. They don't have access to the money when you turn it into a treasury bond. Where does it go? The the it that's why it's called an asset swap. They take your your $20,000 yeah. and they wave a magic wand over it and presto, now your $20,000 is a treasury bill. No, I mean, I, I get it, but the, <laughs> I understand. I understand that like logistically that's how it works, but I'm just saying like theoretically, it's supposed to be like you're giving them 20 grand for them to spend on 
budget shit. Okay. Right? That's, well, that's not really what happens. But I know, yeah. but that's what people think happens. That's the concept that people are laboring under, right? Right. So then, okay. so they take your 20 grand. Yeah. And they go and spend it on something. They buy a paper clip. They, they buy a, you know, a it's bunch the of paper clips right? from NASA. Okay. They buy a box of paper clips for 20 right. grand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then that 20 grand goes into the paper clip manufacturer's bank. And now right. it's part of their reserves. Okay. Yes. Now that guy goes, listen, I'm going to buy a treasury bond with this because I want to get interest on this 20 grand. I don't want it to sit here just inflating away. Right. Mm -hmm. So, bam. He buys a treasury bill, and now that twenty grand, they're like, "Look, let's buy another box of paper clips." See, this is why it's not a good way to conceptualize yeah, it but, this but, way. <laughs> so, but I don't, it doesn't really work. I, now like, all, I'm all of a sudden, it's like infinite. Uh, now we're getting treasury bills stacked up to the well, ceiling here off of just one box of paper well, clips. Well, wait, 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 because it doesn't quite work that way. Because the government doesn't make treasury bills ad call. Okay, it decides. Uh -huh. They're going to make X amount of treasuries. And usually it's like the banks or a bunch of other financial people that buy them all first directly from the government. And then when you buy it, you're buying it secondhand from one of these other places. Do you know how they decide how many treasury bills they want to make? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Don't they just make a decision? No. They add up all the government spending... No, minus it's just all of the need. taxes. Yeah. Right, sure. Very it's just simple, whatever the debt is. Yeah. <laughs> very simple math. And yeah. they say, make this many treasury bills. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, but so that's what I'm saying. Like the, it's not like it's so part it's of not the like you get twenty process. grand, you go to the government, you say buy treasury bond, someone else gets the twenty grand, they go to the government. Because they're not really buying it from the government, I think. They're all buying it from, well, I mean, we're all buying it for second hand. Because the government only gets the money once from the treasury. You from the initial purchase. What is the question that you always ask every time we have an MMT person come on about the gold standard? You have a question about the gold standard. I somehow I, I forgot somehow, the question. Somehow I it? thought this would answer the. What was the question I used to always ask? Because I, I forgot. Really? Yeah. Damn you. Because <laughs> I, I really thought this was answering the gold standard. No, this, this, this could answer the question. You were like, why, why do they do something? Is this all? And you, it, the, Second half of the question was always, was it a holdover from the gold standard? Oh, no, it was why Why is money, why do we create money? I think it was something about this. It was like, why do we create money in this like super bizarre? Oh, no, it was why do we do this, the whole debt seal? Why do we do the debt ceiling in the first place? What is even oh, the yeah. point of a debt ceiling at all? That and is I definitely said, is, a holdover from the Right, and I said, standard. is it a holdover to the gold standard? where there was some concern about not being able to pay off the debt. That was the question. The holdover from the gold standard in the example that Stephanie Kelton shared is that you they didn't have to have gold for treasury bills because the treasury bills aren't convertible into gold. Only dollars are. Okay. Which... You know, the problem whatever. is that this is so, this is too complicated for like normal people. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Cause listen, I'm a big brain genius and I don't even understand this shit. So I don't look, I just, I, sometimes I just feel like you're not really applying yourself. It seems so simple to me. It's like so simple. <laughs> I guess you're What's, just smarter than me. I don't know looks the, it's, I, the problem that people have is they conceptualize money like a resource. Yeah. And I think it's easier if you conceptualize money more like a coupon. Okay. It's a coupon that you can trade in for stuff, right? But it's not the stuff. People conceptualize it like it is the stuff, like the money is the thing. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a lot easier, I think, if you just think, this is just a coupon. Don't you think coupons are like, yeah, fuck, what a, a coupon? Like has like next to no, like ah, fucking coupon. Who gives a fuck? Right? I don't have a lot of respect for coupons. I'm not. I feel like you have a Y chromosome, so you probably feel the same. 
respect. Do you have Do you have a lot of respect for coupons? I mean, I don't have I I don't have a respect or disrespect for coupons. I don't have a strong opinion on coupons. In the hierarchy of coupons and Hello Kitty, which is higher on the hierarchy? I mean, coupon. I'll take coupons over Hello Kitty. Okay, that's easy. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. That's pretty easy. Wow. All right. I know you'll take Hello Kitty before you take coupons. I don't know of why course. you're so. I'm not anti coupon. I don't know. This is. I'm not pro coupon either. Not when people are like, oh my god, scouring the world for fucking coupons, but. Someone's like, here's a coupon. I'm like, oh, okay. So can I use this? Or am I throw it in the trash? Treasury bills are like Bed Bath and Beyond coupons. Oh, okay. So you're never gonna use them. <laughs> they never expire. Right. I think Bed Bath and Beyond coupons actually did expire though, because I think Bed Bath and Beyond went bankrupt. So they did. Okay. Well, but so there you go. I mean, if the government ever goes bankrupt, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, if the if if the United States government is dissolved, those treasury bonds are going to be worthless. Right. They're all the money's going to be worthless too, obviously. Okay, let's talk about Israel. No one cares about this economic shit. I just look, I wish you would apply yourself. I'm trying. Okay. If you really want to go over this cuz I don't understand when she when she says why are reserve accounts not the debt and we'll, why are securities accounts are the debt? I don't understand the conceptually reserve accounts enough to have an opinion on that statement. The reserve accounts are the money supply, the M1 money supply. When I I, whenever I say the debt is the money supply and someone mm -hmm. complains, they're complaining because they're like, well, no, M1 is the money supply. There's M1, M2, M3. Okay, let me read this again. Let me. I'm going to use 110%. I'm going to go Super Saiyan. I'm going to go beyond Super Saiyan. To try to understand this, okay. Oh, look, I see Ethan okay. in the chat. Maybe he's actually going to come on now. Let's nice. see. Let's see if he answers. Maybe his I DM. shouldn't read this again. <laughs> no, read it again. Let's see if we can scare him away. No, look, he didn't answer his DM. Answer your DM. When the Treasury spends, okay, when the U.S. Treasury spends money, the Fed just adds dollars to some bank's checking account at the Fed. That's mm. where I'm. Okay, so okay, this the first sentence is confusing me. So what she's saying is, in the treasury, when the U.S. The government, you can't even get I, no, past wait, wait, the wait. first I sentence. I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm trying to explain it to you. When the U.S. government spends money, what she's saying is that the Fed takes dollars. When she says some bank, she means like they'll add it to Bank of America or Chase or Fargo or, or, or Merrill Lynch or something, right? Mm -hmm. That's what she means when the special the treasury spends, they add that money to a, some private bank's checking account at the Fed. That's where I'm confused. They have a checking account at the Fed. No, look, when they spend money, they give it to Lockheed Martin. They put it in Lockheed Martin's bank account. When this is why I did the example. Look, if that's not what the, it says. Read it again. When the treasury spends. The Fed just adds the dollars to some bank's checking account at the Fed. Because it becomes reserves in someone else's bank account. Yeah, but so, but she says, no, she says some bank's checking account at the Fed. Okay, mm -hmm. so that means that she's saying that like all the d different banks, they have checking accounts at the Fed. Right. Right, that's what she's saying? Yeah. So like we go to a like Chase or Bank of America or Merrill Lynch or whatever, Maryland's an investment bank, right? But we go to some fucking bank, we have a checking account at the bank, and she's saying all those banks have checking accounts at the Fed. Right? Is that what she's saying? Yes. Okay. So she's saying that when the banks, government... Yeah. You, all banks have a, have a reserve account at the Federal Reserve. Okay. That they keep their money in. Okay. Their so dollars. Said, right. So she's saying, so when the U.S. government spends money... What the U.S. government is doing is they're taking, they're taking money from their account and they're depositing it in from the treasury account from and they're into depositing Bank of into America's, a private bank's account. Yes, right, into bank. Of, so let's just say there's a million dollars. The Fed says we're taking a million dollars out of our account and we're depositing it into Bank of America's account with us. Okay. Yes, okay. right. Uh, when treasury secret when treasury securities are sold, okay, so that's like if you buy a, a treasury. Um, the Fed takes those dollars, shifts those dollars to a savings account at the Fed. Okay, so what she so what she's saying is like, 
if a bank buys a million dollars in securities, so let's say, okay, just for the sake of ease here. What's up, Ethan? It, I can't, I can't hear you. So yeah. oh, it says Ethan Van Skyver is connecting audio. So it's not I, connecting. But... What it says it's connecting. Oh, there it is. Okay. Nope, still not. I don't know what's going on. It's got an X. Hold up two fingers if you can hear me. Two fingers. Make them. Hold up a middle finger. Make them good fingers. No. I guess you can hear us. <laughs> Make them peaceful fingers. <laughs> peaceful fingers. <laughs> Make them politically correct fingers. Politically correct fingers. Ethan hates Zoom. As soon as he finally... Everyone hates Zoom. That's why they don't want to come on the show. They go, oh, you <laughs> Zoom? You're not using Discord? There we go. Yeah, there we go. I got there it. Look at that. Is. You figured it out. There I got it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I See, this is the thing. You guys need to use StreamYards. <laughs> because this is I too much. It. This is too much for me. I, You know, it's people are like, hey, we're using this. We're using a Zoom meeting. We're using this or that. I just predicted this was going to happen. You did? You knew it? Yeah. He look, did, well, yeah. you couldn't hear me. I said, look, as soon as he actually clicks on, he's going to say, you guys need to use StreamYards. <laughs> <laughs> you do. StreamYards makes everything simple. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Little... Why don't we use StreamYards, Adam? Because we're talking it's, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the mic suppression for background noise on Zoom is top quality. That's why I like it. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. I, I you know, know what, what it's like on StreamYards. So. You guys sound great. Thank you. Thanks. How's How my mic? Doing, is it... Well, I'm Sounds doing good. okay. I, you know, I'm getting kicked around the internet a little bit. It's that's what we wanted to talk to you about. Well, you're before, like embroiled in a bunch of drama. Before you tell us about awesome. your drama, can you explain to me how treasury treasury securities work? securities at the Fed work? Because I was trying to explain to me, and I just don't understand. You came to the right place. This <laughs> is one of my specialties as Thank a you. dimwit comic book artist. I'm yes. really good at this stuff. Well, you're white, so you must know about money. That's what I've been told by the internet. <laughs> yeah, but like uh, I'm white, so money just comes my way. I don't oh, have to right. do anything or learn anything yes. about it. It's just you know. You're right. Uh, okay, I take it back. You don't know anything about money because it just you're just used to just getting it. Yeah. Okay. I have a trick question for you. Go. If you if you could have money that doesn't earn any interest or money that earns five percent interest, which would you prefer? If I could have money that doesn't earn any interest or money that earns five percent interest, which would I prefer? Yes. Well, what's the amount of money in either scenario? Because obviously the five percent sounds good. Does it matter? I mean, it's let's say fifty dollars. Then I'm going to want the five percent interest. No, it's like <laughs> you're, here's the thing: you should be saying, "Would you rather have a hundred dollars with no interest or fifty dollars with five percent interest?" And then well, look, that's a question. Look, I was trying to make it easy, though. The well, whole was idea you, was to make it easy. You said it was a yeah. trick question. So what's the trick, Adam? You because if it's a trick question, then you're saying you want the money without interest, right? You want the money with the interest, obviously. Okay, then what is the trick question? That's a very simple question. Just that's it. No <laughs> tricks here. Okay. Sit, you're the smart one in this partnership, <laughs> aren't you? Nah, what he can, he doesn't him? even look. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know to take five percent interest over no interest. Like why you're would right. you call I, I him like, the smart one? I was like, you said it was a trick question. I'm like, well, where's the trick? <laughs> the trick is there is no trick. Yes. <laughs> okay. Look, you got me. You worked. You got me. You fooled me. <laughs> Okay, what's the drama? Let's stop talking about boring financial stuff. What is the drama, Adam? I how oh, look and oh, he's, got, he's got a cheat. I can cheat right there. Look, I'm doing a little light graphic design on the show, Ethan. Okay, I know you see. use StreamYards that allows you to do all this, but we like to do it by hand. We're true artists here. We don't <laughs> use the computer to do our show graphic design. Uh -huh. Well, I've listened to a little somebody named Shadowversity, uh, who's <laughs> taught me that real art uh, is completely done uh, by the computer. I yes. Yeah, can't we just get Stable Diffusion to do our graphic design, Adam? Look, I will not be replaced. I mm. mean, so you said Ethan, are you are you streaming at the same time, Ethan? No. Okay. 
You well, just, being... But you're you're live on our stream. You know that, right? I don't know if you have the stream up or not, or if you have the chat up or not. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know. I started screaming the N word. <laughs> uh, look, I'm I'm very look. I'm very suspicious of people who bring up the N word as soon as we say mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're not that we're every not live. Every person does that. Literally every person. I know, does that. but it makes me think <laughs> they're probably you just... you, they're probably yep. using the N word privately. It's just a joke. No, I mean, okay. I, I kind of did like when I ordered, like a, I told my waiter I wanted oil and vinegar <laughs> on my salad and he <laughs> looked at me like uh, I said something wrong. And then I realized that I think he misheard. He only popped in on the last couple of syllables. Uh, syllables. Oh. <laughs> and I was it's like, like oil and vinegar uh, on my, <laughs> please, vinegar, please. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, that. that's the only time I even came close to it, though. I mean, <laughs> really, it, since right. I was like three, I said it I once when I was look. three. Okay. Wow. When you were three. Wow. Okay. Yeah. My neighbor kid, the neighbor kid in Provo, Utah, you know, uh, those Mormons, they fling it around all the time, you know? And so I, know uh, I didn't either. So they taught me, this kid taught me the word and I went and said it in front of my mom. She like whipped my ass and put a bar of soap in my mouth. <laughs> guess, don't you say that? She said, don't you say that word. I was about to ask you, how could you remember that you said that when you were three and then you finished the story? I'm like, that's how you remember. <laughs> yeah, those lessons stick, you know, obviously. The how do you bar see, of soap treatment. You have never got the bar of soap, Sitch? My brother did. <laughs> my brother had a bad habit of talking back to my mom. I very quickly learned to just agree with my parents and then do whatever I wanted, like behind their back anyway. That's hmm. <laughs> what's... Uh, it sounds like you're ready for marriage. Are you married? I mean, as well. I mean... <laughs> Adam's been trying to set me up, but not quite. <laughs> well, how do you? Because I'm. I think we need to bring back like spanking and corporal punishment. And some people oh. get very upset by that. How do you feel about those? Well, I mean, I thought like you know, honestly, I thought spanking was probably like a, a, an okay thing to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, on, a, until I actually tried it, like on on Hunter, my son. Mm -hmm. uh, he did a couple of things. There were a couple of times my dad, my dad hit us with a belt, you know, when, when he was frustrated. So, right. I mean, you know, uh, my brother Noah did a whole book about how we were kind of kicked around as kids. So uh, part of me like thinks that, boy, what's missing, what these kids are missing is spankings and beatings and stuff when they do <laughs> things wrong. Uh, I I guess not. Like I think I'm against it now. Wow. Uh, my my son. There were two times when I like spanked him uh, with a belt, and I couldn't. By the way, he didn't. I couldn't hit him hard enough through his jeans with the belt. He was just like, "What are you doing, Dad?" Uh, but one time he was five years old, and he brought the neighbor kids in to see my wife's guns, and he's showing oh them God. handguns. And I go, right. "You're getting the you're getting the the belt." The right. second time was uh, he just would not stop talking in school. Uh, and his teachers just kept saying he will not stop interrupting class. He thinks it's like, you know, the Hunter show, you know, and it's like we're trying to teach. And I like literally like every day, like I'd be like, go to keep your mouth shut. And he would come more complaints. And finally, I gave him a whipping for that, too. And he has never forgiven me for that. He brings that up all the time. My dad beat me with a belt, he says. Uh, and uh, it's true. I did twice, and I, I like it's awful. Like it, it doesn't. It first of all didn't get through to him. Uh, he's still like a you know a, a lunatic, and mm -hmm. second of all, like yeah, it's like um, yeah, I think it just leaves you with bad feelings uh, inside. Mm. I'm pretty sure, like it, it stays with you your whole life. So I yeah, think I'm against it. You said that it didn't hurt. Maybe that was the problem. It's it. Uh... <laughs> yeah, maybe I, <laughs> maybe I should have like hit him harder. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it just uh, I, I still think that like the 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 kind of sense of sort of betrayal that comes with it from mm. a parent to a kid, uh, like my my parents are hurting me, you know, like physically hurting me. I think that stays with you. I think it does. And I think on some subconscious level, it must have stayed with me and my brothers and sisters. And, you know, so. Uh, as somebody who experienced it firsthand, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say probably no spankings. Mm -hmm. But some other kind of punishments, because these kids, I mean, they just, they don't know how good they have it. Like, we had our our generation. I mean, we like, we were raised by these boomers, you know. It's like, I think I was. I don't know about Adam. I, you guys are younger than me. You're how about like a stun gun or something? 
<laughs> one of those gun? click, you know, those click, 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 click. How about one of those? <laughs> a shock collar? I mean, yeah, I mean, that <laughs> might be good. I don't know. Look, if, yeah. if, if spanking's not going to work, I figure at least the lightning will scare them a bit, right? That clicking is terrifying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, my dad would do that. My dad would take his belt and crack it. Oh, yes. You the know what I mean? It sounds great. Yes. And that was enough to get us in line most of the time because we knew what was coming after that. Mm -hmm. uh, well but, i was uh, an angel i never got spanked so i uh, look what <laughs> i was a perfect you, angel you were an yeah. only child so your parents just babied you of course yeah look i was the king okay i didn't need yeah. to i didn't need to compete for attention or anything i was spanked but not with by hand and it hurt but not and they did it and they would you know pull down my pants they hit me in skin to skin really um, but, yeah wow. but not not with the belt my mom's father would like really like hit them very hard and it like traumatized my mom so, wow. to some extent um even though she i mean she always loved her father um and i mean i don't have any resentment towards my parents for spanking me i mean they didn't spank me often but occasionally so yeah. it didn't, but it didn't work with me um but you know my mom always tells a story that when i was i was probably like one or younger and i because i was very mobile at a very young age and I st and I was standing up in the crib and I started to climb out of the crib and I put like my leg over the side and she's just, you know, terrified that I'm going to like fall out and break my head or something. So she re she reels back and smacks my leg as hard as she can to try to get me to not do that so hard that her hand hurts. And she said, I didn't cry. I just looked at her angrily. <laughs> so she's like, oh, I guess physical uh, punishment isn't going to work against this child. And it didn't. So maybe I should change my position on it. I think you can get stun guns on Amazon. Okay. So guys, gun. if you need one, yeah. So we were going to talk about story. We invited you to come on to, well, I invited you to come on and talk about story. The, well, what was the drama? You said you're getting kicked around by the internet. Yeah. How much do you want to talk about, Ethan? I don't, look, um, I know about your drama with, with uh, Eric July, but I figure it's, it's like past, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty much past, I think, but maybe not. I don't know. I think, you know, there there's a rippling effect of consequences for falling out from certain YouTubers. Well, I saw I saw <laughs> I think Sitch shared a tweet with me today where you asking like what is the your favorite part of ISOM? Which if you're trying not to do drama Ethan, I think like that's probably a bad way to do I'm it. Not, I am not not trying to do drama. I am okay. always doing drama when drama is important and it serves my purpose, which is to prove some kind of point. Um, right. And, you know, that that's a serious thing. Like, first of all, uh, people need to learn to take a joke. Uh, and this has become a meme. The whole, like, what's your favorite part of ISOM has become, like, the current meme among our community. In other words, the entire point of it is, the entire point of it kind of serves my message, which is if we're going to be making comics, people need to be reading them. You know what I mean? I, I really, really hate the idea that people are spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on our comics and they well, suck. <laughs> well, they, you know, they could suck. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, they, they'd never know that because they're not reading them anyway. Now I am somebody who spends Look, so hold on. Fun. I want to be clear here. I, okay. Look, I'm not, I don't want to call anyone out. I've never read ISOM. I don't know if it sucks or not. So, but I understand and I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, if you want Comics Gate as a community and just indie comics as a community to be producing the best possible stories that they can produce, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that's what we should be aiming to do because uh, it, we've proven that we can sell books. You know, we've proven that we can move product. I think that's uh, that's good. Right. Now, now um, is that what we're trying to do? I mean, is that was that our ultimate goal? Or like what what was our ultimate goal? Our and, ultimate uh, goal was to start a movement that's a hundred years from now, people will think that was badass. Yeah. A thousand. Yeah, th years. yeah, wow. exactly. A thousand, wow. ten thousand years. Oh my God! They'll be thousand saying, "Listen, year. ten thousand year Reich, uh, cyber frog, <laughs> cyber." <laughs> 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 
Well, yeah, I, mean, I mean, look, it would be a kick if Cyber Frog was actually a movie, right? I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Like, that's when you know you've made it when your comic book character is a movie. So, and I'm sure Eric July is thinking Isom could be a movie someday. It might, like, it might not be called Isom. I don't know. There's that little <laughs> hiccup. But, um, uh, but yeah, no, if Cyber Frog becomes a movie, you probably have had people approach you about making Cyber Frog a movie, right? Um, no. Oh, really? Okay. No, no way. No, I haven't even tried yet. I, in order for like people to really approach you about, you know, taking your property and making it into a movie. Um, well, I mean, they're all right. It happened once, but it, I won't tell you who it was. Cause it's like, see, I knew it. Be. Look, I knew it. Martin these, Scorsese. Like, listen, these, <laughs> no, it's, these it's smaller... much more predictable than that. It's like, it's Zach much more Snyder. Like... You're like, Whoa, Zach. No, 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 <laughs> these, that would be great. <laughs> these smaller, these smaller producers will try to buy up the rights on properties just to hold them in case right. they ever become something big. Right. So that's probably the situation. No, no, it was just, it was political in nature. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, okay. So oh, I got you. Ben yeah. Shapiro was like, listen, cyber, cyber frog. I love it. <laughs> Can we get a daily so, wire cyber frog show? So, uh, you know, we, we kind of, we're, we're, we're holding off on that. Cause I mean, really the, the way to get it in, into the hands of the mainstream is to go still through the direct market and, and, and put the book in bookstores uh, and things like that. So I'm not ready to do that yet. Not until the first four books are done. And I've got like a, a 200 page epic, you know, cyber frog, 200, it'd be more like 400 page epic cyber frog story that I can put into uh, Barnes and Noble. That's the ultimate goal. But mm -hmm. yeah, like I, you know, um, there's a, a strange thing going around where, um, hey, like people aren't reading the books uh, and they need to read the books. And also uh, criticism needs to be, welcomed and received and and then also like offered more often you can't really get criticism unless people are reading the comics so um if the point of this is just to sell comics to sell comics so that sort of we appear to be um you know everything that marvel or dc is like oh we're, we're making more money than they are or whatever it is then i mean mission accomplished you know cyber frog outsells uh, you know pretty much every uh, Marvel or DC trade paperback and graphic novel. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, ISOM does too. And, you know, all these other, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of comic skate books are doing that. But um, the, the difference is like those books are, are being distributed widely uh, and people are actively reading them and commenting on them. And they're, you know, there's whole groups of fans, fan movements that rise up uh, discussing the stories. Uh, also um, there are, there are, criticism websites or at least there used to be where they would go through and review these comics and really give them you know actual reviews mm -hmm. so uh that, that's what i'd kind of like to see uh happen here i think and I'm, I'm running into a little bit of resistance now the whole like you know what's your favorite part of isom thing uh is happening because um at some point dick masterson and nina infinity uh, both got on a Nick Ricada stream and both of them confronted each other about, you know, Isom's great. No, Isom's crap. Well, d you didn't read it. Neither did you. Da -da 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 -da. All right, let's mm -hmm. both read it. And let's, uh, you know, uh, like neither of them read it. They all had strong opinions about it, but neither of them had actually read the goddamn book. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you know, we, we need to... We need to try to get people to, to read these books and respond to them. I want to hear what people think of the work because uh, I work really hard on the stories. And I know you do too, Adam. I know your comic book, you know, it's like you you work on it. I mean, it's I've worked harder on the art, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the art is, I think, you know, that's why people buy the comic book is for the art, right? Look, I... I to be honest mm -hmm. with you, if a comic book has amazing art, I will buy it even if the story sucks. Because this is I how just, you know that Adam, at his heart, is an artist and not a writer. Yeah, writer. look, I like the eye candy, right? I, I, I think, um, <laughs> look, and I do know there are some books that just are abysmally, you know, drawn, but are top sellers because they're like a great story. Like, obviously, Scott Pilgrim is not really amazing art but i mean the story people love and it got made into a movie and all that so i mean i um 
Yeah, you kind of got to weigh those things. But I, I look, best case scenario, you have amazing art and you have an amazing story, right? That's the that's like the magic. Well, the, the story is actually what matters because I think we have a, a whole lot of artists around us. You know, mm -hmm. we've got we've got a lot of artists, and then we've got people who profess to be writers, maybe, and mm -hmm. uh, they could use some criticism too. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, when all of my friends are artists because artists hang out together and writers hang out together and we all try to date the writers or say, date in quotes you, you want to have a you want to have a, a partnership with a really really good writer when you're in the mainstream because mm -hmm. they're the ones who get all the gigs they're the ones who get all the big jobs and you know hopefully uh you know they'll they'll say i want him to draw it so um uh you know anyway the artists all kind of hang out together and that's really what comic skate largely consists of we've got a few uh writers we've got mike Barron, we got chuck dixon uh we've got some others but um for the most part it's all artists we we, we need to learn how to tell stories because um you know the biggest complaint that kind of led to comic skate being uh, a thing was that a bunch of uh you know uh weird activists homosexuals and feminists uh had taken over the comic book industry and started telling weird activist feminist homosexual stories with spider-man and with superman uh and with batman and we just think that's out of line and out of place and that you want to talk about like affecting the culture uh you know of course politics are downstream from culture these people are going right where your kids are and let's not forget that's what this is all about. Like you know, they they want to sit there and they they want to. I, I saw, I'm watching Blue's Clues with my seven year old, you know, and it's like uh, my seven year old has autism, so uh, Blue's Clues, and they're drag queens and like you know uh, a, a lecture about how uh, some kitties have two, some kids have two fathers and uh, pride parades and everything in Blue's Clues. Like they're really going young now. They're going after your kids. Uh, and they're trying to uh, control the messaging at a very, very young level. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're doing that to comics as well. Obviously, they, they, I think the idea is, and I'm a conspiracy-minded fellow here, Sitch, you know, you can tell me I'm I'll wrong. I'll allow but... it. I'll allow it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I feel like the plan is, um, it doesn't matter what uh, Ethan Van Skyver thinks, uh, other boomers who are like approaching 50 years old, because they're dinosaurs. They're, we can't change their minds, but we can go after their kids and we can reprogram the thinking, the way that their kids think. Uh, and uh, if we do that, then, you know, of course, if we if we insert their, you know, uh, these gender ide ideas and our weird politics, communism uh, into kids shows and comic books and video games, they're going to grow up to be very, you know, uh, they're going to vote the way that we want them to. When they get older, they're going to think the way that we want them to. Uh, and they're going to be good little servants of their government. Now, I uh, personally, uh, I can't stand that. I find it like disgusting that these people are trying to poison uh, children's entertainment. Um, and they've got a head start because they've taken control over stories that people already love. Stories, IPs and properties that. People are, they're not creating anything new. They're hijacking things that people already like. Mm -hmm. So uh, the choice is either we kick them, we go in there and we drag them out of these places and kick them out into the streets, or we have to create new stuff. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to create, <laughs> we need to learn how to tell stories. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, the money's wonderful, um, but if the books are no good and people aren't interested, you know, if we can't create things that might appeal to kids um, that, that actually teach them good values, teach them about being a hero, uh, teach them what heroism uh, truly is and keep weird sex ideas and gender ideas and all the things they're trying to uh, impress upon young children out of these stories. Uh, if we can't create the next generation of entertainment, then really all is lost. It is an effective strategy. Uh, to um, uh, to take over the entertainment industry where people naturally go because they want to. Taking the schools, taking academia is one thing. Nobody wants to go to school. That, that you're forced to to become educated. Uh, but you know what? You you enjoy your video games. You enjoy your cartoons. You enjoy your comic books. So I, I it's diabolical and effective, uh, and I want to stand against it. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say. 
what you described earlier, I don't think is a conspiracy theory. I mean, that's obviously what's happening. They think, you know, they want to indoctrinate the next generation into their far left leftist values. And that's why you're seeing uh, drag queens and blue clues and all that other weird crap. Um, but they believe like in saying. manufacturing consent. That's what they're doing. They're like, yes. we can manufacture consent with comic books. Yes. How weird and is that? It's what do you mean fucking manufacturing weird. Manufacturing as... <laughs> consent. What do you mean by that? What are you talking it's about? It's weird as hell. Manufacturing consent is an idea that was coined by Noam Chomsky in a famous book, where he basically said the media and the rich elites were controlling everybody by manufacturing whatever consent they wanted in the population to do whatever so but it is kind of the same exact concept that's happening with comic books they want society to embrace homosexuality and transgenderism and all that stuff so they have the idea that they why, can why, why do they do that what is the conspiracy behind um well uh... look i think it's good nature i think it's they they Gay people come to this awakening that we all come to. I'm sure you you came to the same awakening with your friends, Ethan. I came to the awakening. Like we discovered girls are like amazing. <laughs> like you you come to this um you know, you come to find yourself attracted to the opposite sex and it becomes a big part of your life. Well, gay people around the same time are coming to a much different conclusion. I, that I don't think this has anything to do with gay people. I, I think what, what do you mean? I, I think what's going no, because what's going on is you have a group of kids who became young adults who were basically indoctrinated to believe far leftist ideology, which is obviously more pro gay, but it's not because it's like there's something intrinsic about being gay. It's because the leftist ideology is the idea that we need to overturn the current society and replace it with something revolutionary. And so everything that's considered traditional has to be replaced with things that are not traditional. And that's why but you're that saying- That has nothing you know, the, to do with representation, though. What are you talking yes, about? Yes, it does. What, what What are the representations that they want to have? It's not ideological representation. It's, we need to we need to replace the classic conservative, you know, there's too many white straight males, right? That's like vanilla. We need to replace it with new things. Everything new is good. Well, they're, both, both people can be working together. I, I mean, I agree with you to some extent. There are these types that are just like, we need to destroy everything that's normative. But there is also this problem that I think a lot of gay people, you know, have to deal with. They're coming to terms with their sexuality at the same time everyone else is, and it's completely different. And there's no nothing to accommodate them. They feel like freaks and outcasts. And basically a lot of um, do-gooders have come in and said, look, we want to make these people feel better about that. I agree with that idea, but I'm just saying I, I feel like they're promoting some other weird stuff. Oh, uh, the uh, gender look. ideology is bizarre. I, I you know, I, it, I mean, to me, it seems like promoting homosexuality in every single, uh, you know, opportunity at every single opportunity, which is what they're doing. They're making it seem like it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Seems more about depopulation than anything else. Do, uh, do you it, look can we just no, 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 but see, let I me just, finish let me finish my I, idea really quick look you kind of cut me off in the middle here look I, when i was a teen there was a lot of bonding that went on over girls like we all rated the girls we were all like i like this girl you like that girl i felt like my friendships like the guys that we you know had this bonding over we became best friends and stuff like that did you experience something similar ethan did you experience something similar sitch sure okay so, look, I, I never really thought about this until I listened to this podcast. It was like three gay people. Uh, I think it was two females and one male. And they're talking about how, yeah, that experience that everybody else was having and bonding over and, you know, starting their lives with wasn't happening for them. And they felt like complete shit and outcast, like they were messed up. So, I, I like, I can empathize with that perspective. And I do think a lot of do-gooders are trying to put this into comic books because they're trying to help those people because they are those people. They're the so, ones that did feel like the outcasts. So, I think that's true. Yeah. I, well, okay. So like a lot of people are motivated in, in the same direction by different motivations. And I definitely think there are people like that, Adam. That that's yeah, of course there are. Internal motivation. But I don't think that's like 
the broad the broad philosophy that's motivating the movement because i think the broad philosophy that's motivating the movement is this idea that everything is a social construct and therefore all these constructs like being straight is restrictive and that it, and that being straight or choosing only to be straight as opposed to being you know bisexual or whatever is some kind of conspiracy to restrict your human growth to fit into some sort of evil conservative box and therefore it must be uh, torn down like all these other repressive structures of our society. And that's where you get, because that's where you get like the drag queen stuff. That's where, like, that explains why you get the weird hypocrisy that we we're talking about earlier, where it's like, it's not okay to sexualize women, but it's super okay to sexualize men. It's super okay to sexualize gay men. It's super okay to sexualize drag queens. All these things that are like, quote, not normative are okay to be hypersexualized. I agree. Wow, I like so Sitch tonight. Sitch is speaking the truth tonight, Adam. <laughs> I, I mean, this is... I'm always I, speaking the truth. What do you mean? Yeah, I'm telling you, it's very, it's great. Thank you. Adam's got a very simplistic view about this that I think, <laughs> again, I, you know, it's like, look, well... I don't, I don't disagree. First of all, Ethan, look, I don't disagree with both <laughs> perspectives, okay? There are, right. there, are, there are multiple players on the field, right? The chessboard has different, different pieces that move in different ways, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so there are people that are do-gooders that grew up homosexual and want to, I mean, they even call it, what do they call it? Incl uh, Inclusive. Yeah, they're aligning themselves with these radicals because they either don't realize what's going on or they just want whatever they want and they kind of don't realize the, the deeper philosophical undertones. That if, you, if, you can't, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Representation, that's what they call it, okay? They, um, they want that in comic books. So, Ethan, there's... Two, there's two competing things here, and there are both people doing those things. So, I'm uh, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead, continue. No, me, no. I'm, I'm like, uh, still listening to you guys. Uh, I, uh, to me, I, I, I agree with what Sitch is saying here, uh, right. and I, I think that, um, yeah, but I think there's, there, there are several like different competing sort of motivations for all of this. Yeah, I was just talking about something like this on, uh, on my Twitter, which has been restored. Thank you. Lord Elon, I appreciate it. It was gone for a long time. Adam, uh, at Ethan Van Skyver is back on Twitter now. So happy. You got back? I got back. Yeah, that's why I didn't know that you wanted me in here, because you're still you're oh, okay. still uh, messaging my assistant. Uh, okay, okay. You know, his Twitter. Uh, <laughs> okay. At Ethan Van Skyver was restored yesterday, so you can uh, reach me over there. Okay, but I'll do I, that I was next time. That there's this whole thing about, like... um. Uh, you know, uh, oh, Miles Morales, who is uh, in the world of comic books. This might seem silly to a lot of your audience, but I mean, we're, no, we've cut, we've done a review on the new Spider Man and yeah, the Spider Verse. I like it. So. Okay. Yeah, the Miles Morales thing, uh, you know, it's like, well, why is it happening? And uh, we've got uh, our side of the aisle that wants to impress upon people that Miles Morales is not Spider Man. So they say things like, you know, Miles Morales is Miles Morales. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And that upsets a whole contingent of people who are like, well, Miles Morales is my Spider-Man. You know, so there's that whole thing. And, and Marvel's forward face about this has been, we want more diversity. We have a lot of black readers, people of color, um, who can't see themselves suddenly, by the way. Suddenly, they can't see themselves in Spider-Man, Peter Parker. We need... Um, a black Spider-Man so that they can feel represented uh, in our yes. comics. Yes. Um, which to me means now, uh, well, that's nice. So what about everybody who's not black or white? Then you got to have a million different Spider-Mans, which is what I think they're doing anyway. There's all Spider-Verse of Asians and Koreans right. and uh, Mexicans. Wheelchair, wheelchair girls. Wheelchair lesbians, <laughs> Spider-Man. Uh, so uh, it's a it, inclusivity is a, a really a really weird thing, but so that's what they're saying to people, and that seems so noble. That seems so interesting, but, but the, the reality is, <laughs> what Here actually happened? What actually happened is there's, there's always some sinister financial, government kind of social kind of thing underneath it. Uh, but what actually happened was back uh, in 2010, Marvel Comics. And Disney, uh, they were watching the Siegel family sue the piss out of Warner, uh, out of Warner Brothers and DC for the Superman rights, um, and they won. 
at some point they actually won the copyright to Superman. Uh, and uh, it was overturned because the Warner Brothers has incredible lawyers. But Marvel Comics was aware that the due to the Copyright Act of 1976, uh, in another 10 years, uh, the Ditko's, Steve Ditko's family, who created Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and a bunch of other creators who created the Avengers and everything in the early 1960s, were going to be able to suddenly sue Marvel for the copyright back to their creations. They'd had it for this long, uh, and they were going to have a five-year window to sue Marvel and retrieve the rights, the Ditko estate for Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. So what you saw was in 2010, Marvel Comics watch Superman get sued away uh, from, from, uh, from DC Time Warner, uh, and they prepared uh, a contingency plan for that. Right. Suddenly, here comes Miles Morales who has nothing to do with Amazing Fantasy number 15. There's one thing that like Marvel Comics can't do without. They can't do without Spider-Man. If you take Spider-Man away from Marvel Comics, they don't Spider-Man is their mascot flagship character. Like they really need Spider-Man. But do they need Peter Parker? Uh do they need Aunt May? Do they need any of the characters that appeared in Amazing Fantasy 15? It'd be nice, but how about if we retire those out to pasture or at least prepare for the eventuality when we might need to legally by introducing a new character uh, who will take over and become our new Spider-Man should Peter Parker uh, be taken over by the Ditko estate, which again, for a minute, seemed very likely. So Barack Obama is president of the United States uh, and suddenly they decide... Let's introduce, and by the way, they feigned something. They started, they kind of did a head nod when Barack Obama became president by bringing back the black Spider-Man suit. Uh, and there was this great, super enraging ad in 2009 of black Spider-Man dragging Peter Parker behind him. And it said, he won, they lost, get used to it or something like that, or accept change. What? It said, accept really? change. This was the fun, and nobody said anything about this. It was the most enraging ad. Black Spider-Man carrying Peter Parker behind him, a bunch of dead superheroes. He won. They lost, except change. It was a house ad. You can probably still find it if you look it up. So they were actually planning on doing something here in case this kind of contingency happened with a new Spider-Man. The same Spider-Man, but a new one kind of. So anyway, they ended up inventing Miles Morales. And Miles Morales has absolutely nothing to do with Amazing Fantasy 15. And what's interesting about it is, uh, you know, people keep commenting on our side of the aisle. They're, they're saying, um, how come right now the Ditko's right now are suing Marvel Comics? Right now that case is happening. Uh, and it's it could very well happen. They just put out a book where Marvel just put out the death of Doctor Strange, just in case they lose Doctor Strange, too. Uh, to the because the uh, copyright is coming up copyright, copyright is life of the artist plus 50 years right right and steve ditko is dead but the copyright act of 1976 allows i think it's like a 40 or 50 year window uh, and then the original creators or their estates can sue to retrieve that copyright they have to go up in front of uh, a judge essentially uh, right. and sue to get those rights back especially when um, you know, back in the old days, uh, a lot of these gigantic multi-billion dollar IPs now were, were bought for a pittance, for a page rate. Uh, they sold Superman, Siegel and Schuster sold Superman to DC Comics, national periodicals for $1,200 cash. Yeah, I mean, it's, I saw it's that. A, the fucking outrage, right? Like, it's like, at some point, did you get enough money off of my family's creation? When do we get to retrieve our, you know what great or what granddad uh made for us uh and actually they're th these people are living like paycheck to paycheck like the siegel and schusters they should be billionaires these people should be sitting on yachts uh and they're not because you know of uh this horrible deal that you know the siegel and schusters uh uh you know settled with dc way back when so because of that there is this thing called the copyright act of 1966 which allows uh, the uh, estates to pursue the copyrights back. And that that is now happening uh, with Ditko. So when you see Miles Morales out there and you see like people saying, oh, it's wonderful. This is the new Miles Morales. This is the new Spider-Man for a new generation. He's woke. He's black. You know, he's it's hey, it's diversity. 
Well, the diversity is Marvel's very clever shield against criticism for what they're doing. They're trying to fuck over the Ditko family, essentially. Uh, you know, they're going to... Interesting. So um, you, you'll also see that they only call him Miles Morales, even though we call him Spider-Man, or they call him Spider-Man, the fans. He's Spider-Man. Nope, he's labeled Miles Morales on all the toys. Uh, he's in a movie called Enter the Spider-Verse, but he's Miles Morales, isn't he? Uh, and we've got our side of the aisle making fun of it, going... You know, Miles Morales is Miles Morales. Yes, says Marvel Comics. That's correct. So it's actually like we're accidentally serving their purpose by reinforcing the idea uh, that this uh, attempt to fuck over the Ditko estate um, is, uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, diversity thing. It's a noble thing in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty it's pretty dark. So, you know, there, there are like a bunch of different layers to why this is happening. But ultimately, that's why, you know, that's why this is happening. Now, DC is doing the same thing. DC has created a complete, <laughs> completely new Justice League with a new uh, Brazilian Wonder Woman, uh, with a gay Superman, uh, with a black Batman, uh, with a homosexual aqua, a homosexual black aqua lad, who we call aqua glad, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, all of these things. Uh, just so that they're they're like, well, this is brilliant. We're not going to have to pay anymore. The Marston family has a huge chunk of Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman movie came out and it made a lot of money. And DC didn't see much of it. It went to the Marston estate, the original creator of Wonder Woman. There's got to be a way around that. And the way mm -hmm. around that is to just get rid of every aspect of sensation number one, where Wonder Woman first appeared, uh, and bring in a new character called Wonder Woman, who they don't know. They don't own any part of the trade or the copyright. Right. They pass the torch. So you're saying Spider-Man is going to go into the public domain and Miles Morales is going to be the property owned by DC? But Marvel, you mean? And no, I'm saying that Spider-Man, Peter Parker, is going to be owned by uh, by the uh, Ditko estate. In other words, Marvel can still publish Peter Parker stories, but they're going to end up paying 85% of the, you know, the money to the Ditko estate. Right. Which is not going to work. This. That's not going to be right. financially feasible. You can't that, make. Yeah. Well, I'll say such. like, that's crazy. Cause like, okay. So there's an aspect of this story that like, I never heard any of this before. And I'm assuming like 99% of people have never heard any of this before. And I think you're completely correct is that that is like the huge motivation and then doing it through diversity gives them this perfect shield because i just looked it up because i remember i actually you know i haven't read a super ton of comics but one of the comic runs i did actually read for, for its entirety was uh, ultimate spider-man um before peter died and i remember reading it and then when peter died it felt so weird and like he dies in this like crossover event and it's a really stupid contrived way and i'm like and this is in 2011 so it matches up exactly with the date that you're saying it was right they're after trying to lawsuit. figure out what to do they're trying right. to figure out what do we do about this situation right. going back and forth they had a 10-year window to figure it out and you'll see that like they really are going to put peter parker out to pasture now because unless unless you know the ditko estate is utterly defeated but they're doing pretty good uh the seagulls lost mm -hmm. so you'll notice that superman uh, you know, during the um, uh, 2010s, 2011, when the Seagulls were winning and they won certain copyrighted aspects of Superman, the spit curl, the red underpants, the boots, the red boots, the symbol. Uh, and you'll notice the DC Comics covered by this by creating something called the New 52. And the New 52 was ostensibly, we're just relaunching all of our books with new changes for a new era. But what they did, what it was, was it was an opportunity to launch three different versions of Superman now that had that didn't have those copyrighted aspects. And I was there when this happened. They actually offered the job to me, and I did a cover for Superman. And they showed me the drawings. I said, this doesn't look like Superman. And I drew the spit curl mm -hmm. on his. They could, digitally took it out. <laughs> <laughs> they digitally took it out and i was like right. why are you doing this why did you take the spit curl he doesn't have the spit curl anymore what well maybe he does maybe it just ethan he doesn't have the spit curl anymore <laughs> so um you know all of this was happening the new 52 this is such a scary thing for these companies to lose superman or spider-man that they actually created an entire event to cover it up the new 52 
right uh with three different kind of versions of superman one of them was wearing jeans like they were so upset that he wasn't wearing his red underpants anymore that one of them was wearing <laughs> jeans you know the superman t-shirt uh mm -hmm. they were trying to figure out how to do it um and still uh retain the majority of the of the copyright of this right. character but they were about to lose action comics number one yeah i mean because like you know that is so crazy because i guess that, that makes sense because you know, I'm, I'm reading this. This is 2011. So it's like kind of, I mean, it's pre woke stuff, you know, even though Bendis, you know, seemed kind of woke, um, but in a way that I tolerated, you know, I liked his, you know, even his, when he had Luke Cage be in charge of the Avengers for a while, I was like, okay, you know, I, I liked the way that the character was written and everything. Um, but I really liked Ultimate Spider Man. Then when Peter dies in this like really dumb way and he's replaced by Miles in 2011, and it was like super weird because. The, I mean, my big problem with it not only was that Peter died in a really shitty way, but then Miles in the comic, at least originally, was the most boring character ever. He was just this flat character. There's nothing interesting about him. And I just stopped reading at that point. Mm. Um, but but then the so I never liked his character in the comics. I don't know what he's like now. But then the movies came out and I really, really am a big fan of the first movie. I like the second movie, but not as much as the first movie. Um, so I don't. So I, and I think what you're saying, everything you're saying is completely true. But I think the marketing perspective of the Peter Parker is Spider-Man and Miles Morales, and Miles Morales is a losing marketing issue because there's so much like behind it to what you're saying that people don't aren't aware of. And it so many people are going to look at it and just say, oh, this is like a racist thing. And they're never they'll never hear anything beyond that point. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't like what Marvel is doing, then you're a racist. What do you mean you don't like Miles Morales, right? I mean, it's it's pretty cool. It's a win-win for them. It really is. It, it's very yeah. smart. You know, they can't lose. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe they can't because weird because like so people generally like the movies. Um, but the but I hear like with the game, people were complaining that it's like hyper woke and people don't necessarily like the game. And so there mm -hmm. could they could just ruin the any of the goodwill toward the movies that's created with the, the, the game looked really really dumb the this yeah. the um with well, the spray painting sequence you, you play the as a deaf girl friend. yeah what is yeah. that yeah it's awful yeah hmm. or the uh and then they they care so much well first of all it's funny because so he's like half puerto rican mm -hmm. so he's supposed to have like some giant puerto rican flag in his house which I mean, first of all, it's kind of strange that like just because you're half something, you have a giant flag in your house. I mean, OK, maybe. Well, and a lot of put... people love their identities, right? I mean, sure. It's like... But it's like you walk right in. And it's like this is mess. <laughs> like I've been a lot of people that are mixed ethnic groups. And I mean, maybe it's a little something somewhere, but it's not like right when you walk in, they're not projecting it to the world, perhaps. Right. But then they put the wrong flag in. It wasn't even like the Puerto Rican flag. It oh, was really? Like, is that right? <laughs> it was like the Cuban flag. I know there's some flag that looks kind of like the Puerto Rican flag, but it's not. And they just put the wrong flag in. You mix the French flag up for the Italian flag. And yeah, there I mean, know. could happen. Yeah, it could happen. But so that I don't sucks. know. They might ruin all the goodwill from My Miles Morales going forward. And I mean, they might ruin it with the next movie if they tie in. Um, I, I hope they don't do this. They might tie in Loki. I don't know if you've been watching Loki, which is not a very good TV show, uh, with the spy into the Spider Verse movies, and that <laughs> that'd be very hilariously bad if they decide to go forward with that idea. Um, yeah, I, to me, like that kind of thing actually is is fun. Like, I wish uh, I wish they would do more of that. I wish they would kind of combine all of these things into one solidified world. But I'm not I'm not well, if watching it's good, anything. If it's bad, um, then no right <laughs> well that's what happened with the dccw stuff it's like they did create a pretty good world of terrible tv shows yeah exactly like... <laughs> but that's all the problem with like the marvel tv shows is because they're doing that they're combining everything into one universe which i agree with you i'm even though i know that like that's really bad from uh, a normie standpoint because they don't want to like know all the backstory i'm a big nerd so i love I love, you know, I love the idea that like, oh yeah, WandaVision is connected to the Doctor Strange movie. Like, I love all this stuff. But then the problem is all these properties, or at least the TV shows and movies, just are terrible now. So you're tying in garbage to garbage. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Man, but I miss that. It, here's the thing. Like, if it could be done well, it's perfect because yes, yes. that's when I loved comics was when they were all connected and there was this interconnected world. 
that you could visit. You know, uh, Marvel Comics did it so well during the late 1980s, mid mid to late 1980s, where like, um, uh, you know, every it really seemed real because they'd reference you'd buy a copy of Thor and they'd reference what happened in X-Men. And uh, if you want to find out more about why it's snowing in Manhattan right now in July, uh, go pick up X-Men number 282 or right. something like that right now on Stands Now. Good marketing, yeah. I love that. I Because, I, I mean, I would just, I'd try to find another 75 cents. I had to find out. <laughs> that worked out so well. And they should, you know, they should uh, try to do that uh, with the television shows, obviously. Yeah. But it has to be good. It, but those it books were good, you know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's kind of like, um, I guess what you were alluding to uh, in your sphere was going on with Marvel, which is that you have, a, it seems like they have a lot of people doing these shows that are not, they're not writers in terms of their headspace where their, their priority is not like to write something good. The priority is to write something woke or the wokeness kind of infiltrates the writing in a weird way. Like, why, did you see WandaVision at all? I watched um the first like six I think. Well, there's um, only six episodes, so. <laughs> oh, would... I missed I missed the last two, whatever okay. it was. I right. you know. Yeah. Because like, yeah. like the execution well, I... just could be because you've got writers that don't understand both conservative and liberal perspectives, so they're just unaware. Well, of it's, what it's not. Doing. It's it's just they don't they don't respect I guess normal story the telling because like with WandaVision to me could have been really great if it was just a story about Wanda slowly becoming just evil and losing her mind. And the, and the people writing it wrote it so that they knew that she was the villain. But then they do this weird thing where they try to make it like, no, she's really a sympathetic hero. And, you know, at the end of it, you should feel bad for her. And it's like, no, you shouldn't feel bad for her. What she's doing is horrific. And it's just weird. And we're seeing that more and more, I feel like, with woke stuff where the writers are writing characters that are unlikable or should be cast as villains. And they just keep trying to make you like them because they're like a woman or something. <laughs> yes. You should like this character because they're a woman. Now, ordinarily that works on me. Oh, just... <laughs> well, how hot are they? Come on. Let's be I know, honest. Like, <laughs> why are they all so grating in the comics and in the TV now? It's awful. Now they're um, trying to make you like a woman who's ugly. So you still feel the same way, Ethan? <laughs> Yeah, like I they're like, look at this ugly fat bitch. <laughs> She's your protagonist. <laughs> people are people are pulling like images up. Here's the thing, like, you know, all of this is carefully constructed. Uh, you know, all the, like somebody made these decisions. Like, why does this character in the video game look like this? Why why do all the females look like this in these video games? Uh, well, that's what normal people look like. Who cares? Like, I mean, you can, <laughs> I know, you can make I, them look like whatever you want. Like, why do they, why is this what you're choosing? Like average kind of, um, you know, frumpy housewife with a sword. Like, why? Why does it have to be like that? I didn't I buy outside. the normal people video game. I didn't exactly. buy the like I'm right. the, the grocery shopping simulator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, to Walmart enter a new world all, here. You see all the frumpy people at Walmart. Okay, we don't need to see that in our video games, especially when it's and it's so hypocritical because it's like yeah, the women all look frumpy, but then the, there's a bunch of like men that are like hyper buff. You know, which Arnold is what you were saying earlier. Like yeah. there's a real emphasis now on kind of objectifying uh, men. Like, yeah. who was it? Was I talking to Camelot? Camelot said something. He's like, when was the last time you saw a pair of tits in a movie that was on a, a woman? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, uh, it's been a while. Like, I didn't <laughs> even think about that. But, like, it used to be in the 1980s and the 80s kids. They were great. The movies in the 80s. You'd go to Blockbuster. You'd go to a movie rental place. And you'd go rent, like, a slasher horror flick. And you flip over the box. The, of the vhs Oops. tape and it would say nudity like yeah. rated r for nudity and you i was like 13 years old 12 years old but my friend's dad was really hip because he was divorced and so he'd say <laughs> whatever you boys want you know his, that's, his marriage so, fell apart that's why it was cool <laughs> he just didn't he's just like whatever cool dad hip dad so we'd go out there we'd rent like fucking slumber party massacre or something or howling too and mm -hmm. take it home, and it was nothing but beautiful, bouncing boobies. That's all it was. And we were just like, this was before the internet. Now, right. nothing. Yeah. Um. But you, you don't even see that in movies anymore. 
like every now and then, like Helen Hunt will sort of get her saggy things out and you'll just be like, and it's meant to depress you. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's not meant for you to go, wow, that's beautiful. It's like, it's meant to depress you somehow. Like this is, look how deflated life is and those are. Uh, you know, and meanwhile, like there's a lot of like dicks uh, in movies, a lot of man ass. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it, this has got to be deliberate. There's something going on. Yeah. Uh, with this. Well, there, I know like it was weird because, well, not weird, but I guess like in, even in Thor Ragnarok, which I didn't like at all, they have that scene where like he gets all his clothes ripped off and everyone's like hyper objectifying him. Um, mm. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, you know, imagine that scene with a woman and it's like Marvel Studios canceled forever. You know, a million articles launched about how horrible this is. I witnessed a woman sexually assaulted and raped on screen. And now I had to go home and cry. Because Natalie Portman had her clothes <laughs> ripped off in front of like all the Greek gods, you know, in Thor Ragnarok. But then it happens yeah. to, to to him, to Thor, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, did you see his butt?" Let me zoom. Like, all the articles like zooming in on Chris Hemsworth's ass and like talking about how you know much they liked it. And it How's... seems like it seems it's weird because like I hear that and I go, "Yeah, I guess that's fair." You know, it isn't <laughs> fair. I I shouldn't have to see that. And where are the tits? And what happened? Like, why are we not allowed to look at women anymore? In these movies. House of the Dragon has tits, so the, oh yeah, 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 yeah. All the Game of Thrones stuff is still pretty good. Yeah. At least That's, it will be for a while. They're not so. doing the dick in your face thing, but oh. yeah. well, they had they had a lot of floppy wieners in Game of Thrones. That's, they had both. Did they, they had really? Equal opportunity oh, okay. nudity. Yeah, sure they did. I I must have blocked it out. I don't I don't recall. They have. What I mean, are the rules the whole... for that? You're not allowed to show an erect penis. They have to be uh, it has floppy. To be floppy. Yeah. That's the really? Rule. That's funny. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Game of Thrones oh, is the last bastion of equal opportunity nudity for the sexes. Hmm. God bless it. God bless. So do you, do you guys want to move on to storytelling? You guys want to talk about storytelling? I want to talk about floppy wieners. But two yeah, things. Look, I want to, look, we started a little bit on the storytelling with the, the comic stuff. Do you, so what is, do you want to talk about what's your process? You, you had gotten, I guess some notes from, Dick Masterson that you thought were really good notes. And I yeah. feel like Dick Masterson notes are straight out of Save the Cat, which I think is a really good book. I recommend it to you. I'm not sure if you read it or not, but No, I haven't read it. And everybody yeah. you're you're the first one to recommend it, and everybody else has recommended it to me too. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's like the only screenwriting book I'll recommend because most of these books are so boring. Like they're just they want all they want to do is put you to sleep and virtue signal about how intelligent they are about storytelling so i mean there's good stuff in them but save the cat is really just like the meat and potatoes of how to sit down and write a good script yeah i gotta read it so i'm gonna ask do, for it for christmas look we wrote we were obviously we wrote our i wrote my script with sitch we wrote a script together for our comic and i was kind of fascinated to learn there's like this story writing style that you're just drawing the book out and you're not even really doing the dialogue until the book is completed which just is baffling bonkers to yeah. me that, well that's what i do you don't you do something different <laughs> than that that's exactly my process well look i i've written you a bunch work of on that i've <laughs> written a bunch of screenplays i've like i've i've written a lot <laughs> and just i just there's something that's super important that I I think is essential to good writing. It's set up payoff, set up payoff, set up payoff. And it just it requires some sort of structure that I don't know that you are you doing that when you're just drawing the book out? You're thinking in terms of set up payoff. Like I, I when I think of a story, I'm like, what is the ending of this book that's really just gonna make people just you know, they're gonna just stand up and cheer. Like that's the ending they want to see, like the coolest thing I can think of. And then there will be a number of setups that I need to get me there. So I very much write stories backwards. I'm thinking like, I want a spectacular ending that I'm working towards. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> correct. I mean, literally every single thing that's in Cyberfrog Blood Honey mm -hmm. is important and pays off in a big way. And you know, my attitude is right now, I just got done, I put out Wreck Planet, um, which is kind of the middle of the second act. Uh, it goes up to the middle of the second act. 
And then issue three is going to take you kind of over the hump, you know, past the into the third act. But okay. I mean, my whole thing is just like, um, okay, so we, we know who these characters are. We've introduced them. We know what they want, what they're trying to accomplish, who they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, et cetera. And now we're going to take them straight to hell. And I'm going to, I'm going to torture these characters. I'm going to put them in the worst amount. Now I already know the solution to all of this. Well, you know, in Cyberfrog, when his mother tells him, Chelson, the spacecraft, like, you are uniquely able to turn back this invasion. Uh, and Cyberfrog goes, how? And she goes, you'll see. You know, this, is in, right. this is in book two? Book one. Okay. Book one. So, you know, uh, and then when the invasion happens and he fucks it up, uh, now, what do you mean? Like, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't turn back the invasion. Now what? You still have the ability to do this? What is this ability? What are you talking about? Well, there are like, you know, several answers to that question, but we reveal them over time and not until, and this is the great big conclusion, but not until we, we've tortured these, these characters in every single way um, that they've already said at the, like all throughout the book, that that would be the worst thing that ever happened to them. So it's like all through the book, you you hear these characters say things like, this is who I am. This is what I want. This is like how I feel. And this is what I hope doesn't happen. And then basically well, all good. of that happens to them. Uh, and then, you know, you take them to the absolute lowest point and you think that they're at their lowest point in at the end of book two, but they're not. It gets even worse in book three. To me, like book three of uh, Cyber Frog is the kind of, Okay, we're going to take them the absolute nadir now. There's going to seem like just not even a sliver of hope. And then there's going to be something that happens. I told my wife the the uh, number three and she started crying. There's going to be something that happens like in book three that will that will make you cry, that will turn everything all around. And so we're building to that point. We got to build to that point. Uh, issue four is just rock and roll. Issue four is called The Green Supremacy. Uh, and it is just fucking awesome. It's just going to be everything that you want to see happen is going to happen in book four. Um, so, I, I mean, that's my approach to storytelling. But I see this, you know, sitting down and, and writing all of the dialogue first seems like, hold on, like, let me let me let me tell the story in pictures first, because that's what I know how to do. So right. I, I know that there's a conversation that happens here. Uh, you know, I know that, you know, this is uh, what roughly is being said here, what roughly is being imparted. And I I see the entire story in terms of scenes. And, you know, uh, so uh, I draw those first. And, and after it's finished, after I've got the entire book drawn, I go back in then uh, and I, I dialogue the thing. I write it for the great Eric Weathers, uh, who will take it apart. And then I write it and I rewrite it and I rewrite it and I have him change everything. Ask Eric Weathers, I tortured him on Rock Planet. Change this, change that, change this. Over and over, millions of rewrites until I'm finally ready to let it go. And I, I read my own book a thousand times. Uh, but it's like go, dialogue rewrites because you're not changing any of the artwork, right? Mm -mm, no. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, you know, at, at the point where, yeah, I don't, eh, little, every now and then I might. Oh, you um, will? Okay. There, a little, a couple times, very small changes, minute changes that I'll I'll make. I've actually edited out entire scenes, uh, which I put in a book called Deleted Scenes, or I planted deleted scenes. You can go back and see that the book was might have gone in this direction, but I said nope, and I pulled it back and pulled it in a different direction. Um, but yeah, that to me, that's how it is. It's just uh, you know, um the 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 dialogue is the final coat of polish. It's it's you have this block in front of you and you're just you you know what it is you know what the story is and you you're just taking it and you're piece by piece you're kind of pulling the story out of this thing uh and it is um it is so incredibly fun it's amazing it is so fun to actually you know uh to put it down on paper uh you know what you've the story that, that goes on in your head uh, i have music i have songs um, I have a soundtrack for Cyber Frog, you know, that like I'll listen to and all of the music like is super important and inspiring. Uh, it is. Uh, it's awesome. We're so lucky that we get to do this. <laughs> yeah. We're so goddamn lucky that this is what we get to do for a living. It's amazing. I you know, it's it's painful. It's a struggle. 
But man, the highs are so high, you know, when you get it right. And when you sit there and you read the book in it and you, you ask somebody else to read it and it has an impact on them. I gave it to Shane Davis. Uh, he was like one of the first people to actually read the finished Wreck Planet, um, Cyberfrog 2. And it was funny because Shane is so dry. Like if you if you watch Shane, like I expected he would give it back to me and go, yeah, it was good, you know, or maybe do this. Like he read it and it stayed with him through the entire three hour live stream. Like he 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 couldn't stop thinking about it. He kept returning to it like it was in his head. The world was now in his I put the world in his head uh, and he he lived there for a little while and he he stayed there for three hours on this live stream after he'd finished reading it that is nice. fucking awesome that is storytelling that's that's the potential uh to transport someone into it to create a world and then take someone to that world and 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 make them want to stay there and care about the characters that they meet worry about them think about them by little action figures of them you know right uh, I mean, that's uh, it's absolutely incredible. I, I, I love it. And I want everybody who's in Comicsgate and who's making comics to love it as much as I do. Uh, and, you know, uh, frankly, I uh, I can't stop talking about it. it. It means so much to me. It's so fun. Given the opportunity to talk about Cyberfrog with somebody, I will talk about it nonstop. It means do, a lot to me. Do you bounce ideas off of somebody? Do you tell your wife, look, is do you like oh, who is your sounding board? Or is yeah, it just it's it's my wife because okay. you know it used to be honestly the the thing is it used to be Jeff Johns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I Jeff Johns is somebody who would who would call me up at three in the morning. I'd call him and I, you know, we would just get he even said Ethan and I get crazy manic on the phone together. We start talking like this, uh, and bouncing ideas around. I thought that person was gonna be your boy Zach. <laughs> That's oh, like really? Richard C. Meyer. Yeah. Like, like when I left and I became like comic skate and forget it, like Jeff Johns can't come anywhere near me anymore. He's got, you know, he's, he's got his thing and I don't blame him, but uh, Jeff Johns or not or Richard C. Meyer. I used to try to do that with him. I used to call him up and be like, listen, Oh my, like, listen to this idea. Like what if cyber frog and Jeff would go or not Jeff, I'm sorry. Richard would go. I don't know. Can he just be in a surfboard on eat pizza, say Cowabunga? Like what the fuck is this like end of the world shit? And I'd just be like, see, you're not somebody who you can't. I, That's I quickly not a learned, good riding partner. <laughs> I quickly <laughs> learned. I can't tell Zach anything. I'm not going to be able to get like uh, to have a, a like a sort of creative partnership with him. So I turned to my wife instead right. and I can tell she listens to me. She doesn't offer very much. What she offers to me actually comes from her real life experience. Um, you know, Heather Swain is so much like my wife. Heather Swain mm -hmm. isn't a one to one of my wife, but my wife will say amazing things to me because she grew up in New Jersey. She grew up kind of poor like I did. Uh, and she had something really tragic happen to her when she was like six years old. Uh, her house caught fire, burned to the ground. Uh, and everything was lost. That's a little kid. And like, uh, seriously, like that's going to change your whole of world. Of course. Yeah. You know, that's crazy. So she said to me one time, you know, uh, when I, when I lost my job, you know, uh, at DC comics and things were scary and dire, and we actually like, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're kneeling down in prayer and talking to God and trying to find like, where, where do we go from here? Like what's, why is this happening to us? But she said something amazing. She said, I've had the rug pulled out for me in my life so many times. I don't want it to happen again. And I said, that's Heather Swain. Like, that's an amazing thing for Heather Swain to say, because she's been through uh, so many uh, uh, similar awful things in her life. Um, that's I'm going to, I said, honey, I'm stealing that line. I'm putting it in Heather's mouth. Like that's a, when she's telling me something really sincere like that for me to go, she goes, don't you dare fucking, you know, put that into a comic book. But, uh, that is precisely what happens. When I tell her stories, I I can tell that it's good by if I'm boring her or not. If she's if she starts to sniffle and a tear comes to her eye, because a lot of this is really about family and and hope and survival and all of these things, and she knows where it's coming from because there there's several allegories built into Cyberfrog. 
And when when she has an emotional response to it, that's a thousand. Jeff Johns could never do something like that. He could never approve of any of my ideas the way that my wife can uh, or steer me in a direction. Right. So uh, she's my creative partner now. She's my partner in every single way. Um, but yeah, that's that's a, that's who I go to with my ideas. And every now and then she said, I don't know about that. <laughs> that's out of here. We'll, we'll go in a different direction. But yeah, she's she's really good. And, and you know, you just think like if she like if, if you're communicating a story to, you know, um, your partner and they're not bored. <laughs> by you they would be bored right like oh, that's my husband talking about his comic book mm. my my wife reads all the books for me and reports back so like that's my mom my wife is a huge comic book fan so other people's books really? you mean not yeah yours? like she's okay. i've ordered like dozens and dozens of these comic gate comic skate books and i just i hand them over i delegate look i'm a delegator <laughs> so and she reports back and she says, you know, she's either, oh, this one's pretty good. Or she's like, eh, meh. Mm. Or she's like, oh, this sucks. Why'd you give me this piece of shit? <laughs> but look, yeah. I never, look, I never disclose. I never go, listen, my wife thought this book sucked. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> First but of all, because I'm not going to be able to talk about it articulately. I didn't even read the book. And also... Look, I wouldn't want to throw another creator under the bus. I feel like it's the audience's place to read the book and to, or not read the book. Like I look at the artwork and I say, "Look, this book is awesome. Look at these look at these pictures, hon. You don't see this? You said this book sucks. You made the mistake of reading the words. Look at this <laughs> look artwork. At, look at the images, yeah. Well, the yeah, artwork exactly. can definitely carry uh, a, oh, a mediocre of book you know look at mcfarland's spider-man amazing spider-man in the you know 1980s like uh or you, even his own book like i'm not not just david michelini who was okay but mcfarland's own spider-man book that art definitely carried that whole that whole series so but we don't want that because fortunately for spider-man there are some actually excellent stories out there and that's why there can be spider-man movies and video games and cartoons we want our stuff to be so good that it 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 stays with you when you read it uh and uh we want to tell like i want to tell comic skaters who support cyber frog or any of these books out there um to to read them uh and report back to us about what they liked and what they didn't like but read them and talk about them talk about them with each other how do we do that how do we build a community well, look, if, the, if the story suck though you i don't know that i want them talking about it to be honest with you i mean that's not gonna like you're just gonna be throwing creators under the bus that's where they belong uh if their story <laughs> sucks uh then they have to go back and learn how to write uh, yeah. or hire a writer uh, they belong under the bus yeah oh. okay I don't want to sell them stuff that I don't want to sell people comics that aren't good. You know, just, uh, I have, don't look, you can't, I don't, this is another interesting thing about your process. Like I can, I write out a script and I can give that script to somebody like obviously Sitch and I pass the script back and forth and just beat each other up over stuff. And, and, um, there's a lot of fights, a lot of fights. Yeah, exactly. Sitch and you I guys, fight, so you fight go like back cats and, and dogs. About, oh, that's great. That's true. Yeah. Like yeah. he's he's obviously my sounding board. I'm his sounding board. Like he knows what I like. I know what he likes. Not in a gay way or anything, but I mean, I well, I mean, way. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I I know what he likes in a heterosexual <laughs> way. <laughs> like, but <laughs> I, um, the um, so yeah. But that script we can give to somebody and say, hey, read this. Are we crazy? Like, is this any good or is this just garbage? So. Mm -hmm. But I do, you can't really do that with your your system. Do you even rough out like on a piece of paper beats or or store? How do you how does it come to life? I'm fascinated. You, first of all, I, I want to let people know Ethan does this amazing art style where he basically does a blue scribble on a page, and it somehow turns into an Ethan Van Skyver ink drawing, which is amazing. I don't, how do you do that? It's like, <laughs> it's just like a blue scribble and then it's, and then you well, just draw it. Yeah. A lot of people, um, 
yeah, I learned to do it because I had, uh, I, I was, I became a father and uh, I had to make more money in comics. And I was trying to figure out every single way to, uh, to increase my income at DC. I'd just gotten over there. They gave me a very small page rate of like $150 a page. And that's maybe $150 every day or every other day sometimes. And I'm sitting there trying to pay the rent and uh, all this stuff. Didn't really work out so well. But then I realized uh, if I ink myself, I'm going to double my page rate. So that Smart. was like rev revolutionary. And I fired my ink, <laughs> poor guy. Uh, and I, what I started to do was just go, I'm, I'm inking, so, I'm, I'm drawing so tight with my pencil because I'm like, I don't want my anchor to screw anything up. So I would draw very tight. So I'd say, instead of that, I'm going to do a quick blue line. And then the work that I would have done with a pencil, I'm going to do with a pen. It's already inked. Right. Yeah, so that's amazing. Uh, boom. It took the same amount of time and I got paid twice as much. And it was, uh, that was really helpful. So I basically learned how to pencil with a pen, uh, which is the work that you see me doing now. People say, I can't believe that, like, you're able to go from blue line to pen. Well, I mean, you know, listen, if I mess up, there's a whiteout. You know, I will white things out. Rarely okay. I'm, I'll, I'll make a mistake. Um, but uh, for the most part, all I'm doing is just inking with these uh, wonderful Copic. I don't know if you use Copics at all, but there are these things called uh, Copic multiliners. That uh, Before I was using Pigmas, I was using Kohenor Rapidographs. But these Copic multiliners, size 0 0.03, that are spectacular. Uh, and uh, that's what I used to ink with. Uh, you should pick one up, give it a try. They're a lot of fun. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the story, do you write out beats? Do you, like, rough out pages? You do thumb pages? Um, I'll, I'll go page one to five is this opening sequence. Uh, you know, page 38 to 42 is this sequence. 43 to 48 is the ending sequence. I'll kind of do that and I'll allow myself a certain amount of room. Sometimes I want to do more. Now, Rec Planet was a real big problem because it was, uh, it was meant to be, I sold a 48 page book. People are still mad at me about this. And my dad yelled at me about it. I sold a 48 page book and I went, I needed to be bigger than this. There needs to be more, there's more story to tell. I, I, it ended up being 73 pages. And if you know how long it takes me to do a page uh, with the all, full backgrounds, all the detail that I do, those extra pages, like it's almost twice as big. Uh, you know, I probably could have just taken those extra pages and called it the beginning of Cyber Frog 3 and made more money. Uh, so I made everybody wait. I screwed my family out of whatever that, those pages, you know, uh, could have been half of another book. Uh, and uh, now everybody's mad. But here's the thing. Cyberfrog Wreck Planet is fucking great. I mean, it really is a good experience, Adam, to sit down and read like a piece of artwork that came out exactly the way that you wanted it to. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, so um, in the I future. I can't wait to get it. I'm very excited. Uh, in in nowadays, uh, you know, going forward with Cyberfrog 3, I'm like, it's 48 pages. I've mapped it out. That's it. I'm not going to do that to myself, my fans, or my family ever again. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, you, you break it down. That's all. And, and just leave it open because you don't know what's going to come to you. Like, you, Adam, you, you have antennas to God. You know what I mean? Whether you, you realize them or not, uh, you know, you have little antennas to God. Uh, that are receptacles, receivers, uh, and they've got to be up all the time, and you've got to be ready to receive ideas. You, you, you don't have, know. We have very different writing styles. Me, I'm more like rummaging around through the dump, <laughs> and I'm like, there's got to be something good around here. <laughs> that's, that's more my writing What is style. the dump, though? What does that mean? What is the dump? Well, I'm just, I just, look, I, I believe... That the first draft of any script or story or anything is going to be trash. It's going to be just garbage. Like the, it's the, it's just, it, you can't, uh, the first draft of anything is just, it's bad. It's terrible. So I just, I give myself permission to write that first shitty draft. Terrible. 
you want it long though because then you can like sort of start editing it down to something good so i look sitch how many scenes did we did we throw out that we just didn't really didn't materialize in anything i feel like when we first started we were just like tossing a bunch of scene ideas out sure sure yeah well i okay i mean my my thing is a little different i have a skeleton and i'm adding muscle to it okay so i have a skeletal idea i know roughly where things are going to go and i'll start at a certain point and i'll meditate a lot but i mean you know like uh ideas come and you, you wake up and you go oh oh well that where did that come from that's brilliant i didn't have that before if i just sit down to type with all the ideas that i had at that moment i would have missed a whole lot of stuff that would be given to me later right um you know paul mccartney talks about waking up one morning and whistling the tune to yesterday it's like where the hell did that come from you know it's like his his greatest song he's like I just woke up and I'm -na 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 where whoa uh and uh just immediately gets on a piano you don't know like that didn't exist that wasn't in his head he didn't sit down and write you know all the songs that he was going to write for an album all in one sitting it's just stuff you know um art art happens when it happens and you can't force it um necessarily you've got to just sort of be listening constantly to uh um to whatever to me it's god you know right well, I, I mean, I do force it. This is one of the reasons why I think, you know, I, I kind of force myself to write every every day and just write a lot of bad, really super bad shit. I used to do this exercise where I would just try to fill 10 pages with two people talking. And um, after a while, like, a, you know, some of it will develop into a good scene and some of it will just be garbage. So I do understand what you're saying. Um, but yeah, look, I've had those moments where inspiration has just struck where I've been like, oh, this would be a great idea for a scene. I should use this. But those are always few and far between. It seems like the the best stuff that I have is when I like just lock myself in a room and I'm like, okay, I got to write 50 pages today. I, I did a... a comedy screenwriters lab in los angeles for a long time 10 years actually where i was i was basically forced to write 30 pages a month that i would put up in front of the group we would get actors to basically read the script and it would uh, bring it to life and you could just tell in the room if the jokes were hitting or not because the actors you know would say them and there was an audience and people were either laughing or people were totally confused so it would just give me a feel for on the page you know if this is going to be confusing or not that's mm -hmm. another thing sitch and i often argue about like i being in the being in a room like dozens and dozens of times with people who are listening to a script being read not just my scripts but other people's scripts because this was like once a week i could get a real feel for when people would be like what the fuck is happening here what is going on so a lot of times sitch will want things that are more subtle I, he really likes his subtle sort of writing style and i'm like no People are not going to get that. People are not going to understand. People are not going to make that connection. It needs to be crystal clear here. You need to hit them in the face. We, they need to understand what is happening here. They need to understand the dynamic here. Yeah, but see, so you I, need to you need to be more centrist, okay, in your approach. Because I agree. No, I, that I'm too. <laughs> see, that's the problem. I'm too subtle in things, but you're like way too much in the other. Well, direction. this is why you're we're like good. way too bombastic in this stuff. Like, this is why it's a good the balance. Happy middle ground. We, so look, we have to find the balance look if if um like there are certain scenes that you don't need a lot going into i i don't know if you remember the movie kramer you don't need a hundred missiles pointed at someone's dick okay that's all i'm saying well i mean why not <laughs> <laughs> the look if if there's you know if a, um, a wife is leaving her husband uh in kramer versus kramer's the movie like you don't need a lot of setup for that everyone gets that but a mm -hmm. lot of times in stories, in order for you to understand that there's some real emotion taking place between these two characters, like you need a lot of backstory, like uh, the mountain and his brother in Game of Thrones, right? Like the big fight at the end is not compelling unless you know the entire backstory of their 
their well, relationship. I, the, the, don't use the end. The, the example what you used, which I agree with, is in the in the first season when they have that confrontation where he kills uh, Lancel's. It was Lancel, right? He kills Lancel's horse, and he tries to kill him, and then uh, the hound defends him. And that yes. scene makes it seem compelling. Is that Littlefinger tells Sansa and the audience beforehand about how the mountain burned his face when they were children? Yes. Yeah. So when when I'm when I'm thinking, so when I have a scene with two characters like that, a lot of times I don't get the okay. This scene would be a lot better. You know, this is just two fight two guys fighting. But if I add this backstory component then all of a sudden it's a lot more interesting than just two guys fighting. This is two brothers fighting, and you know there's some real stakes going on here. But then that's why I'm, this is why I'm writing backwards, because I'm like, okay, this scene happens here. I need a setup further beyond so people know that I have that information. So a lot of it is, and look, Ethan, you're super good at this just in live streaming. Like you understand like the audience in order to get this there's a certain amount of information that they need to understand. That is the worst. I, yeah. I tell people that all the time. It's like, um, you know, you like storytelling is everything, like not just when you're doing comics, but when you're sitting there telling me how your day went or you're you're trying to tell me about some event uh, yes. that happened, like how did, you know, what happened? Like yes. Shane's, uh, Shane Davis will be like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like uh, I had to, sorry I'm late. I had to cut up a deer. You know, so I'm here. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, I had to cut up a deer because you know it was dying. <laughs> yes, we need some. See, we need some backstory there, right? It, exactly. Yeah, like you know the the way that like a normal person uh, who wasn't retarded, like Shane is, uh, would tell that story is. Yeah, I was you know rushing home. I, my wife sent me out for groceries. Right? She said, "Look, we're out of we're out of the chunky peanut butter. I'm looking for the chunky peanut butter, and you ate it all. So see what it was that I hit, and I ended up backing over the deer a second time. And so the deer is sitting there suffering in the road. I had to run over it a third time to kill it, put it out of its misery. Uh, and then I just figured, uh, you know what? Some venison uh, would be nice as well. So I cut up the venison and I brought it home." And if you see me, um, you know, if you see uh, Yancey walking around grumbling, it's because I completely forgot the peanut butter on my trip. And that's why I'm in a bad mood right now. It's like something like tell me a story like Shane will leave out like the all the whole thing. Right. And he'll just sort of tell. And a lot of people are like that. It's like just basic conversation, uh, you know, involves storytelling. There's a backstory uh, to that that leads up to the kind of punchline. Yeah. Uh, so. And what well, does Shane drive? Some sometimes look, I see other people. You know, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but a lot of times it's a female. <laughs> they put there's like the opposite problem. They have too much backstory. They're adding all kinds of things in there that are completely the, irrelevant that I don't need to know. Just get to the guys fighting that already. Too. That's Shane too. <laughs> Shane, like, you know, listen, what I just told you was a, a one long thread. All of it led to the one thing, right? Shane will be like like the thickets of commentary with Shane, like just yes, all yes. in different directions. Just follow that one branch. Just a branch that starts at the root of the tree, goes all the way to the end. It's so for little side it stories. would be like, listen, I was in this fight with my wife because I she you know she wanted me to get more peanut butter because there was no peanut butter left and I ate it all. But she was really upset because earlier in the day she was on the phone with her mother. Now yeah, you're mother. No, and you're like, no, you're like, I, don't, I don't need this like, information. What about the deer? Well, how do we get to the deer from there? You know, it's like, yes, yeah, exactly. yes. You're like halfway through the mother-in-law story and you, we haven't even found out about the deer. So when I, that's when I think stories really hit when every single thing in the story is a setup or a payoff and best case scenario, it's a setup. That's a payoff. Like it's a payoff for something, but setting up something else. So, right. yeah, so that's that's why I uh, do the massive amounts of editing and and vomiting out pages that may be a setup, may be a may be a payoff. But, uh, you know, obviously uh, you, you have your style of doing things. I just know that you were you were super into Dick Masterson's 
notes. And I I would be willing to bet that Dick Masterson probably writes in a similar way where he's doing, you know, basically just writing a bunch of pages and trying. I don't know, though. Look, I'm just well, guessing. We don't have anybody in our community other than you mm -hmm. who's read Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have that. And, and there's nobody who's really offering good, valuable notes. What people say uh, is, you need to get an editor. Uh, they say that to each other all the time. If you only had an editor. Uh, and uh, here comes Dick Masterson. Uh, and, uh, yeah, like, he had this these great notes, you know, for uh, for ISOM. I read them, and I'd, I'd read ISOM before. And I, I liked ISOM, but I found it to be kind of forgettable. And I knew it had some problems, but I didn't really know what, and I didn't really care to think about it too much. So I just kind of blandly said, yeah, this is a good first effort. Uh, and then when I read Dick Masterson's notes, I went, yeah, this is all exactly right. This is everything that was, like, missing um, and deficient uh, in ISOM number one. And not that ISOM number one means anything. It doesn't. It's just, holy shit, like, do this for me. Like, you know, th this is important. And also, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, Eric July should be looking at these notes as well and learning from them. Uh, so that was uh, that led to a whole big thing that was uh, really, really strange about like, well, to me, like all that really matters is the ideas. The only thing that matters to me at all is the ideas. I don't mm -hmm. care where they come from. You know, I don't care if it's uh, somebody who hates me or loves me. Like I recognize good ideas when I when I see them. And I want other people to do that, too. I want other people to just sort of put their pride away and then just be like, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was actually valuable, pertinent advice and feedback. Uh, but that led know, to a whole thing. I don't know if people realize um, Adam is weird. Uh, because of his doing all the screenwriting stuff. Um, so he kind of has both the artist brain and the writer brain, since you're like, you know, you do all your artwork and your drawing. Um, but most people, myself included, do not inhibit that space. I have like zero art brain <laughs> completely. Mm. And I'm just too much in the writer's brain space. And a lot of artists are just in the art brain space and they they don't really understand the writing space and like a good example of this to me is um the artist for one punch man which is probably one of the best drawn comics oh, i've ever seen in amazing. my entire life my hero um, yeah he's his he draws so beautifully and so quickly it's like it's incredible um but he's using the story that a different person who's a fantastic writer uh, wrote and there was like a culmination of one of the story arcs, which I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, the artist guy, the guy who draws the comic, essentially wrote the ending of the of this arc as opposed to using the original story. And it's just so much worse. And you just and you see it. You go, oh, he has artist brain. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. understand like why this like why this fight between these two super powerful characters isn't really what's important what's important in this conversation that they have about like the themes of the entire story and how the fight reflects that he doesn't understand all that and so instead it's just like oh they're punching each other so hard that they're like blowing up planets and i'm like okay i guess that looks cool but like <laughs> that's just nothing to do like you're removing all of the things that made the original fight interesting the story elements of it and so i think like yeah a lot of people who are artist brain which is fine they just have to make sure they get some writing brain friends or people to look at the work and be like, like, look, like, listen, this is what's missing in the story here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as you said, because as you said, like when people started with comic skate stuff, it was the the, the story. These stories suck, right? It was these stories suck. They're more concerned about wokeness and politics. And it wasn't, I mean, I'm sure the art suffered because of that, but it wasn't like, oh, the art sucks. The stories are great, but the art sucks. It was the stories suck. And so you got to get yeah, story-minded people to like look into this stuff. Well, a lot yeah. of the art started sucking too, let's be real. Right, but I'm saying that was probably secondary. It, yeah, the art started sucking because uh, they stopped wanting to pay artists, you know? So it's right. like, uh, it wasn't like a political thing. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't, I didn't really know too many politically active uh, artists that were like, uh, I have to draw more homosexuals into these <laughs> comics. I, I, I like, I, I didn't know any. It was, it was always the writers and the editors yep. and things. Yep. So. Yeah, I didn't become an artist. So I could draw buff dudes. No, you, you become an artist. So you could draw, draw like naked ladies. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, look. 
That's what I like to draw. Sit, mm. I'm sure, look, Ethan, you've got to draw Cyber Fog or you've got to draw Heather Swain. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a Heather Swain all the way, right? A, he a Heather Swain day <laughs> is a good day, right? <laughs> no, I love drawing both of them. I, I get excited about all my characters. And oh, I, okay. You know, yeah, I, it makes no difference to me. Like, I put myself in that headspace and I'm ready to go. I love it. I, I love it. Like, I, seriously, I'm so happy about what we do. I'm really happy about it. I love yeah. doing Cyber Frog. Look, it's fun. It's totally fun. So do, do you want to... I don't know how long you were planning on sticking around. I was going to ask you also about... I saw you on a live stream with, with Aiden Paladin, and you were talking about Barbie. I know it's been a while, but I think your position on Barbie was... Barbie is woke, but good propaganda that we should be aware of. Is that kind of your position? It's so it's like really complicated. First of all, people's reaction to Barbie is insane. It's just absolutely insane. But I'll tell you this: uh, I I went to uh, my daughter's Halloween parade. Well, hold on, what do you mean by the insane? We need some backstory. Here. Emotional, in insane? How insane? Good? Insane? Bad? I'm gonna say bad. I'm going to say people's reaction to it is people get volatile about it. You'll see the chat light up with like, fuck Barbie, you're a fucking Barbie lover and all this shit. They're, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's, I do. I think a lot of people were mad at you because you didn't just take the Ben Shapiro line. Oh, it's woke. Well, fuck this movie. You had like a really complicated assessment of it. I thought it was cool. I don't understand how anybody could miss. Like, I, I went to that movie and I, I, I was like, I don't want to. Well, I didn't even actually go to the movie. I ended up. Uh, getting a bootleg of it and watching it in the living room with Andrea. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting much uh, from it at all. Like I was expecting to endure it so I could go on yellow flashes and, and, and bash it, <laughs> uh, which is what, that's you know, so true. that's homework. You know, it's like, get, you got to watch this movie or watch this TV show. Here's a copy of it so that you can come on the show and look, we'll we covered it. it. We did the same thing. Mm-hmm. My wife was so excited. What? You want to see Barbie with me? How? Look. <laughs> it was like her dream day. I was like, yeah, of course I want to see Barbie. I want to see how bad it sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, I was told a bunch of things. I was told like, oh, well, the whole moral of the thing is she gets a vagina at the end of it. So the whole movie's about her getting a vagina. And I went, oh, my God. Like, seriously? Uh, and my uh, my stepdaughter, Kaylee, uh, she she was going with her friends to go see it in the theaters. You know, like the night that we stayed home and watched it, like uh, on on the computer, she went to go see it in the theaters. All her friends dressed up to go see it. Uh, and like I, I was about to say, like the Halloween parade at, at my daughter's school, all the little girls were dressed like Barbie with the pink cowboy hat and everything like Barbie <laughs> seems to have really caught on like that movie seems to have really caught on with a lot of people. But I was expecting it to be woke trash. And what I found instead was a very complex uh, and layered movie with a very intelligent script that almost everyone on my side of the aisle misunderstood. And um, it was painful because I don't want to talk about Barbie, but I want everybody to become media literate. You know what I mean? And it's yes. like to, to, to understand, like in order to really object to a piece of media like a film, you need to understand it. If you're gibbering about it like a retard and you didn't understand it, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It doesn't matter. Yeah, if you Doomer. Uh, <laughs> Doomer. <laughs> you have to. You have to know what you just saw. Uh, and uh, I saw it, and I went, okay. So, you know, here we have Barbie's world. It's really interesting that the men in Barbie's world are all being sort of talked down to. They, they. It's like, it's like they don't exist. That's interesting. But it is also um, funny because I grew up with sisters who liked Barbie uh, and um, they didn't care about their Ken dolls. Literally, it was all about Barbie and the Ken dolls. They might have had one or two of them in the house, but they were just another accessory. Like they'd sit next to her in her pink Corvette. They didn't matter because girls don't want to pretend to be men. Girls play differently than boys do. Girls want to project themselves onto Barbie and pretend that Barbie, you know, is them and they are Barbie and all of this stuff. So they don't have any use for a Ken doll, which is exactly what's reflected in the film. And I said, oh, the world of Barbie here, Barbie land, only exists because it's being driven by the imaginations of eight-year-old girls who play with Barbie. 
they act, they have the same politics as eight-year-old girls, which is girl power. We win. We get to do whatever we want. My Barbie's president of the United States. I rule. It's ice cream day for everybody. It's like that is not a real adult female like world. And of course, like the 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 Kens are all kind of uh, there's no sex or anything like that because no girl under no little girl understands that. So when the party is over, Ken, it's time to go home. This is my house. Just like a little girl would be like, this is my bedroom. You, you big brother, you get the fuck out of here. This is my space, you know, all this. So it completely made sense to me. And then, you know, the I don't have to get into the whole movie, but the, the whole movie is about how um women, it's not for men. This is this wasn't for Mauler. Uh, this wasn't for critical drinker. This movie wasn't for heel versus baby face. It wasn't for any of these people. It was for women in their 40s who grew up with Barbie. And the message of Barbie um, is has always been, the, the actual toy is, it's Barbie's world. It's your world. Girls rule here. You get to do whatever you want. You have a Barbie dream house. You have a Barbie Corvette. Everything is awesome here. Boys don't really matter, but it doesn't matter. It's nothing against the boys. They just don't matter because it's about us. Uh, and then the real world sucks. And these women who grew up with Barbie, you know, are now in loveless marriages. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're divorced and their kids are brats who couldn't even imagine. Like this generation of kids couldn't even like Barbie gets out of the Barbie world and goes to the real world and meets a zoomer brat who is a complete and total cunt, just a piece of shit. This little girl is to Barbie makes Barbie cry, which is a commentary on how bad the world is right now, where kids can't even escape into the fantastic world of Barbie anymore. Uh, these, these girls are just fucking political shitheads uh, who have been raised by the internet. Uh, and, you know, um, the mom just wants to go back because her life just it didn't turn out that way. It didn't turn out the way that she hoped it would. So she wishes she could go back to that innocent time where it was bubblegum and fantasy and all this stuff. And in the meantime, Barbie, by joining the real world, realizes that uh, it's she'll never be a complete woman in Barbie land. Uh, in Barbie, it, like in the real world, it's going to suck. Men are going to grab your ass. It is a man's world. The patriarchy uh, is something that's talked about, but it isn't really real, as Ken discovers. Ken goes and tries to get a job and says, but the patriarchy, I'm a man. I should just be able to come here and be a doctor. Just like putting on a, a set of doctor's clothing that you could buy as an accessory for it. You actually have to be qualified. You have to go to school. You have to go to medical school. You have to attain these degrees. Oh, so the patriarchy isn't real. Men aren't just handed everything. But the great thing about the movie is at the end of it, the creator of Barbie, who was a ghost, uh, you know, says to Barbie, like all of this stuff, these ideas, uh, the patriarchy, this is bullshit. Uh, these are feminist ideas as a way to avoid the realities, the painful realities of life. There's no such thing as the patriarchy. And Barbie decides that what she'd rather do is instead of being a part of this world in which she rules, she's going to join the real world uh, because she's never going to be complete until she has a vagina uh, and can be with a man and can have a family and can actually experience the pain of a man's world. She can never be a real woman until she joins the man's world. Um, extraordinary film. And yeah, there's a lot of woke shit in it. There's a trans Barbie. There's all kinds of bullshit in there that I, you know, fucking take a, a, a you know, a hacksaw to. But it was a smart film. It wasn't for me. It was for women. It was for women to understand and relate to. And I, I just, it bothered me that everybody in our sphere was like, this is woke shit. And it's like, it isn't, it, do you want the movie to be written for you? It's a Barbie movie. Like you shouldn't even be watching it. Like none of us should have even seen it. But now that we did, understanding it and what it was trying to say, there's a reason why it's winning all these awards. There's a reason why it's become the cultural phenomenon of the year. It's not because it's woke shit. And by the way, when you call it woke and it's won all these awards uh, and everybody related to it and liked it, you're really handing the SJWs a big, gigantic W, aren't you? You know, it turns mm -hmm. out woke does sell, doesn't it, assholes? Uh, no, it isn't really a woke film it's a subtle movie about what it means to get older and hit a midlife crisis as a woman uh, and it was brilliant it was beautifully written 
Uh, and uh, I'll never watch it again, but I'm glad I saw it at least once so that I wasn't walking around with shit in my head thinking that the movie was just about Barbie getting a pussy, uh, which is what everybody in our sphere said that it was. It was a man-hating movie in which Barbie gets a pussy at the end. Oh and, well, you know, it, it's interesting because like I would definitely not characterize the movie as like it's all leading up to Barbie getting a vagina because I mean one of my critiques of the movie is that you know is there's one scene in the movie that kind of you know where Barbie's sitting on the park bench which would maybe establish why she was interested in becoming real and the rest of the movie didn't really focus on that and I would actually like the movie better if it was about Barbie what did she say of, on the park bench to the old woman? She said, you're beautiful. She's never she's seen never, never a seen woman old person that's, before. That's yeah, eight. I know. Like, and she never seen, like she was watching people have these emotional Too relationships. Subtle. They need to hit you over she, the head with it. Right. She, uh, I mean, I got it. But she was watching people have these like relationships of like being happy or sad. And she realized maybe that she's never experienced this range of emotions and all this other stuff. But then that all kind of like disappears until the very end of the movie again there's no womanhood in barbie as it turns out the things that people are getting mad about having witnessed in the barbie's world barbie herself is utterly rejecting so when you see barbie's mistreating men and treating them like they don't mean anything and all the girl power shit in barbie world and that makes you angry barbie herself is actually actively rejecting them and the other thing the movie is doing is saying how do you boys like seeing a film in which men are treated the way we feel you treat women? You don't like it, do you? And everybody fell for it. Every single one of these guys said men are being treated like shit in this movie. That's the, the message of the movie is also another layer of the messaging is here's here's a world in Barbie's world. Uh, men are treated like accessories the same way we feel and feminists feel women have been treated by ex like accessories by men in men's movies. For decades, right. for absolute decades. And what we're saying is that should only exist in the brain of a child. A, a fully formed mm -hmm. and fully realized adult should reject those ideas for what they are. You know, even Barbie, you know, decides that ultimately a fair and balanced world in which, yes, men do take control and men might slap your ass and all these things. Uh, and you may cry. You may get your feelings hurt and cry. Um, that is preferable to this super immature world in which one of the sexes dominates the other one. Well, uh, really I, I think I think the latter thing you said, I mean, that's that's definitely true. And a lot of people did miss that with the um, I mean, that was why at the end they didn't have things become equal. We know it's like, oh, you know, now that we respect Ken's, you know, he's like, can I be in the Supreme Court? And they're like, well, no, you can be in the lower court. And then 50 years from now, you can be, you know, maybe right. you'll work your way up. <laughs> right. And yeah. I, and I mean, I get all that. And that's supposed to be the commentary for women had to slowly gain rights and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't agree with the first part, which is that, or if, if that was the intention of the director writer, I don't think it comes across clearly. And I think the big problem for making that um, come across clearly is that, the real world, to me, if they want the message that you were talking about, the real world should have been, it should have been like crystal clear that the sexism of the real world wasn't real, that it was sort of a mirage. And so like, and you could have done that. You could have had that, you know, Barbie and Ken go in the real world and Ken is just kind of amazed that people are treating him not as like a doorstop, that people are just saying thank you to him. And he, and he, because of where he would comes from, he misinterprets this as like meaning something different. And I don't know, maybe he, in his journey, stumbles across some like women protesting the patriarchy. And he's like, what is this? And then they kind of, you know, explain the concept to him. And he's like, that's amazing. And that's, you know, then he goes <laughs> off on his journey. I but think my, they tried to do that though. Yeah, so but they, kind, but my problem is that they, they had like, well, well, no, because it's like the problem is, you know, they go to the real world and like the, you know, one of the first things that happens to Barbie is. She's, you know, sexually assaulted. A guy slaps her on the ass. She punches him. And then somehow she goes to jail for that. And then the cops are still further sexually harassing her when she's getting arrested. And it's and then it's even in like the scene where Kev where Ken goes to get the job that you were talking about. Like at first when I watched, I'm like, oh, this is like a counter woke thing because he's like, I'm a man. I want a job. And then right. the guy's like, What you don't have like education? And then he says to him, like, well, I thought this was a patriarchy. And he's like, well, it is, but we just have to be, like, sneakier about it. Yeah, and so it's yeah. like, the movie's kind of muddled, in my opinion, like, what the fuck is, like, what is well, I the think message that's truth, here? though. I think there's some truth to that. I, I don't know if that's, the, if that's a message. I think it's like, well, 
there there isn't the complete absence of a patriarchy there mm -hmm. still is kind of the patriarchy from their perspective but you know like wink wink we're disguising it a little bit better now i mean yeah but maybe but then but then it's like that gets compounded with you know when they return to barbie land and you know you have the ken patriarchy which is obviously like comedically done um you know and that's fine and i agreed with kind of and i listened because i remember i listened to some of your conversation uh with Aiden about it, where it's like, this isn't the real patriarchy. It's like a child's version of the patriarchy. It's Obviously, a little you know, boy's horses. version. Of, right. Or you know, actually, horses, it's not even that. It's because remember, Ken a girl's still, version of the boy's version of it. Yes. Right. Correct. Ken is still yeah. being puppeteered by a little girl. Like a little girl. So, yeah. And I, yes. And I, and I think you were correct in that um, completely in terms of how it was written that way. But then, and this is again the muddledness of it. And I think it's kind of like the writer director trying to do too many things. It's like the way in which, they're supposed to waken the Barbies out of their, you know, stupor to become, you know, feminist is that, you know, America Ferreira has to give this like truth to power speech about all the difficulties that women face in the world, which number one, you could have that exact same speech, but for men, it's just slightly differently. And then number two, from a like from the story perspective, that speech doesn't even make sense to it doesn't shouldn't go even anywhere. make sense to the Barbies. It only makes sense to like women in reality. Yeah, it, it didn't make sense to the Barbies, uh, and it, it was just America Ferrera's uh, that that mom characters. Uh, that's her point of view. She's also been perverted by the real world. Uh, that's her complaining about the realities that yes, she found outside right. of Barbie. But it doesn't right. mean anything to the Barbies. And I don't think it's the message of the film either. It's just that one character saying that. Yeah, but they use that to solve one of the major conflicts of the movie, which is how to unbrainwash the Barbies. Who was unbrainwashed at the end of that? You think the All Barbies the... were unbrainwashed? Yeah, well, no, because remember, the Barbies are brainwashed into the patriarchy. Like they had the president is like wearing a maid's outfit and she's serving beers to the Kens and they're all like totally fine with it. And then they, then America Ferrera gives the speech, to the Barbies and they like return to their former selves or their strong independent women's. Right. Yeah. I, I really just think there was a, a moment of kind of a domineering big brother sort mm -hmm. of that, that took over for a minute and the girls kind of shook them like, get your shit out of my room. Again, like the Barbie dream house is just a little girl's bedroom and her brother has invaded it and put all his toys in there. And she's like, get this shit out of here. Um, but yeah, I, but see, I, that, that wouldn't that wouldn't manifest through the truth, this power speech that would manifest in some other symbolic way. That'd be more symbolic of like removing the boys toys from the girl's room. That's because I think I, I think part of the problem with the movies, I think I think the movies actually too muddled and actually horribly incompetently written because your interpretation of it i compl i see it and i and it makes sense but i'm not sure that that was the intention at all well, the, the pussy thing it. at the end was it, tacked on like that wasn't they just did it to be funny they didn't mean anything by it which well, is a huge revelation <laughs> th there was an interesting there's a couple there's an interesting interview uh with the director and there are a couple interesting interviews with the director and one of them that which we watched on the show because um, we got an argument with Doomer about whether it was the movie was feminist or political or not, um, which is not your argument. But I, but in the interview, uh, Margot Robbie is saying like, oh, you know, I wish people didn't just focus on it being feminist. That's just one part of the slice of the pie. It's a movie about a bunch of different things. And when she says that, the director looks at Margot Robbie with like a shocked face. And she says, well, it's a pretty big slice of the pie. And then laughs in her face for kind of like trying to downplay the feminist aspects of the movie. And then there was another interview where she was talking oh, about the director was talking about the the filming of the scene where they're skating in California, mm -hmm. um, the, that famous scene. And the director was talking about how it was very interesting when they were filming it because all these people would come up to Ryan Gosling and they would talk to him and they would say like, oh, you look so great in that outfit and blah, 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 blah. Every no one came up to talk to Margot Robbie. People just look at her, but no one come up and talk to her. And it was fascinating because the director interpreted that through like this weird feminist lens of like, well, this must be because they're objectifying her as a woman. They only see her as a sex object. So they don't see any value or worth in going up to talk to her, but they see value and worth in going up to talk to Ryan Gosling. That's how the 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 director interpreted that interaction. When it's very obvious why no one went up and talked to her, because they don't want to get in trouble talking to a woman 
a famous actress who's dressed in kind of a sexy outfit. And they're like, is that creepy? Is that weird? Am I going to get me too'd if I talk to her? Am I allowed to say that she looks good? What the fuck? I'm not, I don't know. You can go up and you can objectify Ryan Gosling all day. Tell me he looks great. But can you say it? The Margot Robbie wearing her, you know, uh, ass thong in that, in that shot. That was beautiful. That shot was amazing. Exactly. But you can't. And the director didn't understand that. And it to could me, also that, be that Ryan Gosling is a bigger star than Margot Robbie is. And I, I'd it, much it could rather, be, but but I think it was just people don't. There's there's a thing where people don't know how to like, and I'm sure you've seen a million of these videos where like, you know, there's a woman a woman at a gym, and like some guy goes up to talk to her, and maybe mm-hmm. he's flirting with her, maybe he's not, and she films it, and then she puts it on the internet and makes fun of him, right? You've seen like these videos of a million. Sure, yeah. And it's there's this weird thing where like you people are afraid to interact with women now a lot more than they ever were especially a famous woman especially a famous woman wearing a skimpy outfit especially a famous woman wearing a skimpy outfit in a scene where a guy's slapping her ass and then she punches him (laughs) so it's it's like to me it's very clear what like what is the interesting thing happening in that social dynamic and the fact that the director the movie doesn't understand that makes me think she doesn't really understand what the fuck's going on in reality so she accidentally wrote a super brilliant insightful yes. movie well can well, you call it brilliant yeah. if it's accidental i'm not look well <laughs> our, not sure I, her, you I, can. I think her husband wrote it with her so maybe he came up with all the good ideas well I, that might be true because i honestly it, it's just art like most people aren't going to encounter the artist so if yes. you're just if you're you know dealing with a piece of art and barbie was art you know that movie was an, an art film it was really strange disguised as a kid's movie it was i agree a yeah. peculiar film yeah. uh it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the uh, artist intended or says she intended. Her, by the way, her saying that it is a feminist movie. I agree with her. It's a, it's totally a feminist movie. Yes. But what is feminism? What does mean? it mean to her specifically? Right. Um, it just means a woman. A woman's being the struggles of being a woman. I guess. Um, so uh, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, like uh, the idea that that happened accidentally. I really don't believe there was another mind there that certainly did know like what was being done there because it was Mm -hmm. uh, it was really aside from the slight kind of uh, imperfections that you're describing where it kind of went off the rails a little bit here and there really even even the thing of her getting a vagina at the end um and it's funny because like you know the woke people they'll complain about anything woke or anything not being woke enough if they don't like it but if Mm -hmm. they like something like they like barbie and all the anti woke people didn't like Barbie, right? So that kind of like further psychologically makes them want to like it more. Her getting a vagina at the end is actually like an anti woke thing. That's not a woke thing of because it's it, clearly yeah. solidifying the fact that like a woman has a vagina, or that for her like like the scene, the joke of the scene is you think she's about to get a job interview somewhere, like she's gonna have agency, she's gonna have a job, but no, she's just getting her vagina checked, right? That's actually like a very kind of anti-feminist message. And I don't, so that's why I'm saying to me, it seems like the messaging of the movie is confused. I'm not sure it's, it's not well, clear I, to me I what don't they know. intended. Yeah, it's like, it, it's interesting. The vagina thing was just a, you know, she she didn't even say a, a vagina. She went to a the gynecologist. gynecologist and right. she had her appointment there, which indicates that now she is, like, what's a quicker way to say I'm a, I'm now a full like a, I have a woman's body now. Like what's a a quicker way of saying I'm a functioning woman than just a gynecological appointment, a gynecologist appointment? That was a real quick way to just say look, this is what's happened to this character now. She's changed. She is now a human woman. Um, yeah, but the the joke in the scene, I don't know if you remember, they're like she's in the car with the family mm-hmm. and it's filmed and written in such a way that it's like oh, she's about to go to her get job a job. Interview. She's yes. about to Right. So it's like right, she's going to join the workplace and be yes. a kick ass woke girl yes. boss. Instead, it isn't that. It's, uh, no, it's I've, right. Yeah, I've, exactly. I've just, right. Uh, and so, right. And and you could, I'm sure you could see that if that was in a different context, woke people would be like howling with anger at that scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, I, mean, I, like, I don't know. It's, I agree with you. It's a very interesting movie because it's, I didn't like it, but I like talking about it and I like thinking about it because it's, to me, it's like one of the most complicated movies ever accidentally crafted sounds like i think it was you liked accidentally. It. i it didn't so- like it no it sounds like you're a barbie lover i sounds liked like you're, i mean you i like that i like the ken song I, I admit i listened to that song a bunch after the movie I see that's the, the worst thing song. adam people go you love barbie but no i, I, I didn't. didn't 
I didn't. I mean, I I liked Chitch it in the sense it, that yeah, I liked I it. I thought in the it sense was funny. Look, way better like... than it's a nice piece of art. But yeah, it's like yeah, being called a Barbie lover now. You love Barbie. It's true. I'm just afraid. I don't. Oh want God, to... I don't want to get the chat's already like going nuts. Like fuck you and fuck Barbie. It's like Ugh. is it really? Well, chat's probably so. Chat is sick no, of us not. talking about not Barbie. Even so that, that could be. Maybe. Chat is not. Chat is like, oh my know. God, you're talking about Barbie again. When well, that's is the Sitch other thing that drives me nuts. Is it's like it's it's like you fucking love Barbie and it was a piece of shit and it didn't mean anything that you say it doesn't. That, that to me is an invitation to talk about why I'm right and they're wrong. True. And then they don't want to hear it. And then they go, shut up about Barbie. Oh God, it's frustrating. Just let me be right. <laughs> Can I just explain why I'm right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And then I'll drop it. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like the thing with going on Aiden Paladins about that, she had such a strange reaction to it. You know, my talking to her about it just to me, it, it like uh, was frustrating because I felt, uh, you know, I felt like I was being mean to her. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because she didn't really have any solid points to hit me back with to prove her side of it. She's just like, oh, I just hated it. And it's like, well, OK, but this is what it was doing. Well, I thought it was stupid and I hated mm -hmm. it. I'm like, all right, yeah, and whatever I don't like it was that kind of analysis at all. Yeah, like, uh, let's not let's just not talk about it ever again, then, which is fine, you know, but it's like, you, obviously, it's an important movie because people can't stop talking about it. And yeah, as well, long as we can't stop talking about it, let's understand it. That's all I'm saying. No, no and I agree with that completely. And, you know, it's very trying to understand what makes people like or hate a movie or a story is can be very simple or it can be very complicated because most people, you know, you just watch something. You're not really analyzing it. You just have this emotional reaction to it. That's either a positive or a negative feeling. And then you just say, oh, that sucked or that was good. You know, you're not really trying to, like, why did I hate this? Movie? What exactly is it, you know, that's making me feel this way? And Barbie is interesting because it was so wildly popular. It was so wildly successful and trying to like analyze, well, why do people like it so much? Why do people hate it so much? That is to me so much more fascinating than the movie itself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I that is something that again I would like to think about, but I don't want to have to endure the uh, jeers from my audience. <laughs> sure, yeah, because some people. Well, because I yeah, because you're right. Because there was this, there's a very big idea about like uh, go woke, go broke, and Barbie, mm -hmm. which I mean that is true to an extent, but then Barbie sort of maybe is the one outlier that <laughs> broke that. <laughs> that was like no, it was pretty woke and like high, like super insanely successful. So yeah propaganda it's all just propaganda it's all just propaganda well uh thanks for joining us it seems like you're winding down a bit we got a like a bazillion super chats to read so are any of them like aimed at me let's see uh, i'll see just look bunch, real quick we had a bunch of super chats from sunday to get through which oh we'll... all right i'll let you go um but right. no let me check right here I don't, my tabs all closed unfortunately so i do see uh, Silk Fox for five pounds says, Ethan, you said you want to work with director X. Are you serious about that? If so, is that an issue that he seems to be a weird activist? I don't know um, director X is. So, oh, director X is just like, um, he's a black creator. Okay. And mm -hmm. he has created a TV show. He's managed to create a TV show and get it funded and everything. And there are all these people uh, on the internet who are bullying him uh, and giving him a real hard time. And all they do is make videos about his TV show. Uh, and they're doing it. I think they're doing it to grow their channels and to make money. Uh, it's, you know, real shitty behavior. It really sucks. It's really disingenuous. It's all done, I think, in bad faith. All these bad faith arguments about this black creator, uh, you know, all these videos and everything. So uh, his name's Director X. And he was good enough to actually uh, to actually come and, and join us uh, on a on a live stream, Yellow Flash's live stream, and I got to talk to him. And uh, interestingly enough, like his whole st his whole story is uh, Robin Hood, the Robin Hood myth, but done in today's setting and with a with a bunch of black girls instead of the Merry Men. Right? Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to stop a, a developer from kind of taking over their neighborhood and whatever, kicking them out. 
So they're robbing from him. And everybody hates it. And I haven't seen it, but I liked him. I, I enjoyed talking to him. And I just thought it was really amazing. Uh, the, again, in this community, the lack of self-awareness about how, like, here's a black creator and you guys are making super chat money, bullying him over his project uh, and um, doing it just for the laughs. You're trolling him and all this stuff and refuse to really talk to him personally when he's willing to talk to you. And then there's this other situation, which is interesting with another black creator who you're mad that there's another group of people who are organizing a campaign to bully him and his project. The same, the same thing is going on. Like people don't really, there's like very little self-awareness, I think sometimes in the YouTube sphere. Uh, it's uh, it's bizarre. But anyway, this guy, uh, we have a book, me and John Malin. I just published John Malin's book called uh, Black Riding Hood. Uh, and in this book, uh, John Malin decided to see how many times he could use the N-word on a single page. Something like nine times. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. And, uh, well, it takes place in the hood, you know. Uh, so right. It's got to be accurate. Thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Look, so They don't sugarcoat it in the hood. I've seen no. Menace to Society. This is Menace to Society meets The Howling. That is how I pitched it. I said, this is a new Buffy the Vampire Slayer for wow. a new generation. Look at this. Look at this kid. Look at that werewolf. Give me that ass. He's saying to the little black kid here. That's a little black riding hood there. Wow. Uh, now, this is the kind of thing that Director X does unironically. This is also the kind of thing that we do ironically. So uh, I pitched it to him. And he, nice. wants, to, he wants to do it. So... So it could happen. Yeah. And it's just the world is so weird. Like the internet is weird and all this stuff is weird. But yeah, like, would we do? I, I talked to John. I said, Would you sell out your precious Black Riding Hood idea to SJWs? He's like, Yes. And I was like, Yeah, that's my boy. So uh, we'll see about that. But yeah, it's, a, it's a, a good likelihood of it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I love Menace Society. That's like one of my favorite movies. Uh, Metalworks four eleven ninety five dollars says, "I know I'm late, but I feel like Miles Morales could work if it handled like DC handled multiple flashes or multiple Green Lanterns. How did how did they handle those things differently?" I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm just. Uh, Do you like the multiple Green Lanterns and multiple flashes? Makes sense. No, not multiple flashes so much. That was pushing it. But the Green Lanterns, of course, they're they're a, a you know a police force. There should right. be many of them. Right. Do well the the other flashes. I mean, Wait, six box in the chat. Okay, I was willing to be charitable, but this is Ethan selling out. I'm dying, dude. Fucking, you guys are the best. <laughs> Who said that? Uh, oh, one of your fox. one of your guys, six fox, fox in the chat. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I'm kidding, guys. It's a joke. Thank you. <laughs> what was the sellout joke? What'd Me saying say? that we're going to be doing a uh, Black Riding Hood uh, with Director X. Okay. You know? I mean, it could it could actually happen, but see the the thing is, it's not really a sellout when this is a parody of what SJWs do. Do you follow my logic there? What do you think of this, Adam? Look, so I, this I don't is... making money and doing getting a project made. That's not selling out. Fuck that. Like, do it. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, that. what's the point of doing a story if it's not going to move <laughs> up the food chain? Yeah, selling out or cashing in. But I mean, the whole thing is, it's like, that's a parody of that. And it would be really amazing. Sitch, imagine if you did a parody of like, woke, mm -hmm. and then actual woke people wanted to make it into a movie. That's the dream. Yeah. Like, I, I can't even, I can't even believe that. Like, that's fantastic. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll do that. Is there a lot of woke jokes in there that work either way no it's just the, is it the comedy i don't know our our no. book is fully comedy like our book is like jokes 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 no it's not funny really at all it's a serious it, i mean it's a legitimate take on a funny idea you know uh i'm i'm doing something called cool story bro in which we take uh, classic fairy tales or aesop's fables that were you know that had girls or were feminine in some way and then doing hardcore masculine versions of them so they're literally gen they're necessarily gender swaps uh but they're gender swaps in a good way fewer women 
more <laughs> tough guys. Uh, and then in this case, it's a race swap too. So it's a gender and a race swap, but it's done seriously. And guess what? It accidentally kind of really works. It's a it's a great, fun, scary little story that we put out for Halloween. And I wouldn't be surprised if it gets made into a TV show. It should. That's a, that's the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the dream. Heck yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate being here. I don't know if there's anything else, but you guys, Adam, thank, thank you. you for having me on your amazing show. No, no. Yeah, we love talking to you, man. It's, and, it's a uh, lot of fun. Sitch, you're the man. You're thank man. You. How how old are you? Can I ask? Uh, I'm in my 30s. Oh, really? I thought you were in your 20s. I sound young, I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you're very smart. Jesus, God thank Almighty, you. your IQ is double mine. Uh, but Adam's is too. <laughs> <laughs> uh thanks no adams is mine and a half yours is double mine. Oh, okay thank you i get, yeah, to, I get the edge yeah <laughs> you guys have a great night thank before you before you go you. though before yes. you go can you say clip it ct clip it ct thank How's you that? perfect Wonderful. all right good night good thank night. you look at that what a good sport he even gave you the clip it ct at the end lots of energy too he didn't, i know he didn't moller it he did not moller it that's right they'll forever be known as mollering <laughs> true Ooh. okay that was an interesting conversation did you get your barbie phil i did i did um i understand why he, how he views it the way that that way um because i i that's why i said i that's why i think it's just the, the, it is confusing. It is muddled. To me, it's not clear what the message is. You know, and I know, like, if you were there, Adam, because I know yeah, you, I would have been saying, so listen. much about clarity. You would have been screaming at Greta Gerwig and her husband, you're like, what does this mean? Yeah, <laughs> look, I would have been, I look, I would have told him day one, I would have said, listen, this vagina thing is amazing. But we need a setup. Look, what the fuck? Well, no, so like, an example of the clarity and I'll say this and we'll stop talking about Barbie because I know everyone's sick of hearing about Barbie. No, is, we talk about as long as we um, want here. The 12 scene, hour Barbie street. There's a scene where like once, once Ken's have taken over, but all the Barbies have been deprogrammed. Mm -hmm. um, they have to win this vote, which doesn't really, I mean, the logic of the scene makes no sense because there should be like way more Barbies than our Ken's, but they have to win this vote to maintain the female supremacy over the Ken's. And in order to make them miss the vote, they're going to do this intricate plan where they're all going to take the Kens on dates. And then they're all in the middle of the dates, going to walk away from the Kens they're with and like go out with different Kens. Right. Which again, doesn't even make sense because they're all sitting in a circle. There's like 10 groups of Barbies and Kens. If they all got up and sat, swapped with different Kens, right. then it's would just, they all just have different Barbies and Kens? But it's it's like swinger kind of, night at the... Right. Yeah. Like... At the, the whole dojo scene, casa. Exactly. The scene makes no sense. Um, because it's like like half the Barbies just disappear without showing them leaving. And then the other half get up and go with other Kens. And then this is supposed mm -hmm. to get the Kens angry at each other, so they all fight each other the day of the big vote instead of them going to vote. That's like a it's all distracting technique. Um, but anyway, so I bring this up for the clarity for two reasons. Number one, are you supposed to not, are you supposed to like or not like that the Barbies are basically using emotional manipulation um, to fuck with the Kens? Are you supposed to like that or not like that? That's what is toxic the, like, femininity all the way. It's 100% toxic femininity, yeah. And it's kind of, that's confusing, but then it gets more confused because like the Barbie, I forget what song it is, the Barbies all listen to one song and the Kens mm -hmm. all listen to a different song. And the song that the Kens all listen to, which is the song that they're all playing on the dates with a Barbie is a song. I want to push you around, you know, so I will, I will. Um, and when you hear the song, everyone's interpretation of the song is about a man talking to a woman. Cause it's a male singer, like talking about abusing and subjugating a woman. And that's how everyone hears and interprets the song. But it turns out that the guy who wrote the song said, no, it was actually a song about like an ex-girlfriend abusing him. Right. But no one, but most people don't interpret that. So it's like, okay, when they, when that's the song that the Kens are singing, does the person who made the movie know that? Does it matter if they know that? If everyone's still going to interpret it as like the men abusing the women? 
Look, if you're that's a deep cut as far as information goes. That's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. three layers of like complication that you're like, that's holy shit. Not really relevant. Right. If it's so not when, on screen, it's not in the movie. Exactly. So when you so when the cans are all singing, I want to push you around, so I will, I will, it sounds like they're saying they want to subjugate subjugate the women. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not clear. But then someone says, no, well, the song actually means the opposite of that. It's like, well, that how is that? That's not clear to anyone who's watching the movie. Right. So no, I, I do think the movie, but the movie is incredibly fascinating because I like talking about it because it's so weirdly complicated th- on like a thematic level. It's one of the most complicatedly thema- like weird thematic movies I've ever seen because it seems to me so contradictory and so many people interpret it so wildly different. Hell yeah. So that's why I mean maybe that's why I find it so fascinating cuz to me I see it as a movie that was trying to be very woke but I think accidentally is is anti-woke because it's through its the way it was written poorly. But then obviously a lot of people interpret it not that way cuz a lot of woke people love it and a lot of anti-woke people hate it. So That's Eudaimonia's perspective. Yes, I know. He he accidentally conservative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think it, I can definitely see it that way. I don't think it's clearly one or the other. Cause I think it, to me, that's what makes it kind of evidence that I just think it's not well-written is that it's not clearly one or the other. <laughs> it's kind of like this muddled mess of both. Anyway, well, I don't know that I buy this poll. Well, 535 votes. I said, which one art or story is the most important part of a good comic book? And it's 19% art is the most important part. 81% story is the most important part. So it's categorically story. So this is what I was trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's very interesting that Ethan was talking about this. The comic skate people, as he said, are mostly artists. So you have a bunch of people who are mostly artists who are hyper fixated in art because they are literally artists. Mm -hmm. Most people don't care about art <laughs> well look this is why i was like we're not right. going to do a book that the story sucks like come on no i agree get with the you. fuck out of here right. yeah look we're I both agree. writers yeah right because to and that's why like you have and someone brought up in the chat and it's to me it's the perfect example again one punch man one punch man is the greatest example of all this because the original webcomic has dog shit art it's like mm-hmm. some it's like just garbage art <laughs> look and, there look you guys don't need to apologize okay look <laughs> Who's apologizing? Oh, the I think team. they're apologizing over the poll. Right, right. Look, but, I, I, I just, I think both is. Look, I want that extra twenty percent. Call me greedy. No, 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 no. Listen, I, I hear you. I'm just saying, you know, One Punch Man dog shit art, and yet it was so popular, it spun off a comic that was completely redrawn with great art and uh, and a cartoon show and anime. Of course, Original yeah. Because it was so because the story is so good. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so yeah, at the end of the day story is going to always be the most important element to it um i don't agree that that good art can save a shitty story it can only save good art can only save a save a shitty story to people that are very visually uh artistically yeah oriented. who are only buying it for the art that that's and that's, read the story right that's a very few that's not right. a majority of people i don't yeah. look I, i'm not sure that's the case in this kind of situation though I don't know. I think it, I think a hundred percent is. Hmm. The overwhelming majority of people like story over art. Now art's important. Oh, I'm seeing that. <laughs> right. I know art is very important. I'm in the twenty percent. You are in twenty percent, right? I'm like, why do I want to read these little bubbles, man? Just yeah, but you yeah, blow but, my mind. <laughs> but see, you're in like this weird spot too because mm. not you you have both art and writer brain, which is rare then you have like such a difficulty reading that it kind of biases you because i think if you didn't have that reading problem your perspective would be very different maybe because then you would read the comic instead of just looking at the picture i mean i've read my share of comics but maybe i'm just reading horrible comics i mean you've read a lot about a bunch of horrible comics i have hey click on the in the poll it's not working for me i can't for some reason it's not ending the poll. He's ended. 
Tree of Life made no sense, but was a masterpiece. Yeah, that mu you must be talking about the art. No, there's a. Isn't there a movie, Tree of Life? I don't know. There is, is a there? movie. Yeah, I remember. It's like uh, what was that movie that I hate so much? That Tree of Life reminded me of it, so I refused to watch Tree of Life. Or when I saw a trailer, of like, I'm like, oh, it's going to be like the movie. It's the Hugh Jackman movie. I always, The Fountain. That movie oh, yeah. pissed me off, but no oh. fucking end. The Fountain is garbage. Garbage to your content, so. Yeah, because I, I I saw this and I thought, this is going to have an amazing story. This, okay. that's, a, look. And it didn't. It had a stupid story that was just a bunch of visual arts to trick you. Yeah. <laughs> to like say, look, it was pretty. I'm like, no, fuck you. It's a sucker punch problem. It's like, oh my god, this movie looks amazing, but the story fucking blows. I don't, I care nothing about any of these characters. Yes, I can't even tell what the fuck is going on. Just show me a shot of her dancing so I can see what the people are seeing. Stop fucking with me. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. Like when you start to like kind of conceptualize the art brain versus the writer brain, you can see it very clearly. Oh yeah. Um. And it's interesting because there's another brain too. There's the there's the concept brain. Oh the, yeah. Actually, I shouldn't say concept. There is the concept brain. There's also the set the set piece brain. Oh yeah. And that's oh, the problem. Yeah. That's the problem with the Game of Thrones writers is that even though they both have literally writing degrees from colleges, they have set piece brain. And what that means is that the way that they fixate the, the way that they focus their story is not on like plot. It's not on characters. Is that they have a big set piece that they want to see, and it's more art brain because it's like usually visual. They have a big set piece in their mind they want to see, and they're going to structure everything around it. And the set piece gets most of the energy in terms of like making it look good or work, so that everything that leads up to the set piece kind of gets less energy and so it becomes shittier. And that's what happened with Game of Thrones because the last season they're like, okay, we have a big set piece. What we want is we want a scene of this dragon burning up all of King's Landing, right? That's what they want. Even if it, whether it makes sense or not, they say, we want dragon burning up King's Landing. They put it on the bit, they put it on the writer's board. They slap it on the writer's board on the cork board. And they say, how do we get there? And they say, it doesn't matter how we get there. We just need to get there. No <laughs> okay? bullshit. It matters. And no, it, it does matter, right? It matters. But they right. And so they just kind of fucking um you know uh phone it in to get to that moment because in their mind they're like it's so cool it doesn't matter it's like well no you can have the coolest it destroys looking thing. her entire character exactly <laughs> like, exactly what the fuck? you can have the coolest looking thing in a movie or, or story or whatever and it doesn't matter if the context for it isn't set up properly of course it won't yeah. matter how cool something is you know what you know it's the same thing with like you know, they had in the same in the last season, you know, they have that that set piece, that visual set piece of like they wanted that sequence of, you know, the Dothraki riders with all the little fire weapons running out to meet the White Walkers and then all the lights being snuffed out one by one. Right. Because it's like has some sort of poetic symbolism. All the lights were snuffed out one by one, even though it doesn't make any fucking sense from a military's perspective. Why it's the fuck? Horrible. Would you ever do that? That's retarded. It's yeah. stupid. And then in the next episode, all the Dothraki are back because you're like, whoops, we couldn't kill all the Dothraki off. We needed them for the next couple episodes. Yeah. That pissed me off. When she lit up their swords, I was like, you dumb bitch. <laughs> like, why well, if the they would have established that, like, the fire swords did some extra damage to the ice on yes. or something yeah yes. but they didn't they didn't do anything like that like, like there's oh. a tr look that would have added some some tension you're like okay well i can be seen from a thousand miles away but but it does like 10 times the damage right like it only <laughs> takes one hit to the ice on that's another thing that always pisses me off in these shows and buffy is the worst offender of this they introduce some like one enemy and this mm. enemy is so difficult to like deal with. Um, and like, so in Buffy, there was like a super vampire and it was like, oh, such a hassle for Buffy to kill the super vampire. It took like two episodes. And then after that, it's like, oh, there's just like hundreds of super vampires and they're all just getting taken out. And you're like, what the fuck? This is bullshit. And it was the same thing with 
the zombies in Game of Thrones. Like when they first fight a zombie, it's like they cut its its hand off. The hand is still fucking trying to kill John after he cuts the hand off, right? Like this thing is such a problem to kill these zombies. It's such a hassle to kill them. Like you basically have to do the classic, you know, remove the head. And yet in the final fight, they're just like chopping these zombies up left and right. They're not all yeah. headshots. You know, they're not all cop- chopping people's heads off. Like those zombies should have been such a, there should have been so many shots of people cutting the zombies and then still just fucking getting their shit wrecked in. Cause that's what makes them horrible zombie threats to deal with. They don't care. But no, it's, it's, but this happens so much. It's like, oh, big threat is established and then they just get fucking mowed down. Like who cares? Like later they get thrown away like fodder afterwards. Just big sellouts. Yep. All of them need to get wrecked. True. Okay. Is it Let time me to focus? Read some super chats. What is this picture on screen? What am I looking at? You don't look. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't. It's like a it... a female sitch holding a nest of worms. What am I? <laughs> What's happening in this picture? Oh, I'll I'll bring up the reverse shot so you can see what she's looking at. I like the nest of worms interpretation, though. Well, I'm looking at like a tiny. I have to bring up the stream because I'm looking Look, at. Look, like I blew a tiny it up. Version of it. I tried to blow it up for you, so you could see that. It's like a. It is like is a it like hair, face, isn't it? What, what what is going? On? Well, no, it looks like a. It looks like a mannequin, like one of those like all black plastic mannequins, and it's holding like a wig or something. It's holding a severed head. Oh, okay. What is this? From? Well, actually, you know, it's not a severed head. So she peeled her face off and she's looking at her face. Oh, this is that movie Under the Skin that you like so yeah. much. Yeah. It's gross. This is what this is what is under the skin. It's this female sitch. This is horrifying. I hate this. This movie That's so awful. This movie it it came up in the chat because it does make the cardinal error of being too subtle. The yes. story, the the idea for the story is a, like super amazing. Aliens are they've basically come to Earth and they're eating humans as humans are like a delicacy. So this woman is like bait that the aliens use to capture men to basically turn them into Mm beefsteaks. But it's all so subtle that you'd never, like you'd never piece that together from the movie. I had to read about the source material to figure it out. Like the movie's way too subtle for you to ever get that. Wasn't that a problem? There was another movie like that I never saw. Um, Is it a Jake Gyllenhaal movie? It's like, it's like called Intruder. It's like he's just he starts to see like a doppelganger version of himself, and there's like a giant spider. The giant starts... spider at the end. Yes. Yes. What I the never fuck saw is that. happening in that movie? Because I was like, I saw a trail. I'm like, this looks really interesting. And then like it was like, oh, I was reading some synopsis. I'm like, what the fuck? What does it have to do with a giant spider? Like, what's happening? Yeah, that movie is pretty. That's one of those movies that. It's a five star movie up until the last five minutes of the movie, and then you're going, This is a fucking two star movie. What the fuck was that ending? <laughs> like, Public Enemy? Is that what CT said it was called? It was called Enemy. So you liked it up until the giant spider? Oh, I was hooked. I was totally hooked. I was like, This is a mystery. What the hell is going on here? I got to figure it out, right? It's one of those movies. Right. But then the end comes, and you're like, They don't even know what's going on. <laughs> yeah yeah it's all symbolic see that that triggers me to no end is like it does so look there's a little bit of adam there with yeah. you i mean you're like too subtle fucking get your shit together well well but that's i mean with the enemy it's different because it's i mean yeah with with under skin it's too subtle obviously but with the enemy it's like well that's from how you're describing it it's like oh I, I hate the movies that are like a mystery. And then, yeah, at the end, you realize they don't have an answer to the mystery. So they do some like artistic bullshit where it's like, oh, it's symbolic for something else. It's like, no, shut up. You well, can't I establish know. like a plot point and then say, well, the plot point is artistic. It's like, no, it's a plot point. There has to be an explanation plot wise as to what the fuck's happening. I, it could have been better and under the skin. And I understand why, like, they didn't need to come up in the very beginning. 
with, you know, the big alien shot and them, you know, the alien coming down. It's all very artistic and under the skin because they're telling it from the perspective of the alien bait. So you don't really know, is she an alien or is she some sort of robot? You don't really know. Mm -hmm. But, and it's in the story, she's kind of coming to the realization of what she is, which is part of an interesting part of the story. Right. Which is an interesting concept because yeah. like, oh, aliens are eating people. Like, okay. That was boring. Right. I've seen that a million times, but like, oh, they're baiting, they're baiting, you know, a woman, a hot men to basically look at a hot woman, but it's from the perspective of the bait, which is like this weird robot thing. Yeah, to under, like come to grips with what it's what right it now, is. Like nature. Yeah. yeah. So see, isn't that an amazing story? It, Fucking. Yeah, but see, my annoyance. I, I don't like these stories. Part of the reason I like Stephen King stuff, or his novels anyway, because a lot of his movies are awful. Mm -hmm. Is he always takes it to? The, he usually not always. The books I've read are Stephen King. He always goes to comp like to where the story should end. Like I don't like. Under the skin, I'm assuming it ends with that scene with her in the woods, right? With her peeling her skin off. Like, is that the ending of the movie? Yeah, it's, and it's like they, it's like a total emotional gut wrenching scene, but it needs more. Yeah, they cut no, but it it's too like, quick. Yeah, but, does she, but that's the end. The end is just the realization that she's what she is. The end is not like, well, does she stop the aliens? Does she keep working with the alien? Like, I want to know what the fuck, like, is there a resolution to the story? No, like, it bothers not. me. That's exactly yes. that. That always bothers me when there's no resolution. Bothers the, story. the shit out of me. Right. You never find why... out is she a robot? Is she one of the aliens? Like, you never find out. It's fucking lame. Because, like, a Stephen King novel would be she discovers that at the end of the second act. And then the third act is. Of course. You know, her destroying Getting the aliens even. or helping or something. the humans. Right. Yeah. Right. Or, yeah, something happens, you know, something to, to conclude it, some resolution. And I think that's kind of like, that's like the weird artistic, that's the art brain right there is the of thing that there's no, yeah. there doesn't need to be a resolution to the plot because the plot isn't important. What's important is the emotions that you feel along the way. And to me, I'll be sexist for a second. That's like the, that's like the female brain. Right there, okay. <laughs> the male brain is like, no, give me a story with a fucking resolution and an ending. Okay. Yeah. We need a beginning, middle and end. Yes. This movie has no end. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. A movie with no ending, I mean, it really doesn't even deserve two stars. I'm only giving it two stars because I'm being generous because the artistic right. the artistic merit is just off the charts in this movie. Yeah, but Steve, no, Stephen King's It ends with them. They destroy the It. They destroy it twice. I mean, that's how it ends. It's resolved. They kill the monster. It is completely resolved. So usually Stephen King stuff... At least that I've read, I haven't read everything. But the ones I've read, they all resolve. There's either, I mean, not they don't always have happy endings, but they all end. There's a, a clear resolution of the story. Mm. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I see. It's funny because I remember reading The Lady and the Tiger in middle school, and it didn't bother me because it's like, I felt like the point of this story was literally to to have the choose your own ending. That's like that's literally the point of the story. I'm like, okay, I get it. It's fine. It's a short story. I didn't invest that much time in it. <laughs> okay. It's like it took like five minutes to read in class. If you sit down for a two hour movie, or God forbid, you watch a show for multiple years. Oh, it, that's the worst. <laughs> that is the worst. The, the worst offender of this of all time is Battlestar Galactica. That is the most like the entire, and it's so frustrating. And I'm glad I didn't watch it while I was live. I watched it like, you know, back to back to back to back, like years later. Like, Battlestar Galactica is basically fueled by mysteries of like, what's going on? What is the mist? Like, what is the answer to the mystery in the next episode? It's all fueled by mysteries. And then you get to the end and you realize they never had any of the answers. It was all. You know, this is pre JJ Abrams, but it was all pre JJ Abrams mystery box bullshit writing. And so at the end, when they try to tie it up, they they can't, and they come up with the dumbest, literally the dumbest explanation I've ever seen in any TV show in all of human history, which is literally just God did it. Oh wow! <laughs> I've never I've never seen a literal 
deus ex machina in a in a tv show or movie before where the end is just well god did it that's why like there's a demoralizing (laughs) there's a what basilar galacta the first season has one of my favorite things i've ever seen you know the trope in tv shows where a character in the tv show or a movie sees somebody right Mm -hmm. they see like a person that no one else sees and then when that person is talking to them or interacting with them, people never notice that. Like maybe they just stare at nothing for a second or they just, people just don't even react that they're like talking or interacting with like a person that's not there. Right. You, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, gets in a lot of movies. So it's, uh, what's a true romance. It's Elvis it's in, yeah. in the bathroom. Right. Um, so it's in Mr. Brooks, even though I like Mr. Brooks, does the same thing where he's kind of seeing his serial killer half. Um, it's my my helper. Right. Secret helper that nobody knows. In Battlestar Galactica, the plot, the beginning of the plot is that there's a guy named Gaius Balter, I think is his name. And he basically, uh, I forget his position. He has some government position. And he basically gets seduced by this hot blonde woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out, that the hot blonde woman is actually a robot from a race of robots that humans created many, many years ago called Cylons, who they thought, the humans thought they destroyed them in a war, but they didn't. And the, the robots came back to destroy all the humans. And so they created a hot blonde robot to basically seduce this guy who had the codes to like earth shields. And so she, in the first episode, you he accidentally like destroys the entire earth to fuck this robot because like he accidentally gives up the codes for the earth shields and the, the episode ends with the robots destroying humanity because this guy like got seduced by this robot. Well, how hot was she? She's pretty hot. <laughs> you could look her up. Um, and so the, so the series is interesting. Did she have char- goofy bangs? She does not have goofy bangs. Oh, good. Um, so she's hot. I don't think she was the hottest robot in the show, but she's hot. Okay. So, but this character is very interesting. Bias, this, this guy is bias, whatever his name is. Guy is Baltar, bias Galtar. He's a very interesting show. I mean, a very interesting character because obviously, like the rest of the series is him racked with this insane guilt because he's responsible for like Earth being destroyed. And he's also kind of like a con man. So, so much of the show is him trying to come up with ways to like, prevent people from realizing all of his lies and realizing that he's responsible for all this stuff. Wow. And so he's just coming up with all these cons, but he's really like smart. So you kind of like, and he's likable in a weird way. So you kind of appreciate him doing this. You really like his character, but there's a very interesting thing that happens is that he starts to hallucinate the blonde robot character. Oh, so that's his character that talks to him, helps him out. Right. And so at first you're watching this and you just assume, well, obviously he's so racked with guilt. He's hallucinating and seeing this blonde robot character, right? Uh Because he just, you know, that's, it's it's his guilt that's manifesting this. And they do this thing where whenever he interacts with her, everyone sees him just talking to no one. Like it's super apparent. And everyone's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, so they completely reverse that trope where everyone notices him interacting with no one. But mm-hmm. then it gets even crazier because then it's like, I think it's like the end of season one or even season two, the blonde robot hallucination gives him information that he actually doesn't know and needs to solve a problem. And you go, oh, holy that's shit. Ridiculous. It's not a hallucination. It's real. So then you're like, holy, and then he realizes because he thought it was a hallucination the whole time too. He's like, wait a minute, what the fuck? You're not a hallucination. So it becomes this major plot point of like, what the fuck is this thing? This whole time you thought it was just like this literary device, this hallucination. It's not, it's a fucking real thing. And so like this mystery is like driving the show for so long. And then you know what the fucking answer is? You know what the thing is at the end of the show? It better be fucking good or I'm going to be pissed. It's an literal angel sent by god oh my god you get the fuck out of here delete movie delete movie go to the internet angel i'm making videos fuck this movie fuck you i was like what the are you shitting me it's a literal angel sent by God because God has some grand fucking plan that humans have to accomplish. You can't have angels and robots in the same fucking movie. 
<laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah, and it's like the the whole pl- it's so dumb because everything literally everything is just well, God manifested all these events to happen in this very specific way oh, because please, God get, has a oh, grand man. plan to make humans do X Y Z. I and you're like, this. what? That's the lamest fucking shit I've ever seen in my life. All right, be right back. Okay. So yeah, it's just like I was like, come on, you can't do that. You can't do that. If that show, if the social media was big when that show was on, I think it would have been savaged, savaged. Anyway. Okay. Let's see. Where was I in the super chats? We talked about Batman. Oh no, we didn't talk about Batman. We did talk about Batman, but I didn't read the super chat Batman. Uh the elephant and the rider for five months. Thanks so much. Says, oh look, he brought the picture of the hot Cylon. Uh I think the title has a typo. Happy three hundredth, though. Does it maybe? Um, and maybe changed it, but so you talk about monster monster museum? Monster what is monster museme? What is that? All right, I'm back. Okay. I saw you brought up the the hot robot. I did, but I it's so weird. They couldn't give her some pants that fit. Like she's not hiding a 12 inch dong in there. Well, so <laughs> I don't know why you brought up that picture. The, the the picture people usually bring up is her in the red dress. Oh, okay. Well, so she's hot. She, she was in something else. I'm like, it's the silent lady. And I don't remember what it was, but the silent robot lady. God, yeah. I'm so glad that I didn't invest any time in this garbage tv show it was so oh my god and i'm but see, look i'm i like robots so i could have easily got snookered that's what's that's what's triggering to me is that it, it suckered me in with something good and then it became bad it was just like dexter like if it just started bad i'd just be like okay it's just bad but if it starts good and then it becomes bad you're like oh this is why i this is why i don't commit to tv shows i commit to movies I sent it's you like, a, a picture so you can really make oh, sure look. she has no dong, okay? I've got the red dress. Oh, okay. I'll bring <laughs> up whatever you're... Look. That's kind of shocking that that was like a like a real production picture. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if I can bring this up. That was a, That was like a real production picture that was like on marketing material. I'll bring it up for a second here. Just for the audacity. What do you want? What's up? What are you doing? Well, you I mean, just want some love. Okay. What's up, you boo boo boo? <laughs> Such knows the voice. It's a baby voice for cats and of small course. children. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look. Yeah, no, she's... She's safe. <laughs> uh-huh. That sounds so transphobic, Sitch. How could you say such a thing? Why did you send me this picture? Uh, I didn't say anything. You said. Oh, I said that? Oh, you're right. I did. You Damn said it. that. Yeah. You said that. Anyways. Um, Anyways. Where were we? Wormy is being very. I mean, he's desperate for attention here. What's your first thought? For five Canadian says, whenever I think of Batman, I think of the animated series from the 90s and Batman Mask of the Phantasm is the best Batman movie. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, 90s and, and 2000s Batman, Batman cartoon, like the Batman the animated series into the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited were great. Very good depictions of Batman. And then Batman Beyond, very good depictions of Batman. And Batman Mask of the Joker, of course. Uh, Jimmy the Centrist for $2. Thank you so much. Says, absolutely most based My Hero Academia Invincible take. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That was my take. How do you know it was yours? You didn't have, you've never read or watched My Hero Academia. So. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
But I'm sure if I did watch it, I would have a base take too, obviously. So. I don't know who it was. Someone, when I was talking about this on a while ago in chat, it was very astute. They said, you know, Sitch wants characters to be aspirational instead of like realistic depictions of children. And I said, yes, because my hero academia is aspirational. All the characters are very aspirational and invincible. They're all very realistic and obnoxious. <laughs> and I was like, you nailed it. That's exactly it. Yeah. It's got to be fun. Real life is kind of boring. Real life, yeah. Real life isn't always fun. A man's for four months of discipline equals freedom. Thank you. It says, happy 300th awesome Sunday. Intersectionality means Superboy isn't bi. He's gay. <laughs> He'll never date a girl after kissing a boy. Biggest crime paying for superhero comics about gay high school drama. There you go. There you go. Nice. Uh, Caleb Sinek, thanks so much, Caleb, for the five gifted memberships. Uh, Magor for nine months. Thank you. Says, congrats on 300 shows. Oh, I already wrote that one. Miss um, Sparkles got his for. Twitter for... back. Mm -hmm. What? Ethan got his Twitter back. I, I know. Look, I, I can't believe you lost it. I didn't know you could lose your Twitter these days. So, what? People still have lost it and not got it back. Uh, Miss Sparkles right. for five months. Thank you. Says, if Sitch gets a girlfriend, <laughs> if Sitch gets a girlfriend, would it still be weird for Sammy G to make me a body pillow of Sitch? <laughs> I'm saving up to pay her for it. Just kidding. You gentlemen are great. Well, thank you, Miss Sparkles. And no, it wouldn't be weird. I don't think it'd be weird. What the heck? <laughs> I'd be very honored if you had a body pillow of Sitch. You'd be honored? Of course. Okay. I mean, you're my work wife, but... Okay, there you go. It's, it's strange, but sure. I guess I'll take it. Uh, Joe the Mig for $2 says, Sock it to me, baby. There you go. Oh, yeah. Sock hey, it to me. Very funny. I live in Dead's Wall specifically for six months of discipline equals freedom. Thank you so much. Says, coupon. Yeah. Oh, you want to finish our conversation about treasuries? Coupon? No, I really no. don't. Yeah, me neither. Uh, Liam S. for 16 months says, regarding MMT, I feel Sitch is humble and feels there's missing step MMT people are hiding, but Adam doesn't know about a missing step, so is confident. Wow. What's that? Where's that? Let's read that again. Liam says, regarding MMT, I, f I feel Sitch is humble and feels there's a missing step MMT people are hiding, but Adam doesn't know about a missing step, so he's confident. I mean, I know all the steps. Yeah, I don't. That's not what I don't think that's what's going on. I think it's that there are parts of a lot of economic stuff I don't understand that you understand. Um, but I'm so I'm missing steps. But I, I'm I'm assuming it sounds like you understand it. Well, I mean, I'm stripping steps out, obviously, because right. just to that simplify it. Sure. Look, you you realize they send the social security checks out and that's like government spending, right? I understand that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it doesn't matter anyway, because even if you or I explained it step by step as clear as possible, the majority of people, people still would understand. still not like it. Yeah, exactly. Or like it or understand it, because it's just this stuff is very dry and boring and complicated, and you know, it it bought it. It really bothers me. I listen to these Austrians every once in a while, and they always they love the term the printer go burr. They love saying that printer go burr, printer go burr. And then you know, obviously, when government spends money, then the prices they go up because of the money. Mm -hmm. They never, ever, ever listen closely to hear any of them talk about the pr production side of the equation. Like, what happens when some new device doubles production? They never talk about it. Never, ever, 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 ever. Mm -hmm. It's so one-sided. It's, like, insane. You could, be an, you could listen to Austrians and be an Austrian and go your entire life and never hear about the production side of the equation. It's all about the money side of the equation. Well, you know what I think about that? Let's hear it. Elm for nine months says, listen, Adam, this is important. All that stuff you tell about the money cycle, where it comes from, where it goes, et cetera. Where can I read about it? 
Ugh, that's such a tough one. <laughs> I know. You got to tell me if you're if you're a conservative or a progressive or left or right or which. Read the first half of Stephanie Kelton's book, but stop. <laughs> Don't go too far. Uh huh. The okay. deficit myth is Stephanie Kelton's book, but this is a problem with the MMT people because they do have a better lens on the monetary system, but then they want to... Well, I understand the argument that they're making. They, they're basically saying that when we keep unemployment at 5%, we're basically paying a lot of people to do nothing. And every day that someone is getting paid unemployment and staying home and doing nothing, that's a, like a free lunch uneaten because that person could be building a bridge or building cars or building robots or whatever, right? Producing something, baking bread, who knows? So they're, they're saying, look, we should run the economy hot. We should keep, we should get as close to 0% unemployment as possible. And I mean, you understand that argument, Sitch, right? It's pretty easy. It's pretty basic. Right. My understanding, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is that was one of the big policies uh, that changed from the 50s, 60s, 70s with Reagan was the shift away from government trying to maximize full employment to government trying to limit inflation. Right. And exactly the, right. The idea was the government's going to limit inflation. And this is kind of the dirty secret that most people don't realize the government is going to limit inflation by keeping unemployment at like what? Five percent. Yeah. yeah. It's going to keep unemployment. It's going to have economic policies to try to keep 5% of the people in the country unemployed. So they and, won't have money to drive up inflation. <laughs> right. And so, but the secondary effect is that is like, well, you understand that that's going to stagnate wages. And lo and behold, what do we see? Stagnating wages. Right? But that's part of it because higher wages is part inflation. of what leads to un inflation. Right. But, yeah. but the problem is we still have inflation. Even before right. COVID, you know, the prices from 1980s to pre-COVID were still going up, but it seemed like wages weren't really going up at equivalent rates to right. that. So obviously that strategy hasn't worked as effectively as they hoped for the last, you know, 40 years, 30 years. Right. So, but it, that does appeal to my sense of wanting efficiency right five percent of the population unemployed is just i mean that's a lot of shit we could be producing that's not getting produced mm -hmm. so uh the alaskan night for ten dollars says public humiliation is far worse for kids and teens and physical punishment nobody wants their mom to show up to school in their bathrobe maybe oh yeah maybe yeah that's a nightmare scenario Um, Sodoge for $20. Thank you, Sodoge. Says, one of these days we'll get Adam into playing a FromSoft game to get his take on their storytelling methods. Also, here's a new laugh. Conservatives are now mad that the army made an ad that features white guys, LOL. No winning. Really? I haven't seen this ad that you're talking about. What is the, uh, what is the complaint? White guys aren't allowed in the military now? Are they like too soy or something? I don't know if Adam would like from soft game storytelling. It's very similar to the storytelling of um, of uh, Hollow Knight. I've never played from from soft game. Oh, that's my dirty secret. I've never played a, a Souls game. I played Armor Core. I never played a Souls game. Uh, but in Hollow Knight, my understanding is the same thing. Where a lot of the like to figure out what is going on, it kind of like drops you in media res in like a very gigantic, complicated world. And so all this like black background information and like people saying things, you kind of have to like very slowly, methodically, like hyper pay attention to all this shit to like figure out what the fuck the plot of the story is. Like it's not, nothing is very explicitly explained to you. Sounds horrible. Which I'm not a fan of, but I think, I think that form of storytelling works much better in a video game where you're spending like tens of hours playing a game versus like a book or a movie. 
where the primary tool of the book or movie is to tell you a story where in a video game it's like the you know you're playing a game and then there's a story element to the game right so i think it's a little bit different <laughs> oh my god what Oh my God, for two dollars says, can you shake it up and invite a black Hebrew Israelite? <laughs> I would yeah, love to talk to a black yeah. Hebrew Israelite. I don't know any uh, people offhand, but that'd be an interesting stream. Of course we would. Did you see there was a, a person, I don't know, I, I think they were like Lebanese or something, who drove their car into what they thought was a Jewish school? And it um, turned out to be a Chinese restaurant? No. That's very offensive. No. They they were like, oh, I was so sick of seeing like all the damage going on in Gaza that I just had to drive my car into a Jewish school, which is like psychotic. Fucking and it turned ridiculous. out it wasn't a Jewish school. It was like a black Hebrew Israelite building. <laughs> no way. Yes. No way. No one was harmed, but like <laughs> no an idiot. Way. That's hilarious. Oh, that is hilarious. Yeah. She didn't even realize the difference. So uh, uh, uh. Solidoge for two dollars says it's not for you. Yeah, it's funny when he's when he even said that. I could think of anything but that. That's what a bunch of people were saying that. Obviously, not for you. Uh, Armor God for two dollars says here's one. Ethan Van Scriver is cringe as fuck. Wow, our my God does not like Ethan. Harsh. Yeah, what's up with that? Harsh. Uh, let's see. Ostracy for twenty dollars says catching up on the show. Got to my last super chat. I think you guys view me as a lot more right wing than I actually am. <laughs> uh, however, I claim the title Sitch and Adam's most vocal right wing detractor, and you can't take it back. Well, there you go. Listen, you can't have both. Ostracy, okay, you can't have both. Now you're our most left wing vocal detractor. That's true. You just you took the test. You're the now you're actually the our most vocal, pretending to be right wing, but is secretly left wing detractor. Right. There you go. Uh, do black Hebrew Israelites identify as Jewish? Uh, they do, I guess, but they call Jewish people like pretenders. So, you know, does that count? <laughs> I mean, if you're mad about anything going on in Israel, you know, they don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> oh, Soto sent me the ad. Uh, the army has abandoned woke advertising. Looks like they're going to war and looking for a white boy cannon fodder. Huh. Okay, well, can we watch this or will we get in trouble? We still haven't watched the Mahler compilation. Oh, yeah. Which, I, sent which, I, you. which I actually did upload. Oh, okay. And we can watch on YouTube now. Okay, so the ad is, I'll just describe it to you. So it's an army ad that's like a classic army ad. Oh, you nice. You have a bunch of guys. Doing army um, things, running around. Yeah, you have a bunch of guys wearing helmets and parachute things. Shooting and guns and killing well, no, people. They're, they're a bunch of people like jumping out of an airplane, you know. Jumping out of an airplane, to mowing like people down. To like meaningful music, you know. Oh, okay. And they're like, but they're, they're not, they're like learning to parachute. And then at the end, mm -hmm. it's actually a pretty smart ad. At the end, you see them all laughing and talking. That's like brotherhood. Right. You know, it's all like, you know, do you want to find meaning in your life? You know, join the army. Right. And so a bunch of people who are on the right are complaining about this. Right. Which seems insane, doesn't it? Why? Because there's like a, a trans woman in there? No, because they're like, oh, the military is bad now. Oh, they just want to have white people and be can of fodder. Yeah. Hmm. That's sort of seeming to be the takes, which is pretty wild to me. But well, there you go. Interesting. Okay. You're right. Soto's, you're right. You, you've reached like the woke paradigm of you can't win. If you're diverse, it's bad. If you're not diverse, a bunch of white people in the ad, it's also bad. You still have the creepy EP for ten dollars says the you guys thing going on here. <laughs> Get rid of that. Out of the what? Get rid of the under the skin stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's creepy. It's, Get that out of here. Go. Yeah. I mean Scar 
Scarlett Johansson is still kind of hot. Even when she's just like a black mannequin? Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. kind of digging the black mannequin look. There you go, guys. We found Adam's like weird fetish you didn't know about. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Uh, no. I mean, it's like one of those things where you see like, oh, she's still got her like hot proportionally face, but no. Oh, you're not into it? No, I'm not into it, no. Can I spoil some of the movie for you? Sure. Never going to watch this movie. You never... Look, you should watch it. So w when she's trying to figure out who she is, she's like, I'm going to take one of these guys and I'm not going to deliver him to the meat grinder. I'm going to take him to a seedy hotel, let him have yeah. sex with me. Yeah. But she's got like no vagina. <laughs> she's just like a... Like, she's got the... The Barbie doll. Is there, oh, is there no? There's no opening down there. Yeah. So what so happens? She's like, so she can't like can't have sex. She's like, oh, this is like weird. What's going? Was on? the guy like, what the fuck? Yeah, of course. He's like freaking out. And what is? What? How does that scene conclude? He's like, you have no vagina. What's happening? It does. I. It's been a while since I've seen it. I mean, it kind of just ends. Okay. There's no. That's an interesting scene. Like she basically it basically cuts like she's gotten rid of the guy. I you don't know if look. I, see, I haven't seen it in forever. Maybe she drops the, him off at the see, meat factory. This is no, but see, this is the difference. This is this okay. This is how the Stephen King story would go. You have the story mm -hmm. progress to this point. Okay, there's like this weird. All of a sudden, you start Stephen King starts focusing on this random schlub, and you're like, what? And it's like this guy's backstory for like a chapter. Like, who is this guy? And that's the guy that she decides yes. to not deliver to the yes. meat grinder. And, that would be much better. Right. Yeah. And then and then he becomes a main character with her because then he's like, what the fuck's going on here? And then the two of them like figure become the out. protagonist to try to figure out like what yep. the hell's going on with her. Dual protagonist at the right. midpoint. Yep. That would be perfect. Yeah. And then they defeat the aliens and save the day. Yeah. And she gets a, a vagina. In the end, it just it ends like Barbie. She goes in and says, "I want a vagina," or you know, she just learns to use her mouth. You know? Oh yeah, she's got a mouth, right? She does, Zero yeah. fucks says she still has feet, though, right? <laughs> there you go. That's the what so, people are easily. Uh... <laughs> that's what's so disappointing about the movie because the movie is so well executed. Like they really know the dramatic stuff well mm -hmm. so it just it could have been amazing sure. I just it's painful when a movie is hitting on all eight then cylinders it just, <laughs> then it just hits a wall and it never completes yeah yeah no i i got you that's why i refuse to watch um the happening not the happening that's the fucking shit that's that shitty m night the uh you know the rapture movie or a TV show. I refuse to watch it because I knew they would never answer the question. And I'm just like, no, fuck you. I'm not yeah. going to watch anything that refuses to answer the question of where they were raptured or not. Yep. It's not about that shit. It's about the cat. Shut up. Shut up. You don't get it's the It's about fucking... the journey. It's you don't get not the... about the resolution. <laughs> yeah, you don't get to cock tease me with a mystery and then tell me it's not about the fucking mystery. That's the whole setup of your show, you piece of shit, okay? You better oh, fucking would... answer the question. I want to know. Look, there was... Lef I... The leftovers, thank you. Yeah, leftovers. Being in these various writers groups in Los Angeles, I've experienced so, ma so much terrible writing. Just, yes. oh... <laughs> A lifetime of terrible yeah. writing, yeah. But they're all there's always excuses. Oh, it's isn't it better? It's open ended. Look, the audience no. can decide. No, You're shut like, up. you just want to just want to grab them and start choking them. No, you're the fucking writer. No, no. I don't want to write your movie for you, piece of shit. Right. Especially if you look, a lot of writers they can't hook you at all. Like they have no idea what they're doing. I'm like, oh, what? This is you at a coffee shop with your girlfriend. What the fuck? I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a good resolution to mystery? I'm sh I mean, of I'm course, sure there has. yeah. Of course. What are you talking about? Lots of good resolutions to mysteries. Mm -hmm. 
Can't think of any on top of my head. Fight Club <laughs> is sure. like a pretty good. Is Fight Club a mystery though? It's not really a mystery. It's a twist because you don't know it's a mystery. Oh, I guess you're right. It's kind of not. It yeah. is. Hmm. We'll have to think on that one. Leftovers, if it was good, you eventually find out what happened. Really? I thought you never find out what happened in Leftovers. Maybe I've been lied to. Mm -hmm. How about but... Dark City? Dark City is City's great. There you go. That's a yeah. that's a perfect. Dark City is one of my favorite science fiction movies. A fucking weird ass Wait. mystery. Yes. And it has a completely fulfilling. Uh, when he fly, when he flies off into space, you're like, "What the fuck?" Well, don't that ain't it. Shell Beach. People, people should watch uh, Dark City. Dark City is very interesting. Oh. It, it's kind of dated, and honestly, it's a little, little held back by the fact that the protagonist, the actor for the protagonist, sucks. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the actor is, but he's not a good actor. Um, which is huh. weird because all the other acting in the movie is great. And yeah. it's even got uh, Jack Bauer in it. Though he's playing. Oh, yeah. It's funny because he became like the big action guy. This was when he was like the not the big action guy. So he's playing this like uh, Nerd. hunchback, nerdy scientist who's like very physically weak. Uh, but no, Dark City is a great movie. Highly recommend it. Yes. Alex Poydras, right? The same guy who did The Crow, and it's got that very... It has that aesthetic quality to it, yeah. Of course, yeah. What's right. what's that called? Goth. The got goth. like a dark gothic uh, feeling to everything, yeah. The Matrix has an amazing mystery that is answered True. successfully. But see, these things, yes. like the mystery of the story is what the story is about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of these movies that have a mystery, but then the, the story is not about the mystery. The mystery is just like the setting for some other story. The intro, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're talking about something that's like a mystery at the end, that's like resolved at the end of well, the Well, no, story. I'm saying I don't like when they do that, when they're like, they just use a mystery to sucker you into something, and then it becomes clear that they either didn't know the answer, or there is no answer and they don't care. Yeah. That's the problem. So, okay. Um, CT for two Canadian says, "Thank you, Ethan. I'm making something, and I need that." <laughs> there you go. The clip it collage. Oh my God! For two dollars says, "Watch Tree of Life again." Clearly went over your head. Well, there you go. Adam. I've never seen it, so watch it again. Adam. I never saw it. Oh, I haven't seen, I haven't okay. seen well, that. Never movie. mind. Neither of us saw it. I saw the fountain. I hate the fountain. There's a mystery in that. How it ever got made. That's a mystery. <laughs> That's the mystery. <laughs> the fountain's and there's nothing to go over your head in the fountain because it's so insanely obvious what the movie's about. I've never oh, seen a movie so pretentious and so obvious. It's like pathetically lame. But mm -hmm. uh Bullseye for Bullseye89 for $5 says, in the art versus story perspective, thoughts on the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. So thank you. This is your first ever Super Chat. I actually saw this movie in theaters. I don't know if right. you saw that movie. I have seen it. Yeah, of course. That's it's the one where they have three different actors. Terry the Gilliam. Right? I love yeah. Terry Gilliam. Yes. The Time Band. It's one of my favorite movies. That's right. That's right. So is Brazil. I hate which Brazil. It has an amazing ending, but you don't like that's it. That's the worst end. That's one of the worst endings of all time. Brazil is after September 11th. You're like, wow, Brazil just clicks now. Because you remember what? terrorism? Look, it's a big theme in the movie that there are terrorist attacks all the time and they're yeah, but trying the to catch the terrorists. The terrorists are the good guys in Brazil. Are they? What do you mean? Of course they are. What are you talking about? The government I mean, is the bad guys and the terrorists are the good guys. It's super ambiguous. It feels no, like No, it is not. What are you fucking talking about? It feels like the terrorists are bad guys and good. The it feels like there are no good guys in Brazil. Um What 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 do the terrorists do that's ever any good aside from fixing his plumbing? Why well, don't I'll be honest, I don't remember. Yeah. So, I remember Robert De Niro is the terrorist and he's he's good. Yeah, but he he's fixes his plumbing just because he wants to get information from me. He doesn't do it at the, out of the goodness. He's does not he get information fixing. from him? I don't remember. I feel like he he does, yeah. I don't remember. It's been a while. But... Hmm. I like, anyway. but yeah, Barry Munchausen, I like a lot from Terry Gillum. 
Yeah. Um, Imaginarium. So I've only seen the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus once in theaters. That's the one that there's like four people that play the main character. I think it's because Heath Ledger. Because was Heath Ledger died. Yeah. The main character. And then he died. Yeah. Um, Because this is right after. Yeah. And so they basically got a bunch of other people to switch out the roles. I, I don't remember what it's about at all. I don't remember the plot at all, but I remember not liking it. That's all I remember. I was like, mm, I don't like this movie. This movie's not that good. How about Source Code? Is that a good mystery? Source Code. I think I've seen that. I confuse Source Code. Is that the movie where he's on the train? Yep. That's a good movie. I like that Source is a good movie. Code. I always confuse that with the Ben Affleck movie. Um, where he like sees it, like they like see time. Geely? By... No. <laughs> no, not Geely. I've Is never it seen. Ben I've never seen Geely, but I just know that it was like the worst Ben Affleck movie ever. There's, oh no, there's like two. Maybe there's like two different movies. There's one that's like Ben Affleck. It's like called like Paycheck or something, where he's like has all these items. Oh from yeah, the future that like he's supposed to. Be, it's like a it mystery. is kind of like Paycheck. Paycheck is the budget source code. No, but then there's another movie that's the wait. Is source code the one where they like look? around the earth to like see into the past or is that paycheck uh that must be paycheck source code is just revolves around a train oh and people a, die right a terrorist attack yeah source co- okay there's, there's source code there's paycheck and there's like a third movie that's like also weird like the same fucking plot almost and i kind of they all in my mind are like the same movie so maybe I, i'm thinking that one's of, with denzel washington right it takes place in new orleans Yes, what? there's a one with Denzel Washington. That That's one's one really good, yeah. What is that movie called? I actually... Um... Yes. I'm going to look it up. What is it? He's in another one of these people trying to look back in time fucking movies to like solve a problem. Um... Denzel Washington movies. Time travel. <laughs> is it out of time? It's out of time, I think. Deja vu. Got it. No, wait, it's not out of time. It's deja Got vu. it. You're right. You're correct. It was deja, deja vu. vu. Deja vu. It's deja vu all over again. It is. That movie and then is there was, sick. Yeah, that movie. Then there was really the Nicolas good. Cage movie. Uh, Next. Do you remember that one? That was I never movie. saw that. It was okay. It's like he he can see the future, but he can only see like two minutes into the future. <laughs> well, I'm... I mean, I can see two minutes into the future. Well, no, who, so like, can't? like, there's a funny scene. Um, so like, he's in a diner, and there's an attractive waitress, mm-hmm. and he's trying to figure out how to pick her up. And so, like, since he can see two minutes in the future, he's doing like the million different things that he could do to try to pick her up, and they're all just failing. And so you see like every version of him failing to pick up the waitress till he finally figures out the, like the one correct way to do it. It's funny. It's a good. Movie. Yeah, I'll check it out. Sounds awesome. I knew you'd like that. Okay. Uh, Minority stuck. Report. That has a good payoff, right? Is my yeah, Minority Report's a good payoff, and it's that's a mystery movie, right? Yeah. There you go. Uh, d- stock for five dollars says for ten dollars says. Did you ever want to? End your streams on a high note, but you can't figure out what to watch. Do you like seeing yourself in a video game? Well, then the IJP Mexican is the solution for you. Just watch 10 minutes of his Morrowind video and you'll feel refreshed and ready for bed. There you go. Nice. Maybe we will. We still never watch that. Because we're bad oh, people. Yeah. Well, uh, too- I mean, we did bitch about it being too long. So it was. We That's aren't true. terrible people. That's true. We're only sort of bad people. Uh, I mean, we could jump to like the last minute of it. Is that would you would you even like that IJP Mexican or would it be like <laughs> the context would be so lost that you know we'd be like what's happening here? I I did bring up the Mauler and Rags. Oh, Okay. Ready? Let me jump back in the watch together because I closed the tab. What? How could you do such a thing? Okay, hit it. First time PP for ten dollars says you guys need to have a word with Mueller and Rag. I love both your cat cats so much, but they keep happening at the same time. I know fucking Mueller always doing his efabs on Sunday. What an asshole! Yes, uh, <laughs> just kidding. 
You should get some <laughs> Sue Sitch and get as all his money. Do it. We have literally Adam, hours of evidence. <laughs> pe the people that sexually harass you, they do it out of love. Okay, it's not, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> we have literally hours of evidence. Hours. No. You have hours of people loving you. And I'm Look, I'm not getting sexually harassed anymore, Sitch. Have I lost my touch? You've lost your touch? <laughs> It's, well, actually, see, you're only it's getting, actually a good thing. I mean, you were getting I, sexually harassed by men. I know. I didn't like it, so yeah, I'm glad. I liked it. It was hilarious. I'm actually glad it's come to an end. So, <laughs> yeah, our fans appreciating you. Okay. Okay. If like that's that, how you want to. If that's how you want to conceptualize it, it's a little different Jeez. when it's aimed at you. Okay. <laughs> what do you look at? Look at how different your backdrop looks. Look at this. I know. You all. You have all this empty space. You have this big empty space right there. Now there's things there. I know I brought stuff in. Yeah, look at that. Well, the bookshelf is still there. That's true. And well, it's the different. Painting is it's still a, there, but the bookshelf you have now is bigger. Yeah. And it says Adam. There's the white cabinet that I moved and you over. Have a you have a booby doll in the background. Is that not in the original one? I guess I not. don't think so. What do you mean? I get tons of sexual harass. I mean, tons of pleasant praise from our fans. Okay. Sure, sure. Are we live yet? Sensual say, say the intro. Hey now! Wow. It's your boy, PSA sits here to the Sunday, Sunday live stream with everyone's favorite sexual harassy target, <laughs> Adam. That's sexy. a shockingly um, well responsive live button. That's right. That's right. Hell yeah. And joining us today. Everyone's favorite Mauler and Rags, highly requested, especially Rags. Mauler, not so yes, requested. Yeah, Rags. Yeah, Mauler, fuck you. <laughs> oh, man. Don't worry, guys. I brought him along with me. Who sent us this? This needs some editing. Playing Centrist. Oh, okay. Are you going to play? I guess. I mean, <laughs> nice. I said he could come. I'm gonna. Yay. We're gonna go to. You gotta go, go get ice cream later Yay. on. Ooh. But sure. I, I don't yeah. know where Bosch lives, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and you know, situation. movies are getting pretty bad. So that's true. Yeah. Movies yeah. are. Yeah. What's look at this? What's going on in this scene? It's a. It's the next time I guess they came out. Yeah, but I see three avatars. You what see are those three are? avatars. There you go. What are those three avatars? I don't know. Should keep watching and not not discuss it. Oh, this is. <laughs> oh, this is why Mauler's mad at me right here. Look at this, Mauler, interstellar, interstellar fan. fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious! Oh my god, that's so funny. I guess he did tell me he didn't like interstellar. He did. He did. Yeah. Oh man. I feel kind of bad about that now. <laughs> uh, okay. That's true. Movies are terrible. Fuck. Like, Moeller, I don't even know your politics, and also I don't give a shit. Aww. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, but, yeah, wait. Moeller is a Holocaust denier. <laughs> I mean, what? come on. What are you talking about? You can't just say that. Look, just because he's we, wearing a gas mask out. Okay. <laughs> I know. Look, he literally works in the gas chamber. Oh, my God. No, look, I'm kidding, obviously. Mahler, Mahler is not a Holocaust denier that we know of. I mean, that's why you <laughs> never say. That's why you never say if you don't know somebody's someone's politics. You don't go, I don't know your politics, but I don't care. Because, I mean, well, at some point you're going to care, right? Okay, let me ask you a question, Adam. Let's say you find... The best Mexican restaurant you've ever eaten here. What's your favorite Mexican dish? I like El Pastor Burrito. What is that? I'll pa it's barbecue pork burrito. Oh, okay. So you find the best barbecue Mexican restaurant ever, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's called El Hogley Wogley. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they have the best... Amazing, like you're literally like just make it hoggly woggly. Look, right? No, hoggly no, woggly makes no, you orgasm stop. every time. No, and they and you get the best barbecue burrito ever. Okay, just, even this is like your life has new meaning. Like the Why'd days you have are to brighter. bring up hoggly woggly, man, to annoy you. Look, I'm ready to go. Let's moment, go. Yeah. Okay, um, 
it's that part of the stream. And so you, you just love going to this restaurant. You love eating it. Mm -hmm. and, and then I find out. Then one day, the owner of the restaurant, he's like, listen, Adam, you always come in here all the time. So I, I, I feel like we should get to know each other. in you. Right. And he sits down and he's like, oh, I do this stream where I talk about like politics and stuff. And he's like, oh, really? I really like politics. And as you're talking to him, you slowly find out this guy believes in the Jewish question. Oh, yeah. At first you think like, oh, I love this guy. He's like very anti-woke. But then he starts saying things and you're like, what's what's going on here? And then right. he lets it slip. He's like, listen, do you really think six million really oh really my god. six and, and you're like oh my god this guy doesn't believe in the ha ah! right what do you do? do you stop eating at the restaurant or you're like listen your politics are shit but your food is bomb okay and i'm fine with that i don't care what your no, politics no 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 look he's dead to me he's he's really dead me. i mean i'm gonna door dash him but I'm not going <laughs> to that fucking restaurant ever again. You're like, I'm just going to eat from the restaurant. I'm just never going to walk inside of it. <laughs> yeah. Look. <laughs> okay, so you just so you just don't want to interact with the owner. Uh, you still want to eat his food and give him money. You just don't look. Want to interact I'm, with look, him. I'm I'm going to do you one better. Okay. I'm going to eat there. I'm going to continue to eat there. Yeah. I'm going to fucking stiff him on a tip every time. Wow. Be like, Listen to this. Here's your tip. Yeah, but he's the, he's the Six owner. million. He's not, That's your not. tip, motherfucker. Here's your tip. Read a fucking history book. Uh-huh. Okay. What do you think? Okay. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to tip... I'm gonna tip him a DVD. Schindler's List. <laughs> Here you go, bitch. That would actually be really funny. Shove that in your tip jar. It, every time you, every time you go to the restaurant as a tip, you just leave a different Holocaust movie. That's right. Here you go. Life <laughs> yeah. is beautiful. Suck there on this. There you go. Uh, CT for two Canadians says, Sitch, it's Dr. Hoggly Woggly. He has a PhD in barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I see what Adam neglected to mention, which we didn't find out until we went and ate there. It is actually literally called Dr. Hoggly Woggly. <laughs> he does have a fucking doctorate in barbecue, supposedly. Does it does it say that on the menu somewhere? It said, yeah, that's the sign outside. It says Dr. Hoggly Woggly. Oh, whole I name know, is but like... the PhD in barbecue. I mean, it does... The menu is kind of weird. It probably does say something like that on the menu. Um, probably. I don't remember. I just remember saying Dr. Dr. Hoggly Woggly's barbecue, and I was like laughing because I was like, that's hilarious. You, um, look, even Vox yeah. said it was good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, listen. So listen. And he so hates I went, everything. So I went to, so we went to, to Dr. Hoggly Woggly's with Adam. And it was it was very good barbecue. It was very tasty barbecue. And Adam made the correct choice. Oh yeah. The uh the brisket. Oh, it's to die for. It was really good. Yeah. I'm gonna go to Hogley Wogley tomorrow and get a bunch of that brisket just to That brisket was super tasty. We just actually to rub it in. I'm gonna uh, take a I'm gonna text you a picture of it. <laughs> you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> I know. That barbecue, that spicy barbecue. Oh god, it's, it's very so good spicy barbecue good. sauce. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I can taste it. Oh. It was weird because actually the worst thing there, still good, but the 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 least good thing there was the baby back ribs, which is unusual because usually ribs are like my favorite thing. Oh okay. But, yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, me, you, and CT, we got the special. It was the yes. baby back ribs, brisket, and and these two spicy sausage links that were gigantic. Yeah, and it was really tasty. And there we learned the horrible truth, everybody. That What's apparently that? only me and Adam are adults because everyone else there doesn't like coleslaw. And we were like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" That people? coleslaw is delicious. Their coleslaw is like really good coleslaw. Yeah. I don't know what they do to it. It has like an like a really unique, uh, like, like flavor to it that's very tasty. Yep. So. It's not too sweet. It's like the perfect amount of sweetness. Yeah, perfect amount of sweetness. Perfect. It's got like a little bit of vinegar in it to counteract the sweetness. It's, this was like, oh, it's really good. Coleslaw is, I don't know. How do you guys not like coleslaw? Coleslaw's How does it so look? Good. What's going on here? J-Mac calling me out. 
Like coleslaw is gross. Coleslaw is awesome. Coleslaw is nasty. Coleslaw. Wow, majority of people don't like coleslaw. Look at What's this. What's wrong with al pastor? I said it right. Al pastor. Al pastor. <laughs> por favor. I don't know how you say these words. Al pastor. Oh, por favor. Coleslaw is yummy. Okay, we gotta have a poll here. This is interesting. How much coleslaw can you eat? <laughs> Oh, are they arguing over coleslaw now? Yeah. There you go. There's your coleslaw poll. I I like coleslaw. I don't know what's wrong with you guys. Coleslaw is great. I will admit, coleslaw doesn't smell good. Coleslaw never smells good, but it tastes good. I don't know why. Oh, look. Boats are all over the place. Okay, we'll check back in a couple minutes, see how that goes. Coleslaw is great, man. You guys are crazy. I mean, I guess if you don't like mayo, you're not going to like coleslaw because it's like half the flavor. But, um. Oh, wait. We never finished watching this. But yeah, people have seen like 20 of my six hour long videos and they're like, still don't quite get it. And I'm like, hmm, I, I'm I just going to guess. I'm going to guess. I'm going to take a guess. You oh don't have to say if it's right. I have a feeling you're like a, a libertarian type. And you don't, you don't, so you don't have to say it's right. You're I like don't a, think that. I don't. I do. I completely think? disagree. No, yeah. No. All right. Okay. Adam Adam Miller Miller take a guess. Is a hardcore <laughs> and cap. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, what I, do you reckon? I mean, I would say Holocaust denier, potentially <laughs> disaffected liberal, but it's just me mm -hmm. guessing because you like have a lot of the same opinions as me, and that's what I am. So it's a, <laughs> it's a total guess. But I yeah, no, no I could see that too. Like you're just a. Are you going to spoil the mystery the... for us, Mahler? Are you going to actually tell us? I I mean, it's just obvious. I was radicalized by a shoe. I'm far right. So, uh... <laughs> That's the perfect answer. Shoe, How see? dare you answer this you're... serious question with I a know. joke, Mahler? No, that's it's canon. Not no. Here on the internet. That's it. There you go. Beautiful. Look, I was right. Answer. Shoe, How dare... I really like this. Uh drawing of shoe oh yeah <laughs> from, the, it's very funny. from the thing <laughs> the low resolution chibi shoe <laughs> okay. so great funny thank you thank you line centers very cool okay modern in a historian feels like they have the same non-position but watches everyone i mean in a historian used to watch my content so Internet Maybe. historian follows me on Twitter, and I'm like, Maybe, how do we uh, get him on the show? They can have him on. I don't know if we want to talk about politics. And all. <laughs> I feel like he's like in the Mahler camp where he wants to exist in like who knows space. His but videos are amazing. His videos are amazing. Yeah. yeah. I was like, why? How? Why is he following me? <laughs> like, because he likes to watch my content. Oh, okay. So I'm assuming that means he agrees at least. Somewhat of my muscle, he must agree with some of my politics. If he was watching my content, sure, so. yeah, and asked oh. me to do one of his videos. So, oh, he did, yeah. I'm, did... In, I'm in the Game of Thrones video that they did. Do we do it? What he asked you, he made a video that he wanted you to review. No, 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 I'm, I'm in his Game of Thrones video. Oh, you're in his Game of Thrones video. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of awkward in it because I'm an awkward person. I right. Was there. Okay. But yeah, it'd be cool to talk to him. I don't know if he's down to talk to uh, us about politics or anything or culture. But it'd be an interesting conversation. I mean, if we could just talk to him about history. There you go. Internet history. That's Look, true. I, I want to talk to him about the fourth turning. <laughs> like, there the you go. There you go. Doesn't he do predominantly history videos? Not that kind of history videos. He's an internet historian, okay? Right. He did a really good video like a while ago, like years ago, about um, uh, Roswell and how actually the Roswell crash probably was a weather balloon. <laughs> People are just wrong. That's so based. And he actually explained why, like, there would be a weather balloon and and stuff. Because when you hear, it, you go, "What? That sounds stupid." But then he explains, you're like, "Oh, that actually makes perfect sense." So, 
And he, yeah, he does a lot of like, he does like, like, uh, you know, he did like a, a fire festival video. He did a video on like the kid hiding in the attic. Remember his parents said that they got lost in the other balloon. That's probably the Roswell video. He has a lot of those, like those types of like history. It's not, he's not doing like ancient history videos or something or American history videos. Look, I can dream. Where's this? Where's the video that you're in? Game of Thrones. The Game of Thrones one? I don't know. He has a second channel, so it's it's not on. It's probably on the second channel. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Uh, sucks for you. There you go. Two hundred watt for two dollars says don't tell Adam about Starbucks. LOL. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, it's a it's a gender swap, right? Starbucks is a gender swap. Um, she's one of the mo like worst characters of all time, in my opinion. It's super weird. People love her character. I don't get it. She's like the quintessential toxic woman character. Mm -hmm. Um, her character is so toxic and bad that they essentially have to keep doing this thing with her character where she'll get to a point where the audience should hate her so much because she's so toxic what she's doing that in order to make you forgive her, they have to put her through some incredibly horrible, harrowing situation to rebuild up empathy for the character. And then they do, then she kind of cycles back into being hyper toxic again. <laughs> and they just repeat the cycle. It's so weird. She's got her big scene coming up that we actually need to empathize with her. Yeah, let's, so let's her quick get a box of kittens. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's more like, um, oh, you know, we need to make everyone empathize with Starbuck again. Have her get kidnapped by like a guy who wants to rape her, you know, and he's keeping her in her basement for like, two episodes and you start to feel bad for her <laughs> and you're like oh okay i feel bad for her again no, no she becomes horrible again and then i i don't and i'll be honest i don't remember what happens to her something weird happens to her at the end um like where she becomes one with the universe or is a secret angel or i don't there's some weird shit that happens to her. i don't remember what happens to her. something very strange happens to her at the end so This guy's oh got us almost 2 million subscribers on his second channel. Yeah, he's great. He's big. Yeah. That's fucking impressive. His videos are, I mean, they've got to take like a month to make. So much oh, fucking yeah. editing. There's a lot of editing. Well, that's probably why he liked my content, because I was like... Because you were doing of, the a, work, A lesser too. version of what he was doing, yeah. Yeah. He, so. was, he was trying to take you under his wing, and you just totally fucked him. I did. <laughs> what exactly happened he's like let me help you young whippersnapper and is it like, really nah weird... i'm gonna stream all day <laughs> i forgot about this I, I pulled up the starbuck wikipedia there's like this mm -hmm. super weird thing that happens in this where oh my god talk about them creating a mystery without an answer they have this weird thing where all the people start hearing the song all along the watchtower you know that song yeah I don't like that song. Oh, I, I like it. It's a fine song. Really? All Along the Watchtower? You don't like that song? I don't like it, no. Okay. Never have. What, everyone. Who is it? It's Jimmy, is that Jimmy Hendrix? Jimmy Hendrix, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there's just, they're all hearing the song All Along the Watchtower. And it's weird because there's like this weird thing where that song doesn't exist in that show on Earth. It's not like a famous song that people know. And they're like, where the fuck is this song coming from? Why are we all hearing this like song from the 1960s in our heads? Uh -huh. There's no answer to that question. That sucks. There always needs to be an answer. Oh no, it's something stupid like the notes correspond with math, which corresponds with like star locations or something retarded like that everything about this show i hate oh no yeah this show it's and i'm it, i don't even know i'm not even telling you the big twist which makes that the whole thing make even less sense you already told me the big twist the god thing that's not the big twist what <laughs> the big twist oh, i'll just ruin it the big twist so this makes no sense how is so, God not the big twist? Okay, so one of the mysteries in the show, which again is interesting, is 
you find out that all the people, they all, they're all very religious, but none of them are Christian or Jewish or Muslim. They all worship like the Greek gods. This sounds horrible. Like Apollo and Hera. Like, and they mention it. They're like, oh, Apollo. This like, sounds what? like fucking dog well, shit. Well, no, the setup is very interesting. You're like, wait, what? Because it's a show that you assume takes place in the future because there's like robots and spaceships and shit. And you're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, why do they believe in like Greek gods and shit? Okay. So the, the big twist, um, <laughs> the big twist is that it turns out that this show doesn't take place in the future. It takes place like super far in the past. And the reason all this dumb shit is happening is because God, for some reason, wants humans and robots to have a child together. And that child will start a new race of like creatures. And it turns out that we humans now are the offspring of these human robot creatures look i want this movie removed from the internet it's a, it's okay a TV show. yes well i want all evidence of it erased <laughs> general balsack is very mad because he likes the show i'm probably probably explaining it very poorly because i'm doing it based on my memory from like five years like 10 years ago but it is bad i don't the twist is bad it's weird the thing that makes it complicated is that the show there's good parts of it and that's what makes it frustrating but the twists are all awful but yeah, so like the end of it is they land on like Earth, our Earth, and there's like cave people there and they like breed with them because that's what God wants. And that's the ending. And then it like does like a fast forward and it's like, oh, we they are our ancestors. And so that makes it even stupider because you're like, well, wait a minute. Dumb. That means that they heard Jimi Hendrix singing all along the watchtower before Jimi Hendrix ever even existed. Oh, like, oh no. And then it's even dumber because you're like, wait a minute. They believe in the Greek gods, but like when they when they reach Earth, it's not like they reach Earth when there's like ancient Greeks. They reach Earth and there's like fucking cavemen shit. Like that means there's like tens of thousands of years before you get to the Greek gods. Like what the fuck? Like the Greek gods didn't exist for tens of thousands of years of cave people, you know, <laughs> like it, there's too many like weird things that don't make any sense because it's very obvious that they didn't have an answer to any of these mysteries until at all. They just they just had all these weird like, wouldn't it be weird if this happens? Wouldn't it be weird if this happened? So, Is there a reason for that happening? No. Well, I there's just a thought reason. it would look cool. It's a stupid reason. Oh, that but anyway, so I, I yeah, there's a lot of setting up of mysteries that have like the worst payoffs ever because they didn't know. Anyway, sounds like garbage. Joshua Holly for five dollars says I was in Hassan's chat the other day and asked if we would get an apology for the Gaza hospital situation. I got banned in less than five <laughs> seconds. No joke. No way. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so funny. That's great. No. Keep up the good work. That's all. All I gotta say is keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. Uh, Sammy G for five dollars says, Adam, if I made a body pillow of sitch, would you let me mail it to you as well? It would motivate me to finish the project if you reviewed it. <laughs> reviewed it? Does yeah. that mean I have to have sexual intercourse with the body pillow? Is that yes. What kind of review? That's the review. Okay. Yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, as long as all, all I have to do is type out thumbs up or thumbs down no no you listen you don't have to film it but you got to explain it no no yeah look i'm not sure i could get it up for a body pillow i'm just being honest with you wow not even a me body pillow no nah. that's hurtful i mean it would probably be harder with a, a you body pillow to be exactly it'll be harder perfectly honest <laughs> yeah i mean I mean the uh, the other type of harder, <laughs> like difficult. <laughs> uh huh. We want a detailed review of you banging the sitch body pillow out. Didn't didn't that Mister Girl do something like that? Some did ridiculously he? degenerate thing. Probably. Yeah, I think he did like a real doll review or something. He got he got the real doll people to send him a real doll. 
and he had sex with it and reviewed it. I like, oh, I thought you meant he had a a Mr. Girl body pillow that he sold to people. That he reviewed? No. Yeah. No, I think it was like a real doll review. Mm, okay. Which is just... Look, if you're listening to Mr. Girl's content for his real doll review... I mean, there's something going on in your life. <laughs> you need <laughs> you to like. You think? Yeah, yeah. You look. You need to get some therapy or something. Like you. Well, need here's a, a question. Mm -hmm. If you, if Sammy G gets a, a sitch body pillow made, okay. Okay. Will you put it up in the background, like behind you at all times? If like, it when, is. When the no, that's not going to happen. Why not? I mean, what's the purpose of that? There's just... a little extra sitch there, you know? How about this? He's your buddy. Look, I'll, I'll wheel and deal with you here. Okay. How about this? Yeah. You do your face reveal and you put your own fucking background up. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> you do your own fucking background with your own sitch body pillow. <laughs> I'll do what deal? I want in my, body, my background. <laughs> How is that a deal? That's just you making me do something. <laughs> That's a deal. There's no deal take there. Take it or leave it. <laughs> well, maybe I will take that deal. Okay. Look, I, if you do the the sitch chan, yeah. Look, I think that, that you'll be, put in the background. No, you'll put it in your background. Oh. But I think you might be able to sell some of those body pillows. Well, okay, what about this, Sammy? One side is sitch. And one side is Sitch Chan, okay? Because two sides. <laughs> Miss Sparkles is begging in the chat. Please, please. I know. I see. Please put the body pillow on the back. Why? Because it's funny. What do you mean? It's so silly. Yeah, Sammy, what about Sitch on one side and a Sitch Chan on the other side? It's perfect, right? <laughs> How about Sitch having sex with Sitch Chan? Well, I don't think that should be on the body pillow. In a very... <laughs> in a very pornographic oh way. God. I don't think that's going to... I don't think you can have that on YouTube, Adam. <laughs> Look, it'll just be far away in the in your background. You barely see it. I still have the dick box, Sammy, and that will be in the background. Yes. Sammy G sent me a dick box. Oh, really? Yes. She sent your dick in a box? No, she sent me a box shaped like a dick. That inside of it had a bunch of like men uh, making eyes at each other, including me and you making eyes at each other. Really? Yeah. Like, you we showed the pictures on stream. Adam just tries to put it. He Adam tries to put it out of his mind. What's up? You're not reading super chat. I was just waiting for you to react, but I was letting you not react. You're sla what did okay. you say? I don't know what you said. Forget it. Darth X X three sixty. I got my dick box right here. There you go. A Look, I got box. one too. I know. I saw you got a little dick box. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, it's a Dar P. Never mind. <laughs> it's just a P. It's just a regular P. Just a regular P. Not a penis. Just a regular P. Oh wait, maybe it's a D. It's a music note. Oh, is that what it's supposed to be? No, it's a dick. I don't know. You literally buy it as a dick box. That is the. Do you really? Yes. No way. I saw For the website. Real? Yes. What the yes. heck, Sammy? <laughs> I'm a married man. This Sam ended up on my porch. <laughs> Sammy sent me. So she wanted to send me the dick box, which I don't remember. I made some comment about it, which is why she did this. And so she looked for one to buy, and the one. The one that you can buy is the one that you have, but it was small. She's like, no, I need it to be like giant. Right. So she made one. I was like, really gigantic. She used it as a pattern. She scaled it up. <laughs> well, no, because it's different. It's from a different angle. That's like a profile. The one she gave me was like um, uh, an overhead or under shot, I guess you'd say. I just, we, we, we talked about this because we had the, there's a picture of her. You showed on stream. There's a picture of her at the mail the mail place, giving it to the mail guy. This giant. I know. Box. I remember. I still the got the like, picture. Guys, like, look at this crazy lady. Okay. 
Darth XX360 no scope. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while for $10 says in light of the elderly Jewish man who died getting whacked by a bullhorn. I wonder if someone like Jank would consider his retarded. It's just a skateboard line with a written house. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't even think about that, but that is true. That was here in LA, right? Poor I don't know. Guy. I saw that it happened. I didn't see where it happened, but yeah, it was in LA. Los Angeles. Uh Asha C for two dollars says, "Take it back!" Um, wow, take it back. Take it back. No. That was you calling him it's a left winger. I know. It hurt. Soto for two dollars says, "It's why Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is the absolute goat." Well, they definitely answer all the questions. That is true. My own. I have one single complaint with Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and it's that I think the final villain should have been. Uh, a human, not the little homunculus guy. That's my only complaint about it. But Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is very good. Would highly recommend. Uh, J Mac, hey, surrogate father, daddy J Mac for twenty dollars says, Adam, if you were forced to learn one of the following from Sitch, which would it be? Uh oh. Oh no. Ready for this? Hit me. How to play Magic: The Gathering. The the Boring. lore and geopolitics of World of Warcraft. Yeah, no. Or the power levels and fight breakdown of Dragon Ball Z up till the Cell Saga. <sighs> Keep going. Those are the three options. Oh, there's this only three options. It's a great question, options? James. Hank. <laughs> okay, it's it's I'm probably the Dragon Ball Z would be the most useful. It seems like that comes up on the show. Well, really? I, the World of Warcraft comes up on the show all the time too. Oh. What was the other one? Uh, how to play magic. Yeah, that never comes up. So let's just get rid of that one. Well, I thought actually, that would be what you choose. It has come up a bit. It has come up. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that's the Look one. Look at you me. Would I'm just chose. going. I'm going for straight utility here. Okay. Like, so you're throwing magic most... away. So you're between WoW and Dragon Ball Z. I think I'm going with Dragon Ball Z because there you go. Yeah, like it goes with. Look, I'm a story guy, a movie guy. So. Well, then you to... made the wrong choice. Why? I mean, the lore and geopolitics of WoW is far more story oriented than the power levels and fight breakdowns of Dragon Ball Z. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I roll again? No. Okay. So there's a guy named Raditz who mm -hmm. lands on Earth. Turns out Raditz is Goku's brother. Turns out Goku is an alien and he doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And that there's a race of aliens called the Saiyans. And they're powerful uh, warrior race that sends out babies to planets to conquer them. To sell it to an intergalactic ruler named Frieza. Okay. What's he doing with the babies? Is he like a sex trafficker? No, no. He sends the, the same babies to a planet, and then they grow up and they take over the planet as they get older, and then they sell the planet, to, or they, yeah, they give the planet to Frieza, who buys it from the Saiyans. Okay. Okay. Now, Raditz, when he lands, it's been a while, but I believe his power level is like 1,200 or 1,300. And the first person he meets is a farmer with a shotgun. And the farmer's shotgun has a power level of five. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. And so when you the need when to the, upgrade. When the farmer shoots him, he catches the bullet and he flicks it back at him and he instantly kills the guy. Wow. Right? So Take then that. Raditz is trying to find his brother Goku. But the thing what well, he doesn't know. What happened to the farmer's family though? We don't know what happened to the farmer's family. Look, okay. he had like six kids. They're all starving now. They they could have all be starving or dead. We never find out. He literally had a baby who wasn't... And, the mom ran off with the milkman. And it's funny. I don't know if that guy is ever brought back to life. I think that guy just died forever. So there's reincarnation in this shit? So in Dragon Ball... The reason it's called Dragon Ball is because there are these things called Dragon Balls, which are these like orange globes with red stars on them and mm -hmm. there's seven of them and if you collect all seven it summons a big fuck ass dragon um that looks like one of those chinese dragons like the, like the really long ones any z shaped no oh they just so the original series was called dragon ball and then the second one's called dragon ball z because they thought it was cool to put a z at the end of things and there's no oh. other explanation for it oh damn okay 
So when you get the Dragon Balls together, you summon the big ass dragon, and the dragon will grant you any one wish. Right. And so very often in the show, after a villain has like massacred entire populations of people, they will at the end of it collect all the Dragon Balls to wish everyone back to life. Well, look, I like this show. Look, I yes. actually do like that. Right. But I don't think that the farmer in the first episode of Dragon Ball Z is ever going to protect the life because no one ever knows he got killed. So he's just dead. The poor farmer. Yes. That's kind of blackpilled. It is. So, uh, but what, what Raditz doesn't know is that his brother Goku, when he was very young, he was like a problem child. He was very angry and violent, but he hits his head. When he hits his head, he suddenly becomes a very nice, docile child. He forgets all his sane programming. So he's a good guy. So that's how Goku's. That's why Goku's a good guy, because he used to be. He was programmed for evil, but he lost all his evil, evil programming, and he becomes good. And Goku hits his head for good. Yes. Got it. And so then Raditz. Okay, so Raditz is trying to find Goku because he's like, "Why has this planet not been conquered yet?" And so he looks around and he finds the highest, they have a little device on their face that reads power levels. And so he then uh, flies the highest power level he sees, and it's actually not Goku. It's Goku's arch nemesis from Dragon Ball, Piccolo. Bum, bum, bum. Who we don't know yet, but it turns out that Piccolo is also an alien. Only he's an alien from a race called Namekians, and they're green people. Namekians? Namekians. How do you remember all this shit? Are you fucking autistic? How do you remember anything about any TV show or movie you've ever seen, Adam? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now, Namekians, you would hate Namekians. Because okay. there's no women. They're all men, and they reproduce asexually by spitting eggs out of their mouth. <clears throat> Sounds boring. Yes, and they don't actually, they don't eat food either. They just drink water. Piccolo, gay Numekian. <laughs> Namekian. What? Namekian, not Numekian. A sound, Namek, Namekian. Namekian. So gay Raditz voice. is like, I'm going to beat you up, Piccolo. And Piccolo's like, bring it on. But then Raditz... On his little scouter, he sees a, another high power level, realizes Goku, and he just leaves. And Piccolo goes, oh, no. Raditz shows up to Goku, where Goku's hanging out with his old master, Master Roshi, and his Raditz old friend. Raditz is the boss alien, right? Yes. Okay. And then they show up to, Raditz finds Goku. Goku has taken his son, his new son that no one knew he had, named Gohan. Mm -hmm. to master roshi who's his old master's house uh, he lives on a little island and he takes his son there to meet master roshi his best friend krillin and his other best friend bulma and they're all like oh my god goku you have a fucking child and they're all kind of shocked and horrified at the fact that goku number one had sex with a woman because <laughs> he's so like naive and innocent and also has a child right and raditz shows up and he's like goku or he calls him by his true name, his Saiyan name, which is Kakarot. And he says, Kakarot, why haven't you taken over this planet yet? And Goku's like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm a good guy. I'd never do that. And then Rad says, well, you better join me. You better join me. And he says, no. And then he says, well, I'm going to take your son then. So he kidnaps Gohan and he beats up Goku. And he flies away. And Goku goes, oh no, you took my son, what am I going to do? And then Piccolo shows up and he, Piccolo says, listen, Goku, I know we're enemies, but we have to join forces to defeat Raditz because he's so powerful. And then Goku says, okay. What's his power level? So Piccolo and Goku are like in the three to 400 range. I mean. And Raditz is in like the 1300 He's got 1300. Range. Yeah. So they're way <laughs> weaker. They're way weaker. Okay. okay. Three, and then three thousand, no thirteen hundred, <laughs> and they're like the three to four hundred. Oh, okay. So they so they fly off to fight Raditz. They're fighting Raditz. They're kind of getting their ass kicked. And Piccolo's like, "Listen, I have a special technique that I was going to use to kill you, Goku. But I'll use it to kill this guy, Raditz. It's called Special Beam Cannon." Mm -hmm. But. Well, actually, I think the translation in Japanese directly is Devil Screw Cannon, but they didn't like that, so they called it Special Beam Cannon. <laughs> and they said, okay, listen, listen, 
I'll, I have to charge this special beam cannon move, but it takes five entire minutes to charge. So you're going to have to fight Raditz for five fucking whole minutes by yourself while I charge it. Can he just hide in the in the lake? I mean, they're kind of fighting in a big open field, so there's nowhere for him to really hide. Oh, that's but, a uh, No, no, he needs to distract him so that he can charge the move for five minutes. Right, okay. So anyway, so so Piccolo's charging this move, okay? He's charging the special beam cannon, and Goku's getting his ass kicked. But here's the twist, okay? Raditz, so, so I didn't tell you this, but Saiyans, the Saiyan Who's race... Who's charging they, the beam cannon? Piccolo. Piccolo, okay. He's charging special beam cannon, Goku has to fight his brother alone for five minutes. Okay. Now, I didn't say this, but all the Saiyans have a monkey tail. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they all have a little monkey tail. And when they look at the full moon, they turn into giant King Kong-sized rampaging monkeys. Love it. Yeah. So, but it has a weakness. If you grab their tail, they become paralyzed. What? That's yes. not. <coughs> that's not very adaptive. No, no. Um, and so <laughs> we'll get there, kidda. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um. Goku, but Goku had his tail removed to prevent him from turning into a giant monkey. Smart. Yes. So this Goku guy knows what's up. Kakarot. His, his son, Gohan, still has his little monkey tail, though. Becomes oh. a problem later. So uh, Goku grabs uh, Raditz's tail and he paralyzes mm -hmm. him so that he'll so that Piccolo can use his special move to kill Raditz. Okay. But here's the mm -hmm. problem. Raditz is like, listen, Goku, I'm your brother. I promise if you let me go that I'll leave you in peace and never bother you again. And Piccolo's like, don't listen to him, Goku. He's lying. He's tricking you. But Goku's like, you pinky promise? <laughs> and Raditz is like, sure. And so Goku lets him go. And guess what? He, was he lying. lies. He lied. Yes, of course he was lying. He was totally fucking with Goku. So he started beating the shit of Goku because Goku's naive and innocent. Right. But From then the head drop. But then Gohan, Goku's son, who's been kidnapped this whole time and has been locked in Raditz's spaceship, he sees his dad getting beat up and he says, Leave my daddy alone. And he gets so angry that even though he's a four year old child, mm -hmm. his power level rises to seven hundred. Wow. And he bursts out of the rocket of the spaceship and he flies and headbutts Raditz right in the chest, actually doing damage to him and hurting him. Wow. That's the alien boss. Like, what the fuck? Yes. How is that even possible? And then when Raditz is distracted because he's hurt, Goku comes up from behind him and puts him in like a headlock and he holds him. Okay. And he says, Piccolo. How, how, how's that beam coming, bitch? He says, Piccolo, I'll hold them down. You kill both of us with your move. And Piccolo's like, this is perfect. <laughs> I get to kill both of these people at the same time. And Piccolo goes, special beam cannon, fire, bam. And he shoots this like laser beam that's got a drill on it. And it goes right through rats in Goku's chest, pierces both of them. Bam. Wow. Killing both of them. Wow. And as they're dying, uh, Pic Raditz is like, oh, you at least Goku died too. And Piccolo's like, no, idiot. They have Dragon Balls on this planet, and they'll grant any wish, and they're going to wish Goku back to life, so you died for nothing. And then Raditz is like, no, you're stupid. I have a communicator that communicates whatever I'm listening to to two other Saiyans across the universe who are way fucking stronger than me, and now they heard about the Dragon Balls. They're going to come and revive me instead, and they're going to be here in one year. Bum, bum, bum. Wow. And now we're on episode three of 262. Wow. It's a lot of plot for three episodes. Are you ready for episode three? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, let's keep going. What are you talking I, about? This I expected you to, to stop me after like five minutes of this. I can't believe you just let me go on and on and on. Look, I'm I'm hooked. I want to know what happens. No, what's what's Raditz's power level at? Oh, he's dead now, right? He's so dead. He's, he was at thirteen hundred. He was at thirteen hundred, yeah. but he's he's dead now. Now he's at zip zero zilch. He's dead. Yeah. So when and I'm not, so the two Sands that show up are Nappa and Vegeta. 
and they're going to show up in a year. And Napa's power level is 4,000, and Vegeta's power level, if I recall correctly, is like 16,000. It's crazy strong. 16,000? Yes. Well, we haven't even got out of the hundreds. I Well, now we have. Who's That's that how guy? Vegeta. Vegeta. Is he Vegeta. around for a while? He's around forever. He becomes a main character. Oh, Vegeta becomes Ve a main character. Vegeta, we find out, is actually the prince of all Saiyans. That's why he's so powerful. We Mm also -hmm. find out that Frieza, the evil intergalactic racist warlord, destroyed the Saiyan homeworld, killed all the Saiyans, except for a handful of them, including Vegeta, Nappa, Raditz, who is now dead, and Goku. So almost all the Saiyans have been
and it would get to a point in the show um it was like episode like 90 or something where they ran out of episodes there were no more english episodes because they stopped right. translating them and so it would start back over at the first episode so you're and so for like again. yeah so for like eight years of my life i would only watch these the same like 80 episodes of Dragon Ball Z because they never had the rest of them. Yeah. So that's so, is it, I am autistic or is it just because I've seen these stupid fucking episodes growing up so much that I like, I remember all this stupid shit about it. <laughs> now do One Piece. Itch. Well, I never, I've only seen like the first three episodes of One Piece, so I can't do that. But... There you go. But thank you, MYR. How dare you call me indifferent? Muggy for six MYR says now do one piece. There you go. Okay. I wasn't indifferent. You seem indifferent. I was very in interested. Mm -hmm. Look, I was taking notes. How can that what that's the opposite of indifference? Oh, okay. Let me share my notes with the class so they can see all my horrible spelling. Bondu Fadar says the thumbnail should be Kid Sitch with Adam reading a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. It could be that, or it could be, you know, the meme of like the guy talking into the woman's ear and she doesn't care. Oh, yeah. It's, that's me explaining uh, DBZ to Adam. I could literally explain to you. I, my be, notes? I could literally spend like five hours to you explaining very, very intricately stupid shit about dragon ball z or hunter cool. hunter i could do hunter hunter yeah so all the earth people get killed but reincarnated uh yeah several times actually in the series <laughs> that's a good way well they want to have a lot of action so they want the sitting being destroyed and people being killed i get wiped it wiped out yeah look you understand my style <laughs> i like yeah. it there you go it's got to be unabashed got to have lots of chaos dragon ball z abridged is very good dragon ball z itself is not that good so so provider says remember when goku put a rabbit and his henchmen on the moon to make marshmallows i do remember that yes Oh, that's so cool. So Goku has a, a, a pole. I forget how he gets the pole, but he has a power pole that can extend like indefinitely. And he uses it to reach the moon and he puts an evil rabbit and his gang on the moon. That's nice. how they get there, right? I didn't just like make that up in my head. Uh, Jay Hendricks for five dollars says, Adam, sitch. How do you know the plot of two episodes of Dragon Ball Z? You must be autistic. Also, Adam, Sitch, how do you not understand treasury notes? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Look, if you put this much energy into the treasury notes, you'd get it, man. I, I guarantee you, you'd get it. <laughs> That's hard, though. This is just like rote memorization. What do you mean? I guess you're right. It is just memorization. It was his grandpa's, so. My favorite Vegeta line is, Every, everyone dies. It's funny, like, all the all the DBZ abridged lines for the characters are so fucking good that, like, I don't even remember a lot of original Dragon Ball. I just think it's, like, Dragon Ball Z abridged. Like, there's a line where, Vegeta, I'm trying to remember the line, it's so good. Like, Vegeta's fighting, there's an Android 18 character, Adam. Yeah. It's like a female robot. Sweet. And Ad and Vegeta's gonna fight her. And he says something like, um and he says, I'm trying to remember the line, something like, I'm about to I'm about to destroy this washing machine. And, he's, and then he says, I'm not saying this because you're an android, I'm saying it because you're a woman. <laughs> and she's gonna use the washing machine? No. So she needs it? He's calling her a washing machine. And you think he's calling her a washing machine because she's a robot. And he says, I'm not calling it because you're a robot. I'm calling it because you're a woman. Because he's sexist. Oh, I get it. I get it. Right. That is good. Yes, I like that, it. 
Actually, one That's of my an favorite Vegeta lines. Joke. It is one of my favorite Vegeta lines in that episode, and in the, all the whole series is he's trying to fight her, and in the fight he keeps killing other like random passerbys because they're fighting on a busy freeway, and he says, mm-hmm. "I will kill as many people as I have to, as long as you are one of them." Oh, that's good. Yeah, that is great. There's a lot of good DBZ. The, the character lines for DBZA are so great. Anyway, uh, Muggy for another 15 MYR says, imagine Adam coming onto an EFAP stream unannounced and asking the cast, did you know Goku's al- do you know Goku's <laughs> alien name? <laughs> like that's out of the blue. <laughs> You're like, do you guys know Goku's alien name? Like where you say it very proudly. <laughs> I would never ever do that in a movie. It'd be pretty years. funny. I will joke on our stream about doing that, but I would right. never do that, obviously. Right. Actually, I don't even know if they would know. Well, I'm sure they would know it just by osmosis because they don't watch, they don't like anime. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. How How is that possible? Look, I, for, I love anime. I just don't have time to watch it all. I don't know. I don't like anime. I would. Like, if I had a lot of free time, I would be watch a lot of anime. Mm-hmm. My ultimate goal is to get Sitch to spend less time watching anime and more time doing creating art. Creating there you go. Something cool. This guy, he wants us to, he wants me to watch less anime. Good. Oh, well, I, I talked to you about writing a novel together, and you were like, mm, I got shit to do. But there it, you, go. you know, in all reality, it doesn't really seem like. No, I'm just watching Dragon Ball Z again. again. <laughs> I know exactly. It's true. That's a good point. It doesn't seem like you're really. I mean, look, I basically taught myself how to make a graphic novel. I know. Like I didn't know jack shit. I'm fucking expert now. True. Yeah. Vegeta. I mean, ta- Vegeta. Taken... <laughs> I'm haunting you. Oh no. Is that a ghost? So in Dragon Ball Z, so Vegeta kills Nappa. In Dragon Ball Z a bridge, they made Nappa a ghost who now haunts Vegeta because he's annoyed that Vegeta killed him. That's what I look, I would love doing that. Right. Haunting people. It's weird. Um, so Dra- Dragon Ball Z bridge is weird because it's like so I don't know if you so there's like a trend of something it's called a bridge series and someone takes an anime and they make it like silly and they like redub all the voice lines. Oh yeah, we should do one of those. That'd and be so fun. so Dragon Ball Z bridge starts off very kind of childish. Like the first 14 and 15 episodes are just kind of like goofy, but then there's like a turning point where it's still funny but it actually becomes like better written than the source material and it's very weird <laughs> like how good it is. So they do like a different story, right? They're making no, it's new like words it's or... the same story, but they cut all the like the fat and filler out, and they make the dialogue like really sharp and funny and like great. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's very interesting. I always wanted to do a fan edit of Sucker Punch and do that, make it into like a real movie. There you go take all like first thing gone is all that dream all the dream sequence bullshit such bullshit and that like the whole movie yeah but look oh, okay. you want to thread together a narrative that actually is essential to all that real stuff that they're doing you wanted to actually do that stuff yeah but the whole movie i thought was just the stupid dream sequence shit I was like, isn't that, I thought that was the appeal of the movie. It, that's the cool stuff that's happening, but it right. needs to be in, embedded into a narrative story where it's actually they're actually doing that stuff. Like, they have to fight a dragon and kill a dragon. And Well, here's a better idea. Mm-hmm. Just get rid of... No, keep all the dream sequence stuff, but make that the reality. Get rid of all the stupid, real-world boring shit. That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's exactly what I understand. What, Gotcha. Yeah, I'm saying take take the real real part out because it's that's what gives it the context of being a dream sequence. So, yes, yes, all I the real world stuff has to be really happening. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I mean, how to thread it together? 
I mean, time travel could be a a possibility. Well, I've never seen it, so I don't know. But oh, really? I mean, it has that classic video game structure where it's like every time the dream sequence comes in, the guy comes out and says, you know, this is like your mission. You have to this do this. This is your boss fight. You had to go yes. fight this boss. Yeah, exactly. That's right. exactly what yeah, it that's, is. That's, I didn't watch it because I saw, I realized what the movie was. And I said, that's stupid. I'm not more watching this. It is so yeah. stupid. Right. Yeah, it's embarrassingly stupid. But it is amazing eye candy, man. That's Zack Snyder in uh, a nutshell. Amazingly stupid, but good eye candy. That's every Sad. Zack Snyder movie. He's a well, terrible writer. Okay, I, I didn't think. You. I thought he did decent on Watchmen. I thought, but Watchmen he didn't was... write Watchmen. He just took of something course. that already existed. Yeah, and Three Hundred is amazing. Yeah, right. He can do okay if he's using something else. Right. Yeah. But when he has to write the script, or it's a custom script, or it's an original script like Batman vs Superman, or Justice League, yeah, it's or, garbage. Um, uh, uh, Sucker Punch, you know, it's 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 trash. Yeah. Uh, Val Van Gogh for twenty dollars says the leftovers was more about humanity having to grapple with cosmic horror and dread, realizing the universe is capable of affecting our tiny situation on this planet with phenomenons you might never understand. No, I get it, but it still pisses me off. Kyle, it still annoys me. Uh, Val How's Van Gogh for twenty dollars. Thank you. Says under the skin was about the darker elements of male sexuality. The men in the movie hitting on on johansson were real men secretly being filmed who didn't recognize her is that true no <laughs> then why that's, would he say that that's not true at all he's made that up i don't know yeah. why when you look up scarlett johansson the first picture that shows up for her is like literally the most unflattering picture i've ever seen of scarlett johansson in my life. that's the, that's Google messing with you. Why do they do that? I'd be so mad if I was her. I was like, why is they this don't the want picture people, you choose? Look, they don't want people searching Scarlett Johansson and feeling inferior. They choose the weirdest, derpiest picture to show up, like right in the fucking front. Yeah. Under the skin, real men. We're just real men, Adam. We're just ordinary men. Not true. Have you seen that? No, what is it? We're just ordinary men. We're just normal men. I don't see... I think you just made this up. I don't see anything about them being, like, real. Well, they use that one actor that's s seriously deformed, but, I mean, he's a, an actor and has been in other movies. Okay. Oh my God! What's up with that? What's wrong with that guy's fresh? What's wrong with her fresh? He's just a regular guy, Sitch. Jesus, that guy's face is fucked. He, oh, it's so sad. She picks up that guy. Yeah. And the you can tell, like, oh my, it's it's like the saddest thing. You're like, oh my God. He's so like this girl is so out of his league. <laughs> right. But she drops him off at the butcher shop, man. David Puss says it's true. Some of the men didn't know they were being filmed. They did that for some shots where she like walks around in nightclubs and stuff and is looking for guys, but none of the guys that she actually picks up or don't oh, know. Oh, right, right, right don't know that they're being filmed yeah like, but were there people come on in the movie that like when she's walking by or hitting on her that were just like that was real just like maybe guys. i mean okay. they may have done some shots like that you know mm -hmm. you've directed movies before you know what's up you'd be sure. like yeah let's just walk around here and get some b-roll a b-roll of men cat calling yeah uh Sessin Rin's fan club for five dollars says 
Uh, Ethan Van Scriver is awesome. Get Eric July on and put him on the hot seat. Thanks for the great streams. I'm conservative and I enjoy y'all's conversations. Well, thank you. We, uh, I reached out to Eric July. Eric July randomly followed me on Twitter and I messaged him immediately and said, hey, our fans would love it if you came on. So there's like a weird thing going on. And I feel kind of bad for Ethan because I feel like there's kind of these two factions that have developed that are like the Vito, uh, Dick Masterson, Ethan Van Skyver faction. And then there's the Gary Nerdrotic, Eric July. And to some extent, Mahler's in this faction too, Mahler. But uh, although, look, I saw a clip today where it was heels versus babyface, Nerdrotic, and Eric July. And they were talking about Isom and joking about the your favorite part of Isom thing. And mm -hmm. Mahler is in the clip. Mahler doesn't say a word. That's smart, Mahler. Keep, <laughs> keep your mouth shut. <laughs> like, I was thinking, look, if I was there, I'd be just, I'd be saying exactly, I'd be talking exactly like Mahler's talking. That's funny. Nothing. I just, look, I, and I said it when Ethan was on the stream. I was like, it's not my job to be the comic book critic of Comics Gate or, or the internet or anything. Like, I don't know why, why, well, I, I guess I know why, but Vito and Dick Masterson, you know, they want to be the comic book critics of Eric July. I mean, that's fine. Look. It's a free country. <laughs> do what you want to do. I just, I look, I get it. I totally get it. They're coming at it from an artist perspective. It's just, it's not my style. J Mac for $10 says, my homemade broccoli salad kicks any coleslaw's ass. It's a family recipe. Ew, listen, I hate broccoli. Broccoli's gross. Gross mad, broccoli. Mad? I'm sorry, Jay. No, no broccoli for me. Broccoli's amazing. What are you talking no, about? Broccoli is bad. Maj says that Mahler does join in in the. Well, there you go. I didn't. He didn't join in in the clip that I saw. So there you go. But if you've seen the longer live stream, I mean, I'll take your word for it. Have you guys seen the? New episodes of Rick and Morty with Justin Roiland replaced. I have not. No, it's super weird. It's so strange. It's like Does you're he just play the grandpa. He plays Rick and Morty. Oh wow! And Mister Poopy Butthole, who's like a big character in the first. Because he got like me too or something, right? Yes, and it's so bizarre to watch this because you just oh, I hate it. It <laughs> feels so weird and wrong. Like it feels like you're watching fan dubs because the voices are like kind of sometimes good, but then often very bad. And it's just like I just it, it's so noticeable. I can't watch the episode. I just keep thinking about the fact that it's not Justin Roiland's voice. Yeah, they did that in Simpsons. I think they had a completely different Homer Simpson for oh, the really? first season, yeah. So you hear the first season and you're like, "What the fuck is this?" Oh, but yeah, that's yeah, but that's the first season is different and then going back, you know, all after that it's the same guy, right? Of course, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is like the this is the opposite cuz they had like six seasons of Justin Roiland doing like all these voices. He's very oh, yeah iconic voices and then you hear someone else doing them and you're like oh this is weird this is a far worse situation here yeah I'll go, I'll go. especially after you've gone so many seasons you're like what the f what what's happening when it was crazy because he never they never he never got charges against them why couldn't so they get weird. why couldn't they get a just get a impressionist that could be closer to the target well that's what's weird too because i know i've heard people like random internet people who have much <laughs> better like impressions of rick and morty mahler can do a better job <laughs> well yeah i don't know i don't remember if i've heard mahler's rick and morty, but... but yeah i mean i've heard random internet people on twitter who do like pretty spot-on impressions better than whoever they i don't know who the fuck they got but like it's just 
it's not good it, it's different it's weird and it's just so distracting and also like screw them for um firing him just based on an accusation like i don't know if he's guilty or not but you shouldn't be firing people based on accusation that's gross The new voices are Ian Cardoni and Harry Belden. Huh. I don't recognize either of these people. Okay. Doesn't work. Oh, look at this. I guess it is fake news. Uh, Homer, the dim-witted but lovable patriarch on The Simpsons, sounded much different in season one despite being voiced by the same actor. Oh, so he's just doing it differently. When it comes to animated characters, few are as iconic as Homer Simpson, so widely beloved Homer's Homer, uh, that many would rank him... Oh, get to the fucking point here. Huh, it's not going to say. <laughs> well, he just did a different voice in the first season. Yeah, like these, said, oh, change it. yeah. these voice actors, they do have... They kind of can do a lot of different voices. Sure. They're like, yeah, hey, we don't like this Homer. Make it more peppy. <laughs> more? I can't do a Homer. Marge. Yeah. Marge. J Mac for ten dollars. Thanks so much. His internet historian was on EFAP. That's true. He was. Uh, oh, Duke nice. Norton for twenty dollars. Thanks so much. His A team dislikes Jimi Hendrix and Coleslaw. Like the uncultured piggies they piglies they are. S class is based and doesn't conform the chopstick degeneracy. Survey says S class is a best class. That must have been Dr. Diddler. That was Duke Norton. Oh really? It spread. Ouch. Dr. Diddler. I would invoice him, man. That was like pure theft. There you go. Even though you do like coleslaw, so. But it's yeah. funny to say you don't. Uh, Living Does Well specifically for five dollars says, do the body pillow, Adam, consummate the work marriage or it gets annulled by the YouTube Pope? Well, that Pope can come on and annul us. There you go. Jonathan Rosler for 14 months says, Sitch, the point of the homunculus, monk, no, the point of the homunculus was that he was denying that he was basically human, which is what led him to do all the terrible stuff. Homunculus. Was that the point? I missed that if that was the point. Hmm. Maybe. That makes it more interesting if that's the case. Stug for five hours says, No, Sitch, it was called Z because Toriyama wanted it to end. They wouldn't let him, so he continued two more times into Cell and the Boo Sagas. Oh, really? That's fascinating and hilarious. I mean, I know that he wanted to end with Cell. I didn't know he wanted to end it before Cell. Because I know he wanted to end with Gohan becoming... And then, and then what happened? We had another 20 years and they brought back Dragon Ball Z again. Did you know that? They're, you know no. they're, make, they're still making new Dragon Ball to this awesome. day? They brought it back after like 20 years. They fucking brought it back. They should. Yeah. It's not very good. So maybe they should not have. But, but then again, it was never very good. So I don't know. Maybe it's the same level of quality. What do you mean? It sounded amazing. I don't know okay. what you're talking about. I love Dragon Ball Z, but I I understand that that's not good. We did not end the coleslaw poll. So far, the coleslaw poll is 48% say it's good, 39% say it's bad, and 12% have never had it. That's there you go, the majority decisive of people win like for it. good. Yeah, there you go, good. That's good. Uh, Live in Death's Walls for five hours says Dwarf in the Flask was the best villain in any in all anime heads down. Making him human would just be an overdone trope of rejecting humanity for power. Well, there you go. And for another five dollars, Live in Death's Walls specifically says last of my oh I read that one. That was the uh, the DBZ thing. Monet Mail or Ma Magnet Mail for ten dollars says you should check out the song Youngest Daughter by Super Heaven. Been my favorite band for years, and now they're finally blowing up. Sellouts. Also, check out the band Soul Blind if you like grunge. I like grunge somewhat. 
Well, then you can check it out. Youngest daughter, super heaven. I am going to check it out. Look at that. I just listened to like 10 A seconds bunch of, of it. music. Oh. Not my jam. It's not bad, but it's not my jam. Sitch has horrible taste in music. I'll probably love it. There you go. Um, CT for five Canadians says, do it, Adam. There's a meme of me and Mark to Cyborg's community. I join the streams, ask if he's playing Cyberpunk. As soon as he says no, I leave. There you go. Yeah, but I want to play with Sitch. That's uh, what everyone wants to see. No, no, she meant like, to go on EFAB and be like, do you know Goku's alien name? <laughs> and then you just leave. Oh. That'd be funny. That would Mark... actually be funny. It would be so weird. No one would get it. Our community think it's hilarious. His community would be like, what the fuck? Adam enters like randomly EFAB once a week to ask them some very random esoteric Dragon Ball Z question and then just leaves. Sounds like a lot of work. That'd be pretty funny. I'll feed you. I'll feed you weird questions. I'll feed you weird questions. Drew um, Dogman for two hours says, Happy 300 to my two favorite leftists. Well, there you go. Or lefties. Thank you, Drew. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Val Van Gogh for 16 months says, BBC, Scarlett Johansson, I'm playing unscripted scavenger, scavenging alien. Now call me a liar. Wow. Uh oh, there's a BBC article about it. Here we go. Adam is wrong. Oh, no. Here's the article Scarlett Johansson, I'm playing an unscripted scavenging alien. He's playing a superhero in the Avengers in an audio-only computer program in Spike Jones's Her, and now Scarlett Johansson is a human scavenging alien in independent burst drama Under the Skin. Wait, Under the Skin was after Avengers? I thought that was like one of the first movies she ever did. No. It was 2013. Wasn't that, wasn't that long ago. Wow, she got her tits out after she was famous? Shocking. She had They had a body double. Oh, she does wow. like full nude. But it's, it's not like her. a bunch of full nudes, yeah. But it's not her though. Nope. Some other some other girl. Terrible. That should I mean, be illegal. <laughs> Why? Then just get an actress that will do it. Why? What it's not a big deal. It's Who a cares? big deal. It's a big deal, Adam. They pick a nice actress. You'll be happy. Okay. I mean, it didn't matter because all her news got leaked anyway, so who cares? I didn't look at them. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I believe in privacy. Yeah, okay. Anyway, What's, back to So our... what happened? Look, is you didn't read enough of the story to be able I know, to I'm tell. back. It's proving to be one of the most divisive films of recent times, with some critics calling it astonishing and others calling it laughable. Oh, okay. The movie made by blah, 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 as much is known for its on-screen nudity and its outhouse direction. Loosely based on author Michael Farber's novel and set on the streets of Glasgow, 29-year-old uh, Johansson plays an alien seducing random humans to harvest their bodies. Um... Blah, blah, blah. And it tells all the useless information in the article. Uh, Johansson declares herself to be a great admirer of his work. I love the music videos he did as well with massive attack and blur. It's the reason I want to do the film in the first place. You know what that means? You know what that means, Adam? She had sex with him. That's what it means. Thank you. Adam knew exactly what that meant. <laughs> I'm glad Adam knew. <laughs> he knew. He knew. Uh, John Jonathan and I Jonathan and I started the conversation about Under the Skin a few years ago, actually, because it takes a long time for the movie to come to fruition. The script changed uh, so much in that time. It originally had two characters in it and then it was pared down to one. It's also the first film I've done where the script was more of a blueprint or a guideline for the project than for anything else. We only discovered the performance and intention of the movie after the first two weeks of shooting. So it took time to find it. So it took some time to find itself. That's a terrible, terrible tell. You only figure out what the fuck the movie's about after you've been shooting it for two weeks? 
Well, you've been having sex with the lead actress for two weeks, so I mean, you're trying to draw. <laughs> like, well, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> trying to draw it out as long as possible. <clears throat> uh, barely recognizable from her usual self, wearing a dark wig, red lipstick, and a fake fur coat. The actress wanders around the streets of Glasgow or else drives a van and stops to talk to real life bystanders in the city. These events in the film were unscripted and filmed secretly. One scene where Johansson stumbles and falls over in a busy shopping street and is helped to her feet by members of the public only for her to walk off robot-like without thanks actually happened, happened and has been kept in according to the director. Most of her, quote, victims who are chatted up by Johansson and enticed to come and sit in her transit van aren't actors. Wow. But Jonathan Glazer says they were talked through what extremes they would have to go. Oh, wait. So they weren't actors, but they were, they knew they were in a movie. They were talked yes. <laughs> through what extremes they would have to go to if they agreed to take part in the film once they understood what they were doing. Uh, quote, yeah, because the they made all the dudes go full n nude. Right. You're like, okay, you're going to be in a scene with Scarlett Johansson. She's going to be butt naked. But she's not really. But well, maybe. You're, but you're going to be butt naked too. <laughs> I mean, based. But she's not really. She's going to be wearing a bodysuit because it's a body double. We're going to swap it right. out with magic. The few actors we did have were ones who wanted to experiment and challenge themselves. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's what you say when you're a director and you're asking someone to do something that nobody they wants don't want to, to do. do of course yeah this is going to be a challenge are you up for a challenge i like this jo johansson a star of films like lost in translation and the girl with the pearl earring admits that the film was not quote the movie star experience but despite the lack of dialogue and the considerable amount of nudity there was very little she refused to do for the film well, she refused to be naked in it. What do you mean? Uh, quote, the only well, maybe, thing... Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it is her. Okay. Look I, thought it was a, I thought it was a body double. But look, everything that you're saying is exactly what I laid out. Yeah. The only thing was when I was driving this van around Glasgow looking for my victims, I would have Jonathan and the crew in the back of it filming this bizarre candid camera situation. And Jonathan would talk me through an earpiece, giving me instructions. Okay, so a lot of this does seem to be like just random fucking people they found. Occasionally, he would say, this guy looks good. Stop and talk to him. And I'd be like, no, are you kidding me? No, I won't, because if he gets in the van, I think you'll find we have a reverse predatory situation on our hands. <laughs> or I'd say, are you crazy? That man is drunk, and I keep driving. <laughs> Overall, though, I... <laughs> I totally trusted Jonathan with myself, and this trust between director and actor is vital. Oh, they totally fucked. And if you lose that, no one is going to have a good time. And this is such an intimate film. I'm so vulnerable in this, and it's so deeply personal that we had to go into this as partners. Oh, my God. <laughs> partners. Wow, they sure fucked. Looky here, partner. Yeah. Um, now we know how, our, how our nudes got leaked. Yeah, there you go. Glazer adds that the actress... Quote, had to be brave as the character, but Scarlet got it. The other thing was she immediately loved Glasgow and was far better than me at understanding a broad Scottish accent. She would have been having entire dialogues with people when I didn't understand a word. <laughs> That's pretty funny, actually. There you go. So there it is. Okay. Well, there you go. Interesting. There's a very interesting... Did you look it up? Oh uh, no, but I will skin look. Skin body double. That's the that's a search term right there. Let's see. Opens up about her first fully new role in Under the Skin. Um, so maybe she didn't do a body double. Blah blah blah. It was shot mostly guerrilla style with non actors, sometimes unknowingly taking part of the film. A lot of imp improving of conversations. It's her first fully nude role. Um, doesn't say it was a body double. Well, there you go. You this whole time, Adam. You were undering under a fiction. It was actually wow. her. It was not a body double. Well, there she you does, go. She does look really smoking hot in the movie. Well, there it is. Movie sounds stupid though, so I'm never gonna say it. It's great. Oh, I'm just getting this. men to get eaten by aliens. It's an art film. Blue. Well, it's more an art film than 
a sci-fi film, which is part of yeah. the problem. PC for two dollars says, "I'm glad I came back for the live Dragon Ball Z plot ASMR." There you go. You're welcome. Was it ASMR? I guess. Look at this. CT's too good to me. What'd she do? She drew this picture with like an amazing Adam beard. Oh, unless maybe this isn't me. I don't know. It doesn't look like my beard. I think that's CT talking to the character from Cyberpunk, maybe? Oh, okay. That or makes, something? That makes more sense. Cool. This is on... Okay, whatever. Um, Muggy for 15 MYR says, knows Goku's alien name, eats coleslaw, and loves looking at pretty pictures. A-Team reigns supreme. True. There you go. And thank you. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> wow, but come the night says coleslaw is trash. Effing trash. Wow. Wow. Hurtful. Yeah, what did Cole Slaver do to you? I know. Okay, let me look up the Streamlabs here. Um, today is... Do, do we get all the ones from Sunday already? No. Oh, okay. Look, I was... That was just today. Yeah, I know. So today's Streamlabs, there's only three. And then I'll go back and read all the stream maps from Sunday, and then I'll go back and read the stream, the chats from Sunday that we missed. Uh, Carl Benjamin, the real Carl Benjamin, for two dollars says it is of critical importance that we retain our integrity in the face of great foolishness. Our relationships are such that we need to reconcile, but a small number of our differences to realize the true entropic harmony and virtue. There you go. Beautiful. Uh, Magor for two dollars says Brett. Brett Weinstein said he thinks Owen Benjamin is doing some sort of performance art where the point is he's obviously wrong, but he can argue better than the experts. So what the hell is wrong with the experts? See Chris Martinson episode. If Brett thinks that, Brett is deluding himself. That is so obviously not true. That is so completely, obviously, 100% not what's going on with Owen Benjamin. That's insane if he thinks that. That's hmm. wild if he thinks that. I was trying to get Brett on, but um, he declined for hurtful. now. Yeah, oh. exactly. <laughs> You're like hurtful, but he uh, well, rain check. Yeah, there's a it's a maybe, but I was asking him about talking about lineage level selection, but I that's like a I don't know. If that's going to get cast as Nazi propaganda. <laughs> well, they, he's there, there's a clip floating around. After I asked him before he declined, I saw a clip of him that the people were sharing on Twitter from his talk with Richard Dawkins. And they were basically trying to paint him as a Nazi because of what he was saying to Richard Dawkins about lineage level selection. I think they made some analogy to the Nazis or something like that. And they were basically trying to say, Brett's in favor of the Holocaust. Which, that fucking, that's lame. True. The book that I'm reading right now is amazing. What the fuck book is it? Misbelief, What Makes Rational People Believe Irrational Things by Dan Ariely. I wish I had read this book before I had the conversation with Shu and Anna about, about conspiracy theories. Because mm -hmm. this book is pretty amazing, yeah. Uh, Zoki for two dollars says the OG Dragon Ball manga was a bit more raw. I recall a panel where Majin Buu ripped a man in half and left his corpse to rot on the ground. Yeah, I mean the comic was that was much better than the anime because 
it didn't have all the the filler the anime had like tons and tons and tons of filler and also the uh also it was a lot more like violent shit was happening so the comic is definitely better Okay. Death by Sloth for two hours says, it's assuming that lefties have long criticized Republicans for only embracing empathetic policies when they are personally affected. Example, Cheney's gay daughter. Cut to lefties' current year reaction to illegal immigration. True. That's an interesting point. Dr. Death for two hours says, will you be apologizing for your constant bouts of anti... What? Of anti fringy Oh, maybe you meant fringy. anti fringy racism... Are we all just going to pretend all those drunken Twitter rants didn't happen? There you go. I didn't do any drunken Twitter rants. I like Frankie. Right. Um, did I miss this? No, I read that, yeah. Uh, Dr. Dealer for $2 says, I like how we went from our next episode is 250. I didn't notice to episode 300 extravaganza. We're getting every YouTuber ever on. True. Uh, Zoki for $2 says, You're a fan of Death Note. Name all the rules of the Death Note. Congrats on the 300 stream. If someone can name all the rules of the Death Note, that's how you know they're autistic. That's like, there's a lot of rules. Is there? Yeah, there's like, I'm trying to remember. There's like six or seven like uh, main rules that maybe someone can remember, but then there's like just a fuck ton of like a million unwritten rules that they just like whenever they do like a commercial break and they come back, it'd be like Death Note rule and like just say it. And there's like so there's like a million just fucking Death Note rules. Um, Doctor Dealer for two dollars says I was gonna buy some memberships for people, but unfortunately I need to save money for Black Friday so I can blow large chunks of it on stupid shit. I likely don't need and this message explaining that thanks. Well there you go. Listen. Support the economy. Buy a bunch of garbage, okay? Good Do it for up. You. Good for you, Dr. Diller. Engaging in capitalism. You don't need to super chat us. CT for two Canadian says, I'm glad you're flattered. That's DC. Hold on. There you go. Oh, okay. is, is that the comic? No. Oh. Okay, let me find the supers from Sunday. The human whose name is written in this note shall die. What rule is that? Guess That's what the rule first rule, is. isn't it? Guess what, like, guess what, guess what, guess what. Guess what number rule that is? That's literally rule number one. You are correct. Okay. Yeah. Rule number one. Yes. <laughs> Have you never seen Death Note? Of course I've seen Death Note. What okay. are you talking about? Do you know what rule number two is? Um, let's see. Rule number two. Let's is it see. the is it the yet like writing the writing how they die afterwards? This note will not take effect unless the writer has the person's face in oh. their mind when okay. the right when writing his or her name. Therefore, people sharing the same name will not be affected. There you go. Look, they figured that one out. Yes. After writing the cause of death, details of the death shall be written in the next six minutes and forty seconds. Is that rule three? Yeah. Okay, so I was off by one. What did you think that one was? I thought that was two. The human who touches the death note can recognize the image and voice of its owner, a god of death, even if the human is not the owner of the note. What does that mean? Any, so if anyone, anyone touches, touches the death note, the they can see... They can uh, hear Ryuk, the voice. Remember? Right, yeah. Okay. So you got to keep keep your paws off my death note. Right. Uh, Thoughts Apprentice for $5. Thank you. Says, hey, Shu, congratulations on getting married. I've been watching you since I was 13. It feels like watching your wine aunt finally settle down. Good luck. Your wine aunt? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Do you have a wine aunt? 
I don't know. Really? Oh, I'm aware wow. of the concept, but no, I don't. I got a few of them. Oh, wow. Good for you. Uh, Solo Doge for $2 says, late on your own 300 show. Tisk tisk for shame. Wow. We weren't that late. I don't remember what the time was. Uh, it's just Abby for five. Aussie Buck says, congrats on 300. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Sammy G, thank you for $5. Says, the most wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hayden Dill for ten dollars says late for the big day. You don't need that much makeup, Adam. Nice dress background, by the way. S team is the dream team. A class is blast. Happy three hundred rows. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Taylor Ramirez for five dollars says let Mahler come on and ask Anna what her opinions on Star Wars are. That's pretty funny. That's cool. Uh, X for five dollars says part time. Not part time. Part time is a golf thing, or would be if it were a thing at all. Also, very much enjoying Anna and Shu being based. Yeah, I had a little spelling snafu. Instead oh, par time versus yeah, part time? Par time, oh. yeah. What did you write? I wrote par time. For what? Par time YouTuber. Like she's a golf YouTuber. Who is? She won head. She's like, okay. <laughs> okay. Someone pointed it out in the, in the, right. in the comments. I should actually like look at the screen so I can catch your Ah, uh, Who cares? Nobody, look, I don't care. Nobody cares. Uh, Boba Peck for five dollars says, also congratulations on your wedding show. There you go. So it was for five dollars says, ask Anna and Shu the real question. Who would win in a fight? Komodo dragon or a crocodile? I mean, I would imagine a crocodile would like wreck a Komodo dragon shit, would it not? Well, Komodo dragons, though, they have a bunch of like Ebola in their teeth that ends up killing. Yeah, but that's slow. Killing whoever they bite. Yeah, well, I mean. Crocodile just fucking death rolls you and die. <laughs> Right, but if the crocodile dies, I guess it's a draw, couple then. days later. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a draw. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, I don't know what. I don't know how tough a crocodile's skin is compared to whatever. Uh... They're gonna lock mouths, man. He's gonna I mean, get some of that Ebola in that crocodile's mouth. Crocodile's I mouth is like so much bigger than a than a komodo dragon's mouth, is it not? Komodo yeah. dragon's mouth is not that big. But he's gonna lock onto that. That power jaw. No, crocodile fucking rocks its shit. I don't. I disagree. Well, if he gets him by the tail, yeah, he's he's gone. But no, he just they they face each other. The crocodile opens his giant fucking mouth and just fucking chomps its face. Then he's gonna get the Ebola in his mouth. That's not Ebola how that works. Ebola in his mouth. That's not how that works, Adam. Look, I'm telling you, that's not how that works. I know how kimono. You don't know how kimono dragons work. Dragon. Look, kimono dragon venom. Yeah. Oh, they have actual venom? I thought they had just bacteria. In the mouth. venom prevents their prey, prey's blood from clotting, which causes massive blood loss and induces shock. So wait, do they not have bacteria? They just have literal venom? No, they have bacteria too. Are you sure? They have venom and bacteria. Okay, but he still had to bite the, the, the crocodile and pierce its thick skin slash scales. The sharp serrated shape uh the sharp serrated shape of Komodo Dragon's teeth makes it easy to bite off rotten flesh to get caught in the reptile's mouth, turning their saliva into mini Habitat for harmful bacteria that can. Bro, cause... they have like the tiniest fucking teeth. They have these little baby teeth. They even I can't even see it. They have these like teeny tiny teeny little teeth. Look, like, Google oh, Komodo dragon teeth. Yeah, they're like little teeny tiny teeth. Okay, Crocodile's got the Komodo... big ass fucking teeth. Komodo dragon big teeth. They got some <laughs> teeny fucking crocodiles fucking wrecking his shit. Oh yeah, what the fuck? I told you, they got little teeny teeth. I mean, he looks like he forgot his dentures. Yes. 
have you changed your opinion now? I'm thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> you look up crocodile teeth and he's got those big bajumi jaws. You know, chop them. I'm telling you, man, crocodile easy. Crocodile grabs the Komodo dragon, does a death roll, fucking breaks his neck, chomps it up. It's done. <laughs> he's done. Lunch. Done, son. Okay. I don't know here. Here's a Komodo dragon's mouth. I see no teeth in there. I mean, what happened here? It, yeah, cause, no, they have like, they're very small and hard to see. They're these little teeny tiny teeth. So I guess hit you with a poison and bacteria, but they're not like, the crocodile just yeah. fucking like chomps you. So anyway. Mm, okay. There we go. I'm glad we solved that problem. I mean, I want to see it play out first. There you go. Okay. Would you rather fight a crocodile or a horse-sized duck? Obviously the horse-sized duck. Why the fuck oh, would yeah. you want to fight a crocodile? That's an awful fight. Yeah, you die. I mean, there's ways to win that fight on land and water. You're pretty fucked. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't want to try. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't I mean, I know people have the little gator wrestling techniques, but I don't know. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Leet Meathead for $2 says, I bet Shu drinks White Claws and falls asleep at 8.30 <laughs> in the morning. Yeah, there you go. Oh, really? Death by Sloth for $3 says, 300 pennies because we can't all be J-Mac. Well, thank you, Death by Sloth. Uh, Joey Make for five dollars says it's a leftist position to let your community go to trash because the socialist goal is revolution. That's true. Uh, Malcolm McKee for two for two Canadians says in California, domestic violence is a nonviolent crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There you it's go. It's true. So sad. Spencer Harmon for ten dollars says Anna sounds like she's been listening to Actual Justice Warrior. Maybe, maybe. Hell no. Why would she listen to that guy? Look. I he mean, doesn't say clip show. it. He doesn't say clip it CT on his channel. That's true. <laughs> Come on, guys. Uh, Dr. Dealer for $5 says, A team puts garbage in the recycling bin and drinks milk right out of the jug. Use a cup, you freak. S class is the best class. None of that is true. None of that is true. Okay. Okay. I've seen, I've caught my wife drinking out of the jug and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> That's bad. She's like, you weren't supposed to see that. That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm glad I met your wife because when you tell me a story about her, I can like see her face and I, <laughs> and I know her personality and I'm like, that sounds about right. Yeah, that is totally. exactly what she would say. You're not supposed to see that. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Yep. Uh, Artemis Fowl for five dollars says, "Do you think the left's coalition alliance of convenience? Do you think the left's coalition? Do you think that the left's coalition alliance of convenience, instead of any actual underlying principle, has been exposed by Israel and Palestine?" Um, to some people, it has. To some people, it definitely has. Aren't they? Aren't a lot of these alliances alliances of convenience? I mean, yes. I don't feel like Trump is hanging out with the Proud Boys on the weekend. He's like, yeah, I heard they vote for me. Well, I don't think that's what they mean. They mean like the leftist, liberal, moderate left alliance. But I don't. Yeah, I, think I know they are alliances but, of convenience, but I don't think most people they don't realize it. They don't understand that's what's going on. Right. Like I'm just the, saying they're all alliances of convenience. Okay. Right? Sure. <laughs> I was, I was actually thinking about that the other day. Why do people care about the Israel-Palestine thing? you have an answer for that? Why do you think people care about the Israel-Palestine thing? Because China 
controls a platform called TikTok. And they're making all of these videos artificially go viral. People sense viral fame in the air. I mean, people cared about Israel Palestine situation before TikTok. So I don't know if I buy that. I mean, maybe. Well, but... yeah, but look, care plus viral fame. I mean, that definitely increases it. Yeah. These Here's kids I... care a lot more if there's viral fame involved. Come on. Sure. I think I think it's three things. Come on now. Okay. Three I things. Think it's, number you one. You always do this. Look. Go ahead. Yeah. What do I always do? There's like seven things. Number one. <laughs> I think you're right, but I think there's more to it than just okay. that one thing alone. So it's four things. I'll include yours. That's, that'll be number one. <laughs> number two. <laughs> Okay, but I think it's these. I think it's these three things having to work together. We only four. Yeah. Surely you can think of a fifth. No, if you can no, think no, of no. four, you can think of five. No. Okay. Viral TikTok fame number one. Number two. Uh, U.S. support because the U.S. supports Israel. Now, there's a there's a little asterisk here because I feel like if you ask someone this, they would say, "Oh, it's because the U.S. supports Israel." And I don't want my tax dollars going to that, right? That seems like a logical, rational explanation for why people care about it. Sure. Right? Sure. Oh, yeah, America bad. Right. Yeah, but here's the thing. America supports lots of fucked up shit. People don't seem to really care about it that much. Like, you know, we were helping the Saudis kill whoever the fuck they were killing. And people mm -hmm. like people complain about it, but they don't complain about it to this level. Right? Like right. The whole Israel-Palestine thing. Why not? When people say my tax dollars, I just like check out. I know, but you okay. Let's let's just table the MMT for a second because it's not relevant to the conversation. Well, no. Even if you think of it, even without the MMT framework, I think, well, there are a lot of people who do support it, and all those people pay taxes. Right, but I'm just and saying it's interesting because the U.S. supports and gives money or military aid to other countries that do other fucked up shit besides sure. Israel, and so that can't alone be just the reason. Okay, so here's number three. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a disagreement about the conflict. Okay, I think that fuels a lot of it because you know when it's like the Saudis killing whoever, or whatever Middle Eastern country is killing some other Middle Eastern country, and we're supporting them. Usually, there's not people arguing about it. Usually, there's people saying, "Oh yeah, that's really bad." And then maybe there's another side that says, "Well, we do it for some like pragmatic reason because we want to have good relations or oil or something." But there's not like a moral argument. Like there's no conflict in it. Everyone just says, yeah, that's bad. We shouldn't do that. Right. But, but with the Israel-Palestine thing, since there's a disagreement, that allows people to argue and talk about it. And that conflict, because people like conflict, just like they, that's what we want from our stories, Adam. True. Okay, a story without conflict is boring. And that's true of a political story. A political story without conflict is boring. So the fact that there's two sides of the issue that people disagree with is what makes people become so involved in the Israel-Palestine debate. Right. Everyone has a moral intuition and they can weigh in on this using yes. their moral intuition. Yes. They're exactly. like, I have an opinion on this. Because if everyone just agreed, it's kind of boring to talk about because everyone says, oh, that's, yeah, we agree. That's really bad. Yeah. And then what? Then it's just silence, right? It's, it's conversation stops. It's a question. It's a question over who, what side is in the wrong. Yeah, that's what they want to weigh in on. Exactly. They want to say who started it. Right. Right. That's why people are going far back in history, and I'm just like, oh my god, please make it stop. And the final question, the final answer, number which five, is, which is four, which is weird. <laughs> um, but it's true, and I'm kind of curious to see how and why this happened, is that there was a very specific campaign in the 1960s to intentionally associate the plight of the Palestinians to the to leftists and specifically the plight of black liberation movements. And I don't wow. know why that happened. I don't know who orchestrated that, but that 100% happened. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that we're seeing what we're seeing now is that they always try to associate specifically for some reason 
the Palestinian plight as like a socialist thing in the 60s. And that has just kind of retained that power on the left for some reason, even though obviously right now the Palestinians are not socialist at all. So my whole life, I've heard people talk about Israel, Palestine. Oh. And my whole life, I've ignored it. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I've been like, look. Good for you. I don't want to butt in. But it uh, was, it's always been like one of those save the whales, save the rainforest type, save Palestine yes. type things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why is it, but why Palestine? Over There's like, a, there's so many countries that have like instability and fucked up shit. Who knows? And that one specifically. Who, who knows the mind of a leftist? Oh, well, I think it's the four things that we just laid out. Oh, yeah. Uh, Matthew Newman for five New Zealand dollars says, quote, reactionary was coined in the Soviet Union and Maoism. Funny the term appeared around the flip in the left. That is interesting. Uh, CT for two Canadians says, offensive. The correct term is person of unhoused. True. Right. That's much better. I like that. <laughs> Artemis Foul. It's very soothing. Artemis Foul for five dollars says, my favorite conspiracy theory is that women are loyal. <laughs> Oh, that hurts. Ouch. That hurts. Glad we didn't read that while Shu and Anna were here. There you go. Uh, Malcolm McKee for two Canadians says MSNBC covered Trump predicting 9 11 with bin Laden. Right? Okay. Who's that? A YouTuber? Donald Trump predicted 9 11? I've never heard this before. Jake Tapper looks at claims President Donald Trump made about Osama bin Laden in Iraq during his October 27th press conference announcing the death of the Islamic State leader Abu Bakr blah blah blah. Trump repeated his false claim that he made a prediction that Osama bin Laden would attack the World Trade Center and that he should kill him before he did. Trump also repeated the claim that he posed the Iraq invasion. Um, he said a year, Trump said a, he said about a year. You'll have to check. A year, a year and a half before the World Trade Center came down, the book came out. I was talking about Osama bin Laden. I said, you have to kill him. You have to take him out. Nobody listened to me. <laughs> and to this day, I get people come up to me and they said, you know what? One of the most amazing things I've ever seen about you is, is that you predicted that Osama bin Laden had to be killed before he knocked down the World Trade Center. It's true. It's true. Now, most of the press doesn't want to write this, but you know, but it is, it is true. If you go back, look at my book. I think it was in The America We Deserve. I made a prediction. And I, let's put it this way. If they would have listened to me, a lot of things would have been different. Well, yeah. if it's in a book, wouldn't that be easy to fact check? Uh, Trump's America book. America We Deserve. In Trump's book, America We Deserve, Trump criticized the Clinton administration for its haphazard handling of multiple threats. He did mention bin Laden in one of those threats, but he made no predictions about bin Laden's role in 2011. 2001 and offered no recommendations to take him out um this is what it says in the book instead of one looming crisis hanging over us we face a bewildering sense of smaller crises flashpoints standoff and hotspots okay so it's very clear that donald trump didn't write this book right because that's not how donald trump speaks <laughs> yeah where's the third grader talk this is obviously a ghostwriter uh we're not playing chess game to end all chess games anymore. We're playing tournament chess, one master against many rivals. One day we all we're all assured that Iraq is under control. The UN inspector have done their work. Everything is fine, not to worry. The next day the bombings begin. One day we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one, and the US jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock, and a few news cycles later, it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. Okay, so in, I mean, he mentions him, but he doesn't mention him as like a threat we need to take care of. So there you go. Wow. It sounds like he was kind of downplaying. It sounds like he's doing the opposite out of, in that context. It sounds like he was kind of downplaying the threat of him. But, well, there you go. I didn't even know that was a thing. Interesting. Here's a review of the book from Jenny Anderson. It says, too small. This book came in about two inches by two inches. 
How am I supposed to read that? Very disappointed. Wait, what? The big the book was only two inches tall. Two inches by two inches. It so says. it's two inches tall and two inches wide. Yeah. What the fuck? Why? I'm assuming the normal copies of the book are not two inches by two inches. The breadth got like scammed or something. They bought some like teeny Look, tiny. I think this was baby. a penis joke. I think she was. Oh, okay. Attack. It's a one star gotcha. review on. I got gotcha. you. Okay. It's a recent review on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. John Bender for ten dollars says, "Happy three hundred to my favorite show." I can't believe I've probably listened to three thousand hours of Sitch and Adam. I remember when Adam was Doctor Manhattan and Sitch had a shout out on Sargon's channel. Cheers to many more years, eighteen. Well, there you go. Thanks, John. Look at that. We're like family now. Jeez. God, that is old school. Three. And you had your Doctor Manhattan face. Of course, three hundred times. Should we be conservative? Eight hours a show? I don't a know. A lot of content. Let's go 10 hours a show. Yeah, that's... Well, three... original, our early shows were not super long, so... That's 3,000 hours. Yeah, but we've done lots of 12-hour shows to make that's up for true. it. That's true. That's true. And 3, not only that, far, right? not only that, I mean, we didn't... There's a whole slew of Tuesday streams that we never counted. I only started true. counting them because you complained. 3,000 is probably the conservative estimate. Yeah. Uh, Look, if we Desmond get to 10,000 hours, we'll be experts. Jesus. Living Des Wall specifically for $10 says, Muck Rock is another good resource if you want to get your tinfoil hat on. IT tracks FOIA requests. Sometimes it is nice to curl up next to your red string board <laughs> with a coffee and go through documents. There you go. Uh, Ralt of Givia for five dollars says, "On the topic of secret knowledge, have either of you two taken DMT? If yes, what was your experience?" Well, unfortunately, someone dragged me to like a house meeting, and um, there was a bunch of house politics going on at the time. I was li living in a house with like ten people, so it was not. It was really not a good experience. Sitch, have you ever done DMT? <laughs> oh, Sitch took this opportunity to head on off to the bathroom. Good for him. I was wondering when he was going to do that. It's taking forever. He's like, look, Adam's talking about drugs again. He can go for hours. This could go for days. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it wasn't very eventful. Actually, you... All of you guys know the person that gave it to me because <laughs> Jesus, that was the shortest drug trip like answer I thought you'd ever. I thought you were gonna give up like a long story about you doing DMT. Oh, when you we run off about to politics, the... it was boring. When you run off to the bathroom, do you have headphones in your ears? Is that what's yes, happening? Sometimes okay. I do. I have to I was take like, my... what the fuck? I thought Adam was gonna be going on with this. I have to take my headphone out. Okay. Isaac was the one that gave me the the DMT. I think we're past mm -hmm. the statute of limitations, though, so we should, we should be go. okay. I've never I mean, done DMT. I've only done shrooms, and I've explained my experience on that several times on the streams. I think it was... So. I mean, I'm thinking it was about 30 years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you go. I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations have passed. I think we're, I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was fun after I left the, the stupid meeting. There you go. Have you ever been in a, have you ever had roommates? Yeah, of course. I keep telling myself. Oh, when you said I... a house meeting, you meant, that's what you meant. I didn't know what the fuck you were talking about. Yeah. Like, a, oh, okay. gotcha. like someone in the house wants to bitch and complain about something or other. So they, ca they call a house meeting. They're like, look, fucking all... Steve isn't doing the dishes according to the chore chart. Exactly. Yeah. You've yes. Well, exactly. Alan keeps leaving his fucking underwear on the floor of the bathroom. Look. So I had set up a nice little artist studio in the living room. Oh, look, now like, Adam can tell a long story about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you've jogged my memory here. Yeah. 
I remember the reason why the meeting sucked was it's because everyone wanted to bitch at me. They were like, look, you're <laughs> Oh, it was you. Painting. You were the problem. You're painting in the living room. And I'm like, yeah, I like to paint. What the fuck? Leave me alone. That's it's, hilarious. Look, nobody hangs out in the living room. I'm I'm working on some some paintings, some works of art. You guys need to chill. And Isaac just gave me a fat stack of DMT. <laughs> I'm... You're all like faces are melting. <laughs> Did you actually say that? <laughs> no, like, I guys, I'm like so high right now. Like, what are you like, <laughs> no, I is, can we like have a conversation about this later? I never did. Look, I should have. I think Isaac, because Isaac was like hanging out in the hall, kind of listening, and I swear I heard him snickering and giggling. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, to this day, don't know because he actually came in and saved me. He was like, "Look, let's get out of here. These people are mean." <laughs> and uh, and we left. I don't know how the house meeting ended, but I think it ended immediately after I left because everyone was like, "Well, we only called this meeting to bitch about him." Yeah, I do remember. Mm -hmm. hmm. What? So well, one of the guys said something about this, like it's it's political. Something about like, well, it can't, we can't help. It's political. Some he said something about some political context, and I was like, I didn't really see it as political, but I think he was basically like a poli sci major, and he was trying to flex that he knew a lot about politics. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is a fucking house meeting about me painting in the living room. How is this political? Get the fuck out of here. Okay. Sitch, how many roommates have you had at one time? Uh, four was the most. Four. <laughs> Not even close. I know. You lived with, like, I remember your ice cream story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all your tricks. Okay, all your sneaky tricks. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I remember. Look, sometimes I think I'm just going to call Sitch and talk about things that I'd never talk about on stream. But then he pulls this and it's like, oh, well, I guess I already did talk about that. I on remember stream. the ice cream story. Yeah, listen, there's, they'll say, like, do you remember this important thing? I'm like, no. Do you remember the stupid story I told the stream about how I would trick people into not eating my ice cream with my roommates? I remember that story. <laughs> Because you're thinking this would come in handy, right? You're like, this might come in handy someday. <laughs> That's exactly no, I just thought it was funny. I thought it was a funny story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Blue566 for $5 says, I think Anita described woke the best. Everything is political. Everything is sexist. Everything is racist. And you have to point it all out. That's, That's what a, the guy said at the meeting. That's a good, that is a good woke definition. That's a good one, yeah. Everything is political. Everything is political. Grassroots Hegemon for $10 says, Shu isn't a conspiracy theorist. She knows her Tucker Carlson body pillow was playing to kill her, and she has that on good authority. Her ceiling fan told her so. Mm. Love Anna, love Shu, more of both. There you go. Right. Eli W for $10 says, Can you ask Anna why the Israeli special ops didn't use their special tunnel mice that kills 4,000 Hamas terrorists? I had no clue what the fuck that was in reference to. Well, they're talking about the Hamas living in the tunnels. I know that. What is the special IDF tunnel mice? I didn't know if this is like a meme. I don't know what the fuck they're referring to. Probably some kind of walking hand grenade. Okay. What the 40K for three Canadians says, happy 300, keep on killing it. A team plus S class. Thank you. Thank you, Ron yeah. R for the $2. Uh, CT for two Canadians says, anything for you, Anna, I guess them too. <laughs> There you go. Look at that. Anna's got a lot of fans. Even even from... It was such a great talk. It was. You didn't listen back to it. You don't even know. I mean, I was there. <laughs> I was there when it happened, Adam. But you got to listen back because you got to hear the... You just in the background. Oh, my God. You like say, oh, my God, like five times. I know. I said it. I remember. <laughs> God, I wish we were on camera. That would have yeah. been so good. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Probably turned beet red. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Joe the Mig for $5 says, as in OIF, 
OEF vet, I have severe problems with non-vets uh, talking about our involvements like this. Oh, there you go. Uh, Bub Zavi for $5 says, yes, the only way the right would ever return to neocon war drumming is if someone legitimately attacks the homeland, no doubt. I am so skeptical of that. I'm so skeptical of that. I mean, there's already a lot of neocons that are like pretty pro-Israel right now, so that's already been kind of proven. So I don't know. I don't know why you could even say that. Uh, M8566 for $5 says, what does the left wing Trump look like? Congrats on 300. Uh, it would be someone who is a socialist or has the politics of Bernie Sanders, but has the persona of like <laughs> Trump, who's like, you know, fuck all these libtards. It'd be like Vosh. That's who it'd be. It'd be like a Vosh-like politician. That would be the left wing Trump. What are you laughing about? Zero fucks is continuing to share this Adam is straight for robots meme. Oh, look, he took the dick out. I guess it's so we can share it on stream. Oh. <laughs> nice. Okay, we'll bring it up. Okay, good. Isn't it Adam is gay for robots, not Adam is straight for robots? Or did he change it to make yeah. it say Adam is straight for robots? <laughs> He made it stream acceptable, okay? Oh, he added Android 18. That's the Android I was talking about from Dragon Ball Z. That's what she looks like. Oh, really? Yes. She's hot. Yeah. Yeah. It's only That's Adam's great. like, maybe I should watch this show. She's got a lot of forehead, but her eyes are a little too close together for my liking. But, mm. you know, we can fix that. Okay. <laughs> she has a lot of forehead. That's true. I do like his little drawing of me. <laughs> the little face. <laughs> drawing is hilarious. It's very funny. It makes you look like a King of the Hill character. It does. Yeah. Oh, it totally does. Yeah. Oh, look at this. She's got the jean jacket. Wow. Yep. Wowzers. She ends up with a sh with the sh like a midget character too. Oh, that's unfortunate. He's a good guy. He deserves it. Listen. Krillin finally gets a win. Okay. He's he was hard uh he was hard pressed for a W, so I'm mm -hmm. real happy for him. Uh Bub Zabby for five dollars says if the left would let the woke shit go, we would be right there with them pulling up in the the Katsuyashes? What does that mean? Waving the white flags in DC. I'm not sure I get it. Uh, Soto for two hours says, heard Anna's base loyalty take basically a Trumper. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, CT yeah. for two Canadians says, why didn't we invite Anna to the zoo, Adam? Well, I mean, I don't know her that well. She's just right, like an acquaintance, no. so. She doesn't want to hang out with you. Look, I, I would say, I'd say we're friends. I mean, we chat a lot, so. Yeah. But. But you people? I don't know. It'd be weird to say, hey, you want to come to the zoo with us? That would be pretty weird. <laughs> hey, by the way, you want to come to... We're An not, escape like, room? Yeah. We're not <laughs> like uh, that good of friends yet. Sure. You got work. You got to work up to these things, CT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Kincaid for $3 says, you should have Anna and actual Justice Warrior Sean on at the same time. Well, that almost happened. I think Sean is probably sad that it didn't happen just because I was a, maybe, kind of asleep at the wheel a little bit. Maybe I next guess. time. Look, he I wasn't around she... when she was on, though. He was doing his debate with Destiny, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, no. She, I mean, look, I think Anna, Anna, Anna can't jump into the Tuesday stream, obviously, because she's working. She has Young Turks. Right. But she can jump in on the Sunday stream because she's, like, hanging out at home and... She listens to the show and she gets, who else gets mad at something we're saying and then jumps in? <laughs> like, Lots of people. It seems to be a, a like a reoccurring, reoccurring thing, theme. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, but I mean, I, she, 
she all, always has a response. Whenever we cover anything of the Young Turks, she's very interested and communicates with me saying, you know, um, she appreciates out. she appreciates the feedback. What? Right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you mean? No, like that's what she was saying to you. Like, what the fuck? Oh, yeah. I thought you were saying like, what the fuck? I no, shouldn't no, no. be I, saying I, this. But I, I don't think. She, no, I that, understood the confusion. Right. I, I meant she was she... saying that to you. Like she was angry with our coverage. Look, we time. did. This is kind of funny because we did do the jank and her covering. I, what was the story they were covering? I don't remember. They were calling out right wingers. And I was, I don't know if I clipped it out or CT clipped it out. and But I listened back to it and I was like, this is going to come off bad. I just, I feel like, I feel bad about this. I feel like we're trashing them. And um, well, We weren't trashing her. I think we're trashing Jank. But... Well, I, but look, we weren't really, I don't think, I think we were fair. But she, I, I, I believe it was in our group DM, so you might have even seen it. Yes. She was like, she was like, oh, no, no, don't worry. I, like, I love the feedback. There you go. She Based. said that story didn't turn out as well as she would have liked, but. Right. And I Based get it. That. I mean, you and I both get it, obviously. We've right. All, we've all worked. <laughs> but anyway. I get it. I get it. Okay. So but we should cover more of their stuff. There you go. Uh, Paul Dellinger for five dollars says Anna doesn't seem to understand that Biden has no leverage over Mansion. It's a R forty state. Mansion only holds the seat by being seen as opposing Biden. I mean, that's a good point. That is true. Because if, if you track Mansion's popularity, he was most popular when he was kind of pushing back against Biden. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, there's some leverage maybe you could do, like pull him off of committees and shit. I don't know, but. That might only just make him more popular. So it's kind of yeah. an interesting dilemma. I don't know if Anna ever read Dictator's Handbook, but she, if not, she seems to kind of understand it intuitively. That you, right. It really is about cobbling together these voter coalitions. I saw something the other day or heard it on a podcast. There was some, they were talking about some congressperson and... They got redistrict, redistricted, and they completely changed their politics more to hard right Trump supporting politics because of the way that they drew the district. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, fuck. That's like total dictator's handbook. Right? A hundred percent. They sit down with all the constituents. They're like, hmm, let's see here. What are my policy positions? <laughs> <laughs> it's there's no the pe people that think that it's all about principles and this and that i mean it's all about making it seem like it's about your principles but really it's about satisfying voters true uh borkovich for a hundred kroners says, you really punch way above your weight. The stream is the perfect blend of metropolis and local small town bar. You get guests like you had a million subs, but also manage to keep a tight community. Well, thank you. Yeah. Keep it I'm tight. Look, I'm stoked. We can get interesting people to talk to us. So That's it, it. We does... don't want to be tight. We want to be loose. We want to be big whores, okay? It does help us a lot. Like, I don't open... I don't open with, oh, by the way, we only have 50,000 <laughs> subscribers. That's not enticing at all. Mm -hmm. But I can say, look, we've had all these interesting people on our show, and our, everyone's like, hey, I want to add my name to that list. Well, I wonder if it also lets people feel like less guarded about what they say. I think so. So, maybe. Well, I also told Anna, like, if she wants to jump in on a Sunday, like, she doesn't, like, don't plan on going on camera. Like, she's more likely to get clipped out of context if she goes on yeah, camera. Yeah, right, right. Um, Beardmaster for five Canadian says, Adam and address would be a pick fire. Esteem reign supreme. There you go. True. What's that even mean? It means you should do it. Lives in Devs Wall specifically for $5 says, hi, Rags. 
I think that was Walsh specifically for two dollars. Says Dev did terrible on the EFAP quiz episode. I mean, that quiz sounded like I would have done fucking terrible on that quiz. So, so there you go. Maybe it's a good thing I didn't show up. Uh, CT for two Canadians says, "Oh my God, it's my best friend Fringy from Discord." I didn't know that CT and Fringy are, are apparently best friends on Discord. And then CT for another two dot for two dollars says, "We talked once, and I like his profile picture, so we're best friends now." There you go. Sweet. Uh, I read that one. Igor Pedro for two hundred BRL. BRLs, that Brazilian says, JMac, please hire me to one of your 50 companies. There you go. Andrew Clark for $2. Dollars. has 50 companies, but I mean, he well, could. Maybe. I guess. And, I mean, Andrew that's Clark a lot of for, work. <laughs> for $2 says, Is vanilla a slur? Uh, I mean, listen, anything can be a slur, right? It's very context dependent. Really? Uh, sure. Anything. anything. I'm not sure that's the case. What's not a slur? Mm, yeah, I don't know. There you go. I win the argument. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Quick turnaround. Well, look, there's like a million things I'm trying to think. Yeah, you can't think of one because they can all be slurs. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Anything can become a slur. I'm not saying right. everything is a slur. Anything can become a slur. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Lives in Devs Wall specifically for five dollars. Says Sammy G is an angel of fan art and nutritional knowledge. You should take the time to get acquainted. <laughs> there you go. That was in relation to uh, Mahler and Fringy and Rags answering the Sammy G Hello Kitty question. Oh yeah. Oh, we never played the thing. What I thing? never. We need to send oh, that send to, to them. Rags. Yeah. yeah. I sent it to Rags. I think, but I never. Sent oh, you did. Well, they were tagged on Twitter, but they I guess they just didn't see it. Rags isn't on Twitter, though. No, no, no. I think Mahler was tagged. Or maybe he wasn't tagged. Maybe I just sent it to the Rags because Rags is in it, and they weren't in it, so I didn't send it to them. I'll send it to them. Or you could put it to joint DMs or something. Uh, lives in does well specifically for, two, for $10. Says, hypocrisy isn't always incidental. Often hypocrisy is the point. True. That is true. I think people general, genuinely try not to be hypocrites, even though they fail miserably. Unless most they're of the time. leftists, and they don't care. Really? <laughs> I mean, look, I hear, I hear about these. <laughs> I hear about these mythical people who are like, yeah. Well, I don't care if I contradict myself. But I just, I look. It's hard for me to imagine those people really exist. Well, you're right. They care. They just so they create a rationale for why it's not it being hypocrite. So I guess you're you're correct. Yeah, but they do they, care. They, if they didn't care, they wouldn't have to create the rationale. So yeah, there you go. Uh, Nero for five Swiss francs, I believe. Says I rewatched Treasure Planet the other day with my friend. It's actually unfair how good that movie is compared to its fame. Also, high rags. Hello. That's a pretty good rags impression. <laughs> Was it? Sounds like Kim Jong Un from uh, Kim Jong Il from uh, uh, Team America. How raw? How raw? I'm so wrong. <laughs> Leaving that as well specifically for ten dollars says maybe it's because growing from growing from and overcoming adversity implies that there can be a benefit from adversity, and the ideology says all adversity is the result of an oppressive system rather than nature. Um, that could be it. And this is a, I'm assuming this is about like, why is it that like all these woke female characters are like perfect as opposed to overcoming adversity? That could be it. I think that's too smart of an explanation. I think it's, um, I don't remember who it was. Someone in the conversation said that they want this idea that you're like, that just you you were never flawed that you're kind of born perfect the way that you are and you just have to like the way to become a hero is to accept who you are it's not to become a better person it's to accept who you truly are or i guess it's kind of what you're saying with it does well but it's a little different 
What's to get to society to accept who you are? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's you and society. And there's another, there's a third element. And I've said this and no one else has picked up on it because I'm a super genius. Mm -hmm. It's because Disney has been just trying to replicate Frozen ever since that movie was successful. Yeah. What was, that was the thing for Elsa. What was the most fucking like viral popular thing that like made them a shit jillion dollars that everyone talked about? It was that stupid song, Let It Go. I still have not seen Frozen. It's okay. First one's fine. I never saw that one. But, and in the song, Let It Go, it's all about her letting go to be who she truly is, to stop hiding who she truly is. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that movie was so popular. It made Disney so much money and so much fame. Everyone was fucking drawn to be Elsa. All these little girls want to be Elsa. They all want to sing that stupid song. And so Disney, ever since then, has just tried to make every female character Elsa. They're just a character that has to let it go. Mulan has to let it go. Captain Marvel has to let it go. They always have to let it go. That's how they find their power, by letting it go. Yuck. Uh, let's see. Pat, did I one? Patrick Mulligan for five Canadian. Thank you. This happy 300 massives. Sitch, watch Arcane already. We can do it together when I visit Florida this winter. They put a gay chick in it. Ooh. Well, we're probably not going to do it together, Patrick, but I'll maybe watch it eventually to see what all the hype's about. It's got great animation. Clockwork for three hundred for three dollars says three hundred cents for three hundred episodes. Congrats, guys! Well, thank you, Clockwork. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, Doctor Dealer for two dollars says hi, Rags Mahler. Hello, Fringy. Hello, Fringy. Hello. Short fat taku. Thank you, Dev. Dev gave us five dollars. Says happy three hundred figs. Even though he couldn't come on. God, I know. Fake friend. You tried to shame him into coming on. I did. You're a bad friend. I'm a good friend. He's a bad friend. Oh, you're right. Ben Benjamin, 1997 for two dollars says, EFAP needs to cover Castlevania Nocturne. I never watched that. Electric Skeleton for five pounds says more like Datum. There you go. Yeah. Kyle King for five dollars has been watching since Adam Neely's music theory is white supremacist video. Thank you. I, lo I love that stream. Congrats on 300. Here's the 300 more and not a single video more. <laughs> S class. <laughs> Thank you. No more videos, huh? There you go. We'll just do no, we just we'll start over. Start from one again. Okay. You want to do that? Reset the clock? No. Might be fun. Uh, Silver Cam Camaro, 78 for $5, says, Adam and Sitch is 300 show. Too bad I can't stick around. I'm going to go to the gym in my Hello Kitty shirt and watch the Barbie movie on the treadmill. Nice. That's pretty funny. That's heaven. Uh, Metalworks, 411.90 for $5, says, Sitch is wrong. JoJo is better. Oh, fake news. Fake news. I do like JoJo. Fake news. Hunter Hunter's way better. Lives in Deswall specifically for two dollars. Says answer to the JoJo versus Hunter Hunter debate is ghost stories. I ain't never seen that. Silver Camaro seventy eight for two dollars says you should call shows with Dev sad shows. S A D shows. Oh, Sitch Adam and Dev. <laughs> yeah, everyone else was pointing out Shu and Anna is another S and A. Oh, you're right. That means that they're destined to do a show together, right? Of course. Uh, let's see. Twitter sucks. For GR says, Adam, bring up the Hello Kitty picture. Which one? It was when they were arguing whether Hello Kitty was pink or red. You brought it up eventually once we got whatever the fuck picture Mahler was talking about. We were trying to discover if Rags was colorblind or not. Uh, Mahler for five dollars says thank you. Oh, Moondoggy for five dollars says Mahler, thank you for noticing me, Baka. LOL. Serious question: Who was Buffy's best love interest? That's so easy. That's the easiest answer. 
The answer is Spike, obviously. Spike was Buffy's best love interest. Spike? That Spike. crazy that crazy dude. You didn't like Spike? I mean he's okay. Spike was the best. I never Spike watched is like the it. best character in the show. And he's the best love interest for Buffy. He really cared about her. And she was just so mean to him. So abusive to him. It was so sad. Women can be that way, Sitch. I know. You'll you'll learn. She Spike needs to learn to like get over Buffy. Okay. Find a better girl. No, not Angel. Angel's lame. I mean, I like Angel the character, but his love with Buffy was lame because they didn't they just were like, oh, it was like pure Twilight. It's like, I just look at you and I'm in love with you. And she's like, I just look at you and I'm in love with you. Like they didn't there wasn't a reason for them to really like each other except they're just love at first sight. Which I I never liked that stuff. So Angel had the spinoff show. He did, which I like. It's a good show. Okay. Yep. Let's see. Um where? Oh where? I should have brought that up with Mahler. That would have been an interesting question. Better bring that up next time he's on. Who is Buffy's best love interest? And who is Buffy's best villain? And the answer is obviously Dark Willow. Twitter socks for two dollars says I'm highly allergic to preservatives, <laughs> mainly MSG. Well, that sucks. MSG. Now there's a reference. Ten points, a hundred points of free will to whoever gets that fucking reference. No MSG. MSG. Let's see if anyone gets that. Let's see who the true based people are. Someone's gonna get it instantly. Watch. Someone's gonna instantly know. What that reference is. Some based boy. Uh, Patrick Mulligan for two Canadians says, anyone else regard EFAP and Sitchin Adam as sister shows? I think we all do, don't we? Of We all course. do. Well, Yes. I mean, I would think of them as brother shows, brotherly shows, but. There you go. Definitely siblings. Believe it. No one knows the MSG reference. Yeah, Shocked. uh, what the heck? Or I'll have to watch when this this this. I'll have to do it when there's more people watching. Can't believe it. It is an ancient boomer reference. It is not power thirst though. I was making a power thirst sounding voice, so that's a good guess. Uh, Ma Mason Jordan for two dollars says, "Happy three hundred, boys. S class is the best class." Thank you. Ryan Townsend for five dollars says, "Congrats all. Do you guys fuck with Warhammer 40k? Have a favorite species or legion? Can't wait for the comic. And S class is the best class. Hi rags. No, we've never done any 40k stuff. Yes, I don't. I don't know anything about it. You I read, read some a of the books, 40k didn't you? book, though. Yeah, yeah, like a book and a half. Oh shit! There you go, Justin Turpin got it. As did Saint Pepsi. Teen Girl Squad, ancient boomer reference. You did, you knew. Is it like a commercial or something? Uh, no. It's a I TV don't know how show? to. It was no, it was a web cartoon. Okay. Strong Bad. You don't know about Strong Bad? No. Okay. I don't know I how did, to describe. I mean, I Strong do know Bad. some boomer references from the internet. I don't know how to describe Strong Bad to someone who doesn't know what it is. <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. It's like one of those ancient cartoons from back in the day that were very funny. Uh, Lives and Deswall specifically for $10 says, I'm having chat GPT make a Sitch and Adam clip. It knows who you are, but it's not very good at emulating you. Oh, show us when we're done. I'm curious. Uh, Lives and Deswall specifically for $10. Thank you. Give it a bunch. Says, if we're talking about anime, what do you all think about Legend of the Galactic Heroes? I've never seen this show. Sorry. Neither have I. Never seen that show. 
Uh, lives in Deswalt City for another $2. Says, can we get Dan to apply his model to Noah's mullet? <laughs> That's actually funny. That'd be funny to have Dan on and just go through this, the the face guy, the bio right, guy. Yeah. Just do like a, a gauntlet of all the lefties. He's going to say the same thing about they're all women. Noah Sampson, yeah. There you go. Uh, Fondue for $2 says, I wonder if Alt Hist would like a silent voice. I ain't never seen that. Uh, Andrew Carver Vidar says, what if Alt Hiss watch and then read Saga of Tanya the Evil? It's an alt history anime about World War II. What if there wasn't the race component and countries had magic? Well, that sounds kind of cool. Saga of Tanya the Evil. You have to bone up on your MMT before we talk to Alt Hiss again. No, you, well, you get to argue. Why do I have to be involved? Well, I, I mean, I can, but You want backup? No, I don't need, need backup. Two v1? Look, you just moderate. It'll be okay. fine. There you go. Stuck Pedro says, Adam, do a whole stream just reading Kelton's book. There you go. A very dead horse for $5 says, that's it. What if all hist is my favorite guest tonight? He's only one MMT for me, and it's not monetary. <laughs> Oh, there's only one MNT for me. It's not monetary. Happy 300, fellows. Was here for number one. Congrats. I know. Thank you so much for it, of course. He's ancient. Yeah. Wow. Ancient fan. True fan. Wow. Original. Uh, lived in Deswall specifically for $10. Says, new rule. No political, psychological models with less than five dimensions. Mm -hmm. Violations will result in being sprayed with a water bottle like a misbehaving kitten. I agree. Yeah, like, why are you taking a whole access out? Uh, Lives in Des Wall specifically for another five dollars. Says Adam, have you thought about moving that poster so you stop losing your sunglasses? People seem to like it, though. It's not a poster; it's a painting. Yes, it's a that painting. You painted. Yes. True, and people seem to like when it steals the glasses. So I just have never really considered changing it. Fondue for five dollars says, "Damn, the founding fathers are really ahead of their time if they knew about video games." True. Listen, the founding fathers talked directly with Jesus, and Jesus knows everything, so that makes sense. It's not that complicated, guys. Fondue for five dollars says, "Things will be okay. Let's get beers. The world is ending. Let's get beers." True. I love that movie. True. Any uh, movie with robots, you know, it's like my jam. There you go. Uh, Fire Sky 15 for $10 says, and what have they been told for the past 10 to 15 years? Not saying this is good, but just saying. Because that's in relation to, like, is everything going to be Civil War or not? Sitch doesn't think so, but he's always wrong. Mitch for two Australian dollars says, invite Sargon, please. Oh, was he in the yes. chat? I didn't see. I mean, that's... I didn't see him on the ends on Sunday on the chat. Right. Uh, Stock for two hours says, "What do you think about Mecha Trump for 2028?" I mean, it's better than Mecha Hitler. It's yeah, no. I'm down. I mean, I think it'd be kind of cool to have a robot Trump. I got to admit, you know, even if it's Trump, I'm going for the robot vote. Uh, Chili Bay Queen for ten dollars says, "Beautiful trouble." I say, "Hideous safety." The future can be leaned into, not predicted. Best keep eyes wide, peripherals in check. Friends closer than frenemies. Thanks. Use Rudd class is S A class. Thank you. Interesting. The interesting idea. Future can be leaned into and not predicted. Doug for ten for two dollars says, "Hi Ryan Styles. I'm a big fan of Who's Line." <laughs> I guess uh I guess J Reg does look kinda like Ryan Styles, doesn't he? Maybe. Aaron Villarreal for five dollars says, Congratulations, three hundred guys. Team Truth triumphs again. Boosh. Thank you. Uh Dr. There for five dollars says happy about three hundred, but sometimes I can't help but 
miss former host Craig before you both brutally murdered him on episode 53 for voting Green Party? Who's what? Craig? What is that a reference to? I don't know. Adam, look up what episode 53 was. 53, I'm on it. Okay. What could it be? Andrew Clark for $2 says, a Matt image search Anne Hathaway Matt Gala. Thoughts? Okay, I'll do that. Let's see. I didn't even have to do Matt. Oh, no, I did do Matt Gala. It's wow, just that's... her in the red dress. She's wearing a white dress. Oh, her in the white dress. That's a great dress, but it looks like she's lost a bunch of weight, and I'm not for it. She's too skinny. She needs to put some meat on them bones. It's a bulk up. What episode was it? 53, you said? 53, yeah. 53. Let's see here. That's Let's a cool blast dress, all white people into space. What the fuck episode was that? I see enlightened centrists. Hey now video was the opening. We only streamed for a paltry four hours. Wow, cool. here's a very mean thing to say. Why was Anne Hathaway standing next to the Muppet from <laughs> from the uh, what's the name of the band in the Muppets? It's like Electric something. The, the Electric Mayhem. The drummer, Animal. Janice, why is why is uh, why is Anne Hathaway at the Met Gala standing next to Janice from the Muppets? It's like a literal Muppet. I sent you a picture. Let's see. I don't know if you should bring it up. That's pretty mean. I don't know who this woman is. I see CT in the chat. There you go. Whatever. Don't worry about it. I'm just having I don't a moment. Look, I don't see any of the, these people still in chat. We cycled through people. Uh, Mythos Infinite for $10 says, leaving a congratulatory super chat plus a note. I'm noticing a ton of weirdly public anti-Semitism from the left lately. Straight up, quote, what if artists was right posts? Their true colors are cast. True. True. I see the uh, booster in chat. Oh, you're talking about the 53 episode? Yeah. Whatever. Don't worry about it. Turn that off. Who cares? Andrew Clark for $2 says, I'm here for the Yoko Ono arc. There you go. Let's see what this says. It's probably some reference we didn't get. I like it. Uh, Mythos Infinite for Five Canadian says, Like Flash Gordon Wright, my father in his 60s makes the mistakes, you absolute boomer. Love you guys all hetero. There you go. That's funny. If your father's in his 60s, you should know who Flash Gordon is better than I do. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Clark for Joe says, Thoughts on Bill Maher roasting Neil deGrasse Tyson to his face? Well, we're going to probably check that out on Sunday because it's pretty. Pretty interesting. Pretty brutal. Nice. People like us brutalizing Neil deGrasse Tyson. They feel like he has it coming. I like him. I don't want him to have to be brutalized. No. He has to oh, be I want to save him. Okay. We can save Look. Neil. He's savable. I can fix him. Look. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson is responsible for all the evil in the world. Listen, we need to get some hot woman to be his assistant, okay, and de wokeify him. <laughs> He'll listen to her. He won't listen to me. Right. Yeah. A Poops white for woman. five dollars says, Congratulations on 300 streams. May we continue to reign in our elephants and let our riders take control. There you go. Not me. Idiot Tosin for five dollars says, Yo, you got J Reg and J Rug name dropped EFAP. That really helps wash out the taste of lion ass. <laughs> there you go. It was also for George says, look up the EFAP stream where they talk about the Isle of Man flag. I did see that. It was pretty funny. 
Mahler just starts breaking down laughing at the how stupid the flag is. Which I is like the YMS. So I, you guys need to be nicer to YMS. True. Idiotosa for two for two dollars says I kids I knew played the same game but with lightsabers. There you go. Uh, Sash man for two Aussies says Sitch do a face reveal but just use a Ryan Gosling mask. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny. It's literally me, guys. What's the problem? What what? Uh, M eight five six six for five dollars says, "Do you guys think Trump can win in twenty twenty four? Whenever I or anyone else says he can't, Trump supporters get pissed. I just think he's made too enemy too many enemies. I think Trump can definitely win in twenty twenty four. I think he can win if turnout is suppressed because people are demoralized because it's the same fucking race as last time. I mean, there's always concern about. I don't know if you've seen. There's always concern about Biden." His poll numbers being too low. Biden's poll numbers are pathetic. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think Trump could definitely win. I, I think he could definitely, definitely, definitely win. Yeah. yeah. I think so too. I think it's going to be close. Whatever, whatever it is. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable making a prediction one way or the other, at least it's, this early out. It's always close, but I just, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people who don't turn up because they're going to be like, fuck this shit. That's possible. That's like you couldn't problem. get the two fucking same guys as last time? Give me a break. True. Well, yeah. one of them's the current president, so that makes sense, right? No, it doesn't. Biden said he was going to run for one term. Did he? Yeah. I don't remember that. Look it up. Biden said, I'm only going to run one term. I know I'm a fucking geezer and I'm halfway to my grave. And if you elect me president, I'll just, I'll get out of the way. I'll let the well, young the, whippersnappers Yeah, but come. see, here's the problem. Maybe they, they were really planning on handing the torch to Kamala, but she's such a fuck up that she kind of... Oh, that's probably, that that's probably exactly what was going to happen. Yeah. Good job, Kamala. They were like, <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> Kamala's going to be the face <laughs> of the Democratic oh, Party for the God. next eight years after Biden. What a joke. What a fucking joke. You know, uh, she sounds like a like a high girl at a party. Uh, I can't even imagine does, yeah. Kamala she president does. being president. Oh god. Uh, IY six nine zero four for ten dollars says how does how Sitch feels about the Godfather is how I feel about Blade Runner. Anyways, congrats on three hundred. Thank you. Black Cat zero zero six one. Thanks so much for two dollars. Says I made it through the whole show. Woo! Oh, that's well, the you, last Black super Cat. chat. Look at that's that. That's the last super chat. We did it. We made it through. Well, thank you guys. There's incredibly, you guys are so insanely generous on Sunday. Yes. With your yes. super chats. Insanely generous today too. Yes, very. After being insanely gener generous on Sunday. So. Are we wrapping uh, up? Fondue for five dollars says, "I would think three is much more." Israel situation is a moral exercise for most people. No, I think it's. I think it's the four. I think it's the four. Uh, because yeah, anything once you start thinking about it can become a very complicated moral exercise. But the question is, why do people care about it in the first place? There's a million complicated moral questions going on in the world that people could be thinking about, but they're not. Oh, look, you got Ultra Instinct Goku on the screen. What's going on? I looked it up and I just, I like the, I like, I it. like the style. Yeah. Yeah. Goku is bad at his character. Dramal Z has a really cool style. And I was I a big fan of Ultra Instinct Goku having the white hair. It looked pretty cool. Oh, look, Doomer's <laughs> in the chat. Doomer says, can someone please take away Adam's stream filters? <laughs> that no no listen does well specifically for two dollars says specifically the english ghost stories dub yes i know there's like the english ghost stories dub is like really weird and goofy so and funny anyways that's it that's it that's it that's it we actually finished and it's only midnight Feels like a that's half day, it, doesn't it? Every, that's, every, that's everything. 
That's just talk, why. I'll, 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 I'll super chat you done. Why are you talking in this voice? We can, we can stop with the super chat. Oh, because you're corn. <laughs> this isn't the corn voice. The corn voice is high. This is like weird. I thought you were doing like a like a Muppet I'm, voice I'm, or something. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the corny. I'm the corny's brother. <laughs> I'm corny's brother. You're okay. corny. Are you, are you corny's like little brother? Corny has already gone to bed. It's too late for, It's too late for corny. Okay. Your nibbles. He, he doesn't. He doesn't know how to stay. He doesn't stay up that late. What's your What's your name, Corny's little brother? Corny Junior. It's <laughs> very original. Thank you. <laughs> I'm oh my God! You're taking over the entire screen. <laughs> I'm the Corny Junior. Okay. Okay, Junior. Well, uh. Anyway. <laughs> You want to play us some harmonica? Can you play the harmonica, Corey Jr.? What? What? I'd I'd love to. <laughs> you do I, sound like an Adam Sandler character. That's exactly what he sounds I, like. I, yeah. I would I would love to play you some harmonica. <laughs> you play some harmonica, Corey Jr. Too. Anyways, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your incredibly generous donations. Uh, thank you for your wonderful art that we get inundated with, guys. Uh, thank you to all our amazing guests that showed up on Sunday. Thank you, Ethan, Ethan Van Scriver, for coming on and talking to us about story and Barbie and comic gate. It's always fun to talk to Ethan. Uh, and no thank you to Corny Jr. for <laughs> showing up at the end of the stream. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, but thank you, you who have made it to the end of the stream. You are the true heroes. You are the true super fans. You are the true isekai protagonist of life. And we'll see you all next Sunday. Bye, friends. Bye. <laughs>